when all you have is Jim Harbaugh, give me a break. That's why the Colts are picking second every year in the draft, not battling for the Super Bowl like other clubs in the National Football League. Who in the hell is Mel Kuyper, in a way? I mean, here's a guy that criticizes everybody, whoever they take. He's got the answers to uh, who you should take and who you shouldn't take. Mel Kuyper has no more credentials to do what he's doing than my neighbor, and my neighbor's a postman, and he doesn't even have season tickets to the NFL. <sighs> But the hair has not changed. No. <laughs> and Mel is back as the showdown at high noon awaits Eli Manning and the Chargers. Will they draft him, trade him, maybe take someone else? Now, if you think that Eli Manning or any other QB is the solution to your team's problems, well, consider this. Since 1967, the first year of the common draft, 63 quarterbacks have been taken in the first round. 59 of those played a game with that team. Just 35 of those started a postseason game for that team. Nine of those started a Super Bowl, and get this, only four actually won a Super Bowl for the team that drafted them. Troy Aikman, Terry Bradshaw, Jim McMahon, and Phil Sims. Just four. For Chris McKendry, I'm Jay Harris. You ready for some football? Round one of the draft is next. Chris Berman standing by in New York. Have a great day. ESPN welcomes you to the following presentation of the National Football League. In Midtown Manhattan, where else would you like to be other than the 2004 NFL Draft? That's what these folks are saying. Storming into the theater here at Madison Square Garden as we reenact an April Classic. You're always going to want the best player available. It takes hard work. Determination. To not be outdone. To be the best possible football player that I could be. 2004. The hunt. For the teams. The quest. Pick a winner who passed the test. The nerve-wracking wait and separation of elite peers. You're checking the start of careers right here. Sweating and guessing, realize through bust and boom. Getting in hard work, in result of the weight room. Open it up, the team, the league, the game at last. To the next names, NFL. Yeah. Eli Manning, a name like that commands respect. It also bears the weight of a family legacy. Robert Gallery, from Iowa farm boy to Outland Trophy winner. Next stop, the NFL. Tommy Harris, Army kid turned the Barty Award winner. Where will his speed and power rank him next? Sean Taylor, the next Ronnie Lott, he's out to set a tone beyond comparison. 25 years ESPN NFL draft. 25 years of coverage for the first and the last. Gavel to gavel from beginning to end. We're picking superstars, let the games begin. Welcome to ESPN's coverage of the 2004 NFL Draft, presented by Coors Light. They are inside, wearing the jerseys of all 32 teams. And when we mean all sorts are inside the theater at Madison Square Garden, we mean absolutely all sorts from both coasts and all walks of life. Fans of the home teams, fans of the road teams, and yes, fans of a great family, the Mannings, father and son. This is their moment. Hello once again, everybody. I'm Chris Berman. So glad to be with us here at the 69th annual selection meeting, which in English is the NFL Draft. Along for about his 8,000th NFL Draft is Mel Kuyper. Good to see you again. Good to be here, Chris. Chris Mortensen for his 9,000th NFL Draft. Good to be here, of course. And his first with us, but a number one pick at 88 by Tom Landry of the Dallas Cowboys. Michael Irvin, glad to have you hey, on. Glad to be here, boo. My first draft in New York. I love to be right here with the fans. You're like a player again, right? I've hit that feeling again. Absolutely. Well, to put it mildly, it was a historic and horrific week around the National Football League leading up to this draft. Uh, a week we have rarely seen. Number one, the first family of quarterbacks, if you will, Archie Manning, drafted second overall by the Saints in 71. Peyton Manning, drafted first overall in the draft by the Colts in 98, and the reigning co-MVP, and Eli Manning, expected to be the number one pick in this draft. However, Eli Manning, word out, please, San Diego with the first pick, 
don't draft me. Maybe the New York Giants are a better fit. We still have San Diego on the clock. Stories to follow. The courts. Maurice Claret challenge went all the way to two Supreme Court justices who denied the appeal to let Maurice Claret and other underclassmen in the NFL draft. That's a continuing story, but Maurice Claret, Mike Williams, etc., not a story today. And of course, dwarfing it all, Pat Tillman, who traded in a career at safety for the Arizona Cardinals and a pretty darn good one for serving with the U.S. Army Rangers in Afghanistan, killed in action Thursday night in battle at the age of 27. Uh, heartfelt emotions out to his family, which include his next of kin, his football family, which would be high school, which would be Arizona State, which would be the National Football League, as you can hear everybody in this room and everybody in America. Pat Tillman and 700 other Americans have lost their lives in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we recognize them all. And a little bit later on, and not too long, because Arizona picks third, we will have a tribute to Pat Tillman. Mort. Now we go back to the top of our story. Um, Eli Manning. Boy, did this swirl every day. What do we expect now? It's, it's incredible that we have the Mannings, the classy family, getting booed even right here like this. That's just about the drama we have right now. But let's go back 10 days ago when the San Diego Chargers called Tom Condon, the agent for Eli Manning, and said, we choose to negotiate with, with you right now for Eli Manning. He's going to be our first pick, and Tom Condon sends the message, no, we choose not to negotiate. We don't want you to take Eli Manning. At that point, Dean Spanos, the president of the Chargers, called Paul Tagliabue, the commissioner of the NFL Football League, and Tagliabue said, let me call Archie Manning a friend. And at that point, Tagliabue asked him, Archie, to get involved in this process. Archie, as we know, met with the Chargers, and basically Condon called this past Wednesday night, reiterated the family position. We do not want Eli to be a Charger. Why? The Mannings have not detailed these issues, the whys, but clearly it is an indictment of the Spanos family that owns the Chargers. They don't see much hope. They don't see a commitment, and that's my interpretation of the events, Chris, and that's where we're at right now, where the Chargers committed to taking Eli Manning unless something dramatic happens shortly. Well, it hasn't happened yet, but it could even after the very first pick is made, and we will obviously address that throughout the first hour because the phone lines could be burning. Mel, let's go back to 1998. Peyton Manning was the number one pick of the Indianapolis Colts. Just, we know what he's done as a pro. It's great. Peyton Manning coming out, Eli Manning coming out. Are they the same? Eli equal Peyton? Perception, Chris, I think right now in the rating is the same. I think Eli has the similar number of critics as Peyton did, as Troy Aikman did. Quarterbacks coming out early, unless you're John Elway, in terms of the NFL draft, will have their share of skeptics. There's going to be mixed opinion. Peyton Manning, everybody said, well, hey, Ryan Lee's better. In this case, Eli Manning, hey, Ben Roethlisberger's better. Phillip Rivers is better. Bottom line is Eli Manning elevated this old Miss Rebel team to bowl status. They were a series away from beating co-national champion LSU. This kid can throw the football. He's got size, got more mobility than Peyton. And I think by going back for his senior year, Chris, he really benefited because he got that fire, mm -hmm. that passion that I didn't see as a junior. I saw it more so as a senior. Yeah, we all saw it as a senior, that's for sure. Well, right now, the San Diego Chargers have seen it as well. It's early out in San Diego, but somehow I feel that people have been up there for a long, long time. At Chargers headquarters is uh, one of our many quarterbacks, Sean Salisbury. Sean, good morning. Good morning, Boomer. Thanks, and uh, hope you guys have a great day. Let me tell you the latest on what's going on here in San Diego. We were supposed to have President, CEO, and owner Dean Spanos with us here at the top. But uh, he said the only way he wouldn't if they were in a very important decision-making process, and obviously that's where they are. And just in the last 15 or 20 minutes, Mr. Spanos has gone into A.J. Smith's office outside the draft room, closed the door, and those men are in there trying to decide on the decision. And the decision right now as we stand, as Mort said, is that they will draft Eli Manning with the first pick unless there's a blockbuster trade. Well, there hasn't been a blockbuster trade, and they're prepared to dig their heels in and deal with the ramifications of taking Eli Manning and not being able to sign him. And we'll get an opportunity sometime during the next hour to talk to Dean Spanos and find out exactly all about that. Let's head out to the Giants in New York, Sal Palantonio. They got the fourth pick right now, Sal. Sean, they do, and the Giants are just waiting to hear what the Chargers are willing to do here. But here's the news that we've heard is that there's a possibility of a way to get out of this, a scenario that's being discussed behind the scenes, that the Chargers would take Eli Manning with the first pick and the Giants at number four might take Phillip Rivers, and that the two teams would then trade the picks. Everybody knows that Marty Schottenheimer likes Phillip Rivers, and the Giants, of course, covet Eli Manning. That is one possibility, Boomer, that is being discussed as a way to get out of this. Well, we have a little more time at that, Sal, and of course, we'll check in with Sean and you and all around the league. 
Uh, but right now, we might as well check into the green room where Eli Manning, his father Archie, are uh, waiting to hear what happens along with the rest of America. Uh, let's go down to Susie Colbert. Suze? Thanks, Chris. Right off the top, Eli, why don't you want to play for the Chargers? Uh, you know, we're not really giving details right now. We just, uh, we've made our decision, and that's what we're sticking to. Who's influenced you the most? You know, just, uh, it's not really an influence. This is my decision. It was, uh, you know, I, uh, I wanted to do this. Uh, I was not, you know, told to do this. We, we talked about it, and I, and I thought it was the best idea, so I went with it. Archie, 1998, Peyton, number one pick to the Colts the year before they were 3-13. and 13. Why is this different? Well, um, it, all teams are different. It was kind of a start over there, and uh, people that were there, a lot of people that, that they had, uh, just there's so many, as I said, we weren't going to talk about all these issues and all these factors. There were a lot of them presented uh, to Eli, and, and he made this decision. But every organization is different, Susan. As a family, how, how emotional, difficult has it been challenging the NFL? Um, it's, it's been tough as, as a family. Uh, and it's, it's been, you know, we're, we're concerned about Eli, but we're also concerned about, uh, we care about this league and, and, the, and the people. We're not trying to distract or disrupt anything. So it's, it's, it, was a, it was a very hard decision uh, for Eli. Our family, we just, we're supporting. We all know the tradition, number one pick, what happens when your name is called, what are you going to do? Um, you know, again, I don't know what's going to happen right now. I don't know what the Chargers are going to do. So, um, you know, if my name's called first or whenever it's called, uh, you know, I'm going to do what, what everybody else does. If the Chargers call your name when I talk to you after the pick, will you be wearing a Chargers hat? Um, you know, I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Good luck, guys. Thanks. Chris. Susie, Eli, Archie, thank you very much. Um, and now to get things started here in New York officially, the commissioner of the National Football League, uh, in his 15th season counting, uh, Paul Tagliabue, who works the podium obviously throughout the first round, but it has been a different week, and the commissioner knows better than all of us. Good afternoon. If you give me your attention. Uh, yesterday, all of us learned of the tragic news of the death of Pat Tillman, the former Arizona Cardinals safety. Two years ago, Pat Tillman left the Cardinals to join the United States Army, where he became a member of the elite Ranger unit. Like the five Marines standing with me today, Pat served in Iraq, and he was on another mission in Afghanistan when his unit came under attack. Pat Tillman personified the best values of America and of the National Football League. Like other men and women protecting our freedom around the globe, he made the ultimate sacrifice and gave his life in the service of his country. After talking to Pat's family, we will make certain that uh, Pat's values and what he represents to Americans to the National Football League continue to have a permanent place in the league. Please join me in a moment of silence in memory of all those men and women, all those heroes, who have given their lives for all of us. Thank you. Okay, thank you, and now we open the uh, 2004 college draft, and the San Diego Chargers have the first choice and are on the clock. Well, let us uh, hope that every man drafted this weekend can live up to the man that Pat Tillman was on the gridiron and for his country. We'll be back with the NFL draft as the Mannings will find out soon wither, where, and maybe why. 
lines are reading in New York City. Elway telling everyone that he will play for the Yankees and not play professional football. You know, he might get up there and say, I'm choosing the Yankees. But until he has a signed contract, anything can change. Baltimore selects as the first choice in the draft. Quarterback John Elway of Stanford. I'd be surprised to see him uh, play baseball, too. He could be the best in football. You talk about scary television. We're going to the red jacket is scary. Oh, well, Eli Manning has uh, waited for this opportunity. It's not the opportunity that you know, a lot of people might have sized up about a week ago, but we may know more in the next 15 minutes and the next hour. We may know more right now. Let's head back out to San Diego. Sean Salisbury, a buzz at Chargers headquarters? Well, you know what? It's to their status quo. They're still drafting Eli Manning as of right now, Boomer. They left, did A.J. Smith, the general manager and president and CEO, Dean Spanos, and went back from A.J.'s office to that draft room to decide. They're sitting and watching just like you and I are, waiting. And you know what? There's, there's the possibility that they still could, and talking to the Chargers, take take uh, Eli Manning, trade him down, and let the uh, Giants draft David Rivers, excuse me, Philip Rivers, and make that trade. So if it does happen, then we've got to wait on that when the Giants are on the clock, but fully expect the San Diego Chargers to use all 15 minutes in waiting to see if somebody else gets into this mix, Boomer. All right, Sean, well, they are on the clock right now, and uh, hey, look, let's not forget, Eli Manning's a hell of a football player. Maxwell Award, many awards, player of the year, took Ole Miss from where? to a big-time bowl game, et cetera, et cetera. Mel, Eli Manning, the player. Chris, will we forget it. Jean DeBay, the number one pick, or rate his number one pick to be a great quarterback. In Eli Manning's case, what he benefited from, and you talk about that name Manning, Archie's influence, I think, is the reason why he stuck around as long as he did at the college level. Keep in mind, he's redshirted in 1999, gradually worked his way into the mix, and is the top-notch SEC quarterback. His completion percentage improved 62.4% as a senior, and you watch him here. He was under pressure. The offensive line, Stacey Andrews, in a background in football. He'll be a fourth-round pick. He was on that offensive line, but overall, they struggled. Chris Collins, good receiver, not a lot of speed. Running game, not evident each game in terms of helping out assisting Eli Manning that group struggled I think when you look at the time that he had to throw the football the lack of a running game the competition that he faced in the SEC week after week that's why he was able to achieve such a high grade maybe he's not the number one pick he's certainly not the consensus number one pick he's not the number one quarterback on some teams boards but there's a lot of competition at that spot with Roethlisberger and Rivers and what Eli Manning did in terms of elevating this Ole Miss football team you see the throws there the timing the precision which is most important considering the fact he didn't have the great wide receiver four. It's amazing what he was able to do, and I think the fact of the matter is, without Eli Manning, where would Ole Miss have been? They were on the doorstep of upsetting the co-national champion. One series away from upsetting the co-national champion, LSU, Bayou Bengals. You look at what he did throughout his career against that top-level competition. He was an elevator, and I think you got that's the, the key entity in a quarterback at the college level. If you don't have the supporting cast, Michael, you better be able to take really the reins. He did it, and he became much more a leader as a senior and that's the influence of Archie keeping him around from red shirting in 99 all the way till his fifth year senior campaign in 2003. How about it, pressure though different than than even playing quarterback well, at big time. It, it's the one thing that you cannot get a read on before the draft but this situation it may be different. Eli Manning number one pick overall you want to know if a quarterback can go number one and can handle the pressure of being the number one pick. This guy has lived with pressure. He's the third Manning. His dad played the game very well. His he's brother, Cooper Manning. Cooper Manning. Okay, but he's the third quarterback Manning, and he's handled pressure well. I say he's a Sherlock, and because of the way he handles pressure, that's what makes yeah, him but the number one player. Michael, this is on pressure that he's never seen before, and I guarantee it's been created by this buzz the last few days of that all of a sudden Eli Manning. They tried in San Diego, I believe, to create a market that wasn't there. You talk about the money you have to pay for a number one pick at quarterback. You talk about team Team's boards being completely different around the NFL. This is a market could not have been created. What San Diego look, did was complicate matters, Chris. It look, should have been very simple. They made it complex. Look, let me boil it down to, to folks that may not have been following every move of this all week long. I, I think that the problem is that everybody looks bad here, right or wrong, all right? The Manning family, the first family. I mean, respect of the game, respect the people, absolutely. But yet, they weren't, it didn't appear to be, Manning like you know that that's the perception that certainly wasn't their intention but that might have been what happened the San Diego Chargers are made to look like all this like 
like the Beverly Hillbillies. I don't think that's fair. I'll address that in a couple of minutes, but that's a perception out there, and that's not being worn very well out in San Diego, as you might expect. And the NFL, let me go ahead three months, okay? If Eli Manning sits, if Eli Manning sits, you have the number one draft pick not playing football, and that's not good for the NFL. Everybody looks bad. Who legitimately looks bad, if anybody, and, and, and who actually will come out of this okay? Well, I think, it's like you said, I think everybody looks bad. There are no winners right now in this situation. They, the league loses, as you mentioned. Certainly the Chargers lose because now their fans are saying they're bungling this thing. And then, of course, the Mannings lose because they've had such a prestige image in this thing. I do want to address one thing that was asked earlier about to Archie Manning by Susie Culver, which was, why is this different than the Indianapolis Colts and Peyton Manning? And Archie alluded to it, but he didn't tell you. And simply, what happened then was the Indianapolis Colts had just been taken over in the front office by Bill Polian, who had taken the Buffalo Bills to Super Bowls and had taken the Carolina Panthers to an NFC Championship team. The Mannings have grown up in New Orleans, where the coach with the Colts at that time was Jim Mora, who turned a losing franchise in, in New Orleans around into a winning franchise. So in that respect, of course, they had a left tackle. They had Marvin Harrison. So they right. did see more hope there, certainly. Well, I mean, that was their read. The Chargers are trying to, look, they feel, look, we just got great news for the first time in a long time on Baby a Stadium. There's a step coming in San Diego. We have a pretty darn good running back in LaDainian Tomlinson, maybe the best in football. However, at 4-12, and 12, they don't have a lot else. But neither do the Colts. I understand what you're laying out. And by the way, let's not forget, it is Eli's prerogative. Right? It is their prerogative to do what they're doing, like it or not. Now, for example, a couple of years ago, the exact same situation. There are two things tying in here with San Diego. Then let me go up to the AA Sports Desk. Two years ago, three years ago, Michael Vick. Well, they traded out of the number one spot with Atlanta, but the number one they got instead was this great running back, Tomlinson, Tim Dwight, two other picks. So let's not forget the Chargers didn't bungle that. Now, 98, Peyton was picked first. They ended with Ryan Leaf. But that's what everybody remembers. This is the team that drafted Ryan Leaf at quarterback. Not fair, but it did happen. Let's go up to Bristol, where we'll be joined all day long with the EA Sports Desk, Trey Wingo and company. Guys, you're, you're ready to roll up there, I know. <laughs> More than ready, Boomer. Thanks very much. Welcome into the EA Sports NFL matchup set. Trey Wingo here with Merrill and Jaws. And there is not even unanimous decisions here on whether or not Eli Manning is not the best player, but the best quarterback. Is he, Jaws, the best quarterback available in this draft? He is the best quarterback available in this draft. And all due respect for Ben Roethlisberger and Rivers and Lossman, when you look at Eli Manning, I have studied him extensively. He projects very well to the National Football League. The strong arm, the accurate throws, the mobility, the experience, the ability to manipulate a defense, move secondary, throw the ball down the field. He projects the best out of this group for the NFL. Right, in your opinion. Now, That's we watch the tape, we watch the tape, and I come away with Philip Rivers being the best quarterback coming out in the draft. When you look at San Diego, the reason they like Philip Rivers, he is most prepared to come out. When you look at his anticipation, his ability to get rid of the football, that's why they like Rivers. The difference here is Philip Rivers doesn't have a dad who played in the National Football League. He doesn't have a brother right now playing in the National Football League. Or Philip Rivers would be the first player picked right now. It wouldn't even be a what discussion. Is that, what is wrong he with does have that, He does what have that wrong? delivery Let's issue, though. He does have that delivery What's issue that people are talking about. Listen, there's nothing wrong with character because I think both these guys have tremendous character. I, I agree with but you. But now it's the Manning history that is pulling the weight here. It's not Eli Manning. He is not a consensus guy. He is not John Elway, not even close to John Elway. Right. Rivers is the better quarterback. And feelings got hurt here when San Diego said, we like Philip oh, Rivers. Oh, the Manning said, you know what? Hold on, guys. Hold on. Hold on. Here, then we're not on. going. Gotcha. What, one, one, more, one more issue we got to hit here. Is, is Eli Manning, does he have the right to buck the system the way he is? No, I don't believe he does. Based on just his overall skills, I don't believe he is that talented. It is because of his dad, his brother, and the power of that name that makes this happen. If Rivers had the same thing, he would be the first player pick, period. I, Josh, I, your thoughts? I, I don't agree with bucking the system. But clearly, Eli Manning is the best quarterback. He projects the NFL. The team that does get him, and we don't know what's, who that's going to be right now, he will be a quarterback of that team for a long time. Why don't you have the right to buck that system? It's the only time maybe in your life you have the hammer. If you got the hammer, you should swing it. Well, I, I think there's some validity to that, but I don't think it should be done. All right, we shall see. Obviously, division on the set, division in the ranks. We don't know what's going on. Boomer, let's send it back to you in New York. Well, we're about to find what's going on, Trey and Marilyn Jaws. We look forward to your input. Well, here it is. Number one pick in the 2004 draft. Take a guess. With the... Uh... 
first choice in the 2004 NFL Draft, the San Diego Chargers select Eli Manning, quarterback, Mississippi. Well, a moment that he's dreamt about, that Peyton has lived, and Archie as the number two pick overall in 71 was as close to, is not quite at this moment. Well, what he might have thought, however. Well, here, here's the thing about this, is in, in speaking with R.J. Okay, this wait, week. Wait a hold on, Mort. Classy yes. move. He's holding up a Charger jersey. Let's notice and, that. And visiting with R.J. this week, he hate, he did, he has expressed this. He hates this for Eli, because he knows this is supposed to be the best weekend of his life right now. And he understands that what has come out publicly has spoiled this somewhat for Eli. They're, and now they're trying to do the right thing by the NFL and certainly by Eli as well. And, and he's doing the right thing, but more, I, and I must get this here, I agree with what the Mannings are doing. It is hard with everything going perfectly for you in the NFL to make things work. And then you get a situation where you think a team is not overly crazy about a quarterback going the first pick in his last name, Manning. I would be afraid of that situation. I want to try to put my son, if I'm Archie, in the right situation to succeed. He's already having a lot of pressure put on him. I don't need any added pressure with an organization or anybody that's not 100% towards winning and not showing that they're 100% towards winning. Let me tell you something. We, we all know this. If Eli ends up a Charger, a Giant, or a make, a, make a pick, they got themselves a hell of a quarterback. It is now the sixth, and that's his mom, Olivia's dad, Archie, you know what? He may feel like that's a very classy move that we're seeing right there. It is very and, classy move. And you might want to save that picture. It might be a collector's item. I'm mean, at the same that's, thought. That's exactly Just right. Six of the last seven years, a quarterback now won four years in a row. Carson Palmer didn't play at all for Cincinnati last year. He's going to start next year. David Carr, two years ago, certainly looks like a fine player for the Houston Texans. Three years ago, Michael Vick. He, of course, is, uh, it, we'll wait to see a healthy Mike Vick this year. 99, Tim Couch Cleveland might be a Green Bay Packer before the end of this weekend. Peyton Manning, co-MVP of the league, as good as there is, number one pick in 98. So even on that list, it, there's nothing bona fide, yes, and there's nothing bona fide, no. Here's the reaction in San Diego. You see now he's getting booed all over the country. Well, that's, huh? that's what's happened with this scenario yeah, here, and that's why Archie hastens, because what's happened is that now Eli is a villain. Of course, the San Diego Chargers have identified his agent, Tom Condon, as a villain in this thing as well, and there's right, a history there. You there. Go. There's a, well, and Tom is, and that's what agents do. They have to take a hit, and Tom has had some history with the Chargers on some things. I, I will also say that the Chargers, when the Manning family has to look at them, they see an ownership that certainly they must question. That's my interpretation of it. They see a general manager in A.J. Smith who hasn't been on board for long, and certainly a coach of Marty Schottenheimer who may be fired by the end of this year and if things understand. don't go well. And offensive line receiver issues, obviously. Well, right. something that will be debated, but there's no debate. Eli Manning was chosen first in the 2004 draft. Six years after his brother, he, uh, Eli is with Susie Culver. Susie? Eli, what's this experience been like for you? Uh, you know, this. first of all, I want to say this is a great honor to be selected as the first pick. It's a, it's a great day for the NFL. It's an important day. So, um, you know, it's been, a, it's been a fun experience. It's been something I'll always remember. And, uh, you know, just being here with my family the past two days has been really great. I'm sure when you imagined this, you weren't thinking there'd be booze at <laughs> Madison Square Garden. How are you handling it all? I'm doing fine, obviously. Um, you know, I, I've, I've dealt with booze before. I've played in a lot of stadiums, you know, with the uh, LSUs and fans that will that'll boo you a lot. So that's just, uh, it's just part of the deal. What are you thinking when you're standing up there with the commissioner and you're holding a Chargers jersey? Um, well, obviously, everybody knows how we feel uh, about the situation and, and what we've said in the past few days. So. Um, honestly, I don't know what else is going to happen from here. I guess uh, right now we just hope that uh, a trade can happen. So if if you had the ultimate right now, you'd be over the during the first round, during the course of the day. What do you hope for? I guess we hope that another team will, will trade, uh, you know, me to another team for picks. Or I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know how this all works. It's kind of a new territory for me. So um, I guess I'll just be, I'll sit and wait to see what happens. No trade happens, then what? Um, you know, obviously, we've, we've talked about this, and uh, we, we've told you know, the Chargers how we feel and, and what will happen if they draft me. Great day, a tough day. 
Chris. Eli, Susie, thank you very much. Well, there is some precedent, and we don't mean to say that he would be sitting out 12 months. Bo Jackson, drafted number one overall by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in 86. Certainly a franchise at that time that you would have some concerns about. He elected to sit out the whole draft. Went as a seventh round pick the next year with the Los Angeles Raiders. He was already playing for the Kansas City Royals. John Elway, 1983. You saw the heart, the horrifying picture of me 21 years ago. You also saw that Elway, for a few days, Baltimore Colt property with the trade to Denver. Similar, different, Mel, you were in Baltimore. I was, Chris, and a historical irony. You talk about then general manager of the Baltimore Colts, Ernie Acorsi, drafted John Elway. Always said, I'm not playing for the Colts. I told you I wouldn't. I'm going to play baseball. Well, that summer, Ernie Acorsi was in the process of working out a deal that would have made John Elway a Baltimore Colt. He would have never been a Bronco. The trade by the owner to Denver without his consent created a situation where Elway went to Denver for Chris Hinton, Ron Soule, and Mark Herman. In the case of that situation, John Elway said what he did, but still could have been a Colt. Now you have a situation where Ernie Acorsi, GM of the New York Giants, on the other side of the fence, trying to benefit from a player, Eli Manning, saying, I'm not going to go to San Diego. The difference here is, is that Bo Jackson and John Elway had baseball options, and Eli Manning is a football player only. Correct. And if he actually has this resolve, we know that economically he doesn't have to sign with the Chargers. Mark, but in reality, but John Elway did not have a baseball option. Well, he, he had a minor league. That was a fictional right. baseball option. It was option. fictional. <laughs> it was fictional. Look, right now Oakland's on the clock, then Arizona, then the New York Giants. If that is the only team, no, anybody could call, but if that's the team that might make a trade for this spot. Look, Phillip Rivers, the next quarterback on many boards, although Ben Roethlisberger is here, and other boards, the next quarterback, from NC State. He was scouted personally by A.J. Smith, the general manager, midway through the season, a GM going to a team, he's, you know, going to visit, that's different than a scout. He was not originally on the Senior Bowl roster. Marty Schottenheimer is one of the coaches in the Senior Bowls. They lobbied to get him on in the roster and on the team. Marty took a look. They came out and loved him afterwards. So, that doesn't mean that the Giants trade any offer, change their offer, or make an offer to the Chargers. But we have a chance in the next 40 minutes that there still could be a trade mm -hmm. which would bring Eli to the Giants' territory, Phillip Rivers to the Chargers' territory. Come on back. Bill 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 2004, Eli Manning request. Pick a winner who'll pass the test. The game at last to the next names. Welcome back to the NFL Draft. As we look at Madison Square Garden just a few minutes ago, boos for the number one pick, Peyton uh, Eli Manning. Controversy already. I am Andrea Kramer at the Players' Roundtable, and I am joined by my roster of amateur general managers, Kyle Bowler from the Baltimore Ravens, Corey Chavis, the Minnesota Vikings, Takeo Spikes, Buffalo Bills, and John Jansen from the Washington Redskins. Gentlemen, as you watched the image of Eli Manning, a very unhappy Eli Manning, what were your thoughts? Well, it's unfortunate that he put himself in this position just because it, it, it should be the biggest day of his life. He's going to sign a contract that is going to set him up for the rest of his life. His family, obviously, they're doing well as it is with Peyton and everybody, but uh, he just, he, he's the number one pick. He's the number one option that everybody wanted in this draft. He should, he should be happy as can be. All right, John, we will be back at the roundtable for much more opinion. But right now, let's head back to New York, where the pick is in for the Oakland Raiders. All right, Andrea, thank you very much. The Oakland Raiders are on the clock. This has been a hot spot. Cleveland, in particular, may be offering a two or four or something else to move up. We'll tell you why. There are five or six special players right here. Who do the Raiders like? With the uh, second choice in the 2004 NFL Draft, the Oakland Raiders select Robert Gallery. Offensive tackle, Iowa. Well, let me just put one thing in for a moment backwards. That might make the New York Giants San Diego trade a little more possible. It might. I'm just going to say that. Robert Gallery, we haven't even talked about him. He is one of the best tackles rated in a long time. Up there, Mel, with what? Tony Baselli, Jonathan Ogden, 
Orlando Pace, do you agree? Yes, I do. And I think when you look at Robert Gallery, also they say safe pick. Well, safe pick for the reasons that the tackles you mentioned, Chris, have had outstanding careers. Not to mention top guys like Trey Thomas out of Florida State with the Eagles, Walter Jones in Seattle. Keep in mind, Jordan Gross started all year in Carolina, Super Bowl team. So I think teams feel, hey, when we take an offensive tackle and a left tackle, we get an immediate return. Morton with our investment. We can plug him right in. And he is a safe pick. And when you look at the highlight package of Robert Gallery, you see a destructive force. Kirk Ferentz, the head coach at Iowa, does a remarkable job. He's an offensive line guru, and I think when you look at Robert Gallery, a former tight end, becoming a great left tackle, a lot of that had to do with Kirk Ferentz and the way he was coached. How about from the farms of Iowa to the second pick in the NFL draft? But, uh, is he Tony Baselli? Is he Jonathan Ogden? I think when you look at Ogden, I think he's got a chance to be that good. Is he Ogden as a player? No, he's a different style of player. This is a rugged offensive tackle, rugged left tackle. As I said, a former tight end who grew into the position. Very strong, tremendously mobile, and very tough. I tell you, this is a kid who did a heck of a job on the defensive side of the ball in high school as well as the offensive side. You look about the experience that he gained at Iowa in that style of offense. And you watch him here, number 78, the feet, the balance that he has, the ability to not just get your guy, but move on and assist that running back, Fred Russell, as he did. And you saw Fred Russell here, number two, have a number of big runs. A lot it had to do with Robert Jackson and his dominance. You saw him against Will Smith from Ohio State. You saw him against some elite defensive ends get the job done. And this kid never really had an off game. He was All-American week in and week out. And I think Robert Gallery's dominance on a consistent basis is why he achieved such a high grade. As I said, on a par, no question about it, with Ogden, Pace, Baselli, and Samuels. Robert Gallery will be expected. And history has proven it will happen. A left tackle moves in right away and starts from day one. Raiders? I, I love the pick. I absolutely love the pick. The Raiders are so used to going after talented players, wide receivers, running back. But now they're getting back to the basics. They're saying, we're going to win with line play. Offense, defensive line. Of course, they signed Warren Sapp, Ted, uh, Ted Washington, Big Sam Adams, and stop the run. And let's be able to run. Noah Turner, the new head coach, believe me, played with him. He loves to run. You know what's never been discussed about the Raiders, though? And I'm just wondering whether it should have been. Should they have taken a quarterback? you got to remember, Rich Gannon's coming off shoulder surgery, and he's up there in age. Tui Asasopo coming off a knee injury, and we don't know how he plays. Norv Turner is a big down the field type guy, and, and you've told a, me it he, starts with the quarterback. Why not? And, and he's a big quarterback guy. So what does that say? He doesn't see a quarterback that he loves in here. He's going to wait, maybe find his quarterback later. But he sees offensive tackle, they needs to protect that quarterback, well, and that's the guy I get. Mike identified some of the big changes, literally, for the Oakland Raiders, including the big guys on defense and the new coach. Raiders a year removed from the Super Bowl have the second round pick. Which team are they? Arizona when we come back. In the National Football League college draft. Eli Manning. Kevin Jones. Sean Taylor. Kevin Winslow Jr. Giants? Chargers. Redskins make a blockbuster deal. What? The Redskins? Who the skins? Don't you mean the Cardinals? Or the Lions? Chargers? Giants. Chargers. Giants. Chargers. Giants. I thought the Redskins got the first pick. Redskins? Man, I heard it was the Giants. What happened to the Chargers? The NFL Draft Day hat. Make it your number one pick. In this competition, there's no room to lose. So facing the opposition is what I'm going to do. I got 24 seconds to live, and 200% is what I'm going to give. So I push through the pain and raise my game. A victory is the only thing to gain. So I take it to the whole driving up your lane. I do it for the love, do it for the game. Even though I'm playing the game, I ain't playing. The trophy is the reason I can. Welcome back to New York with the Arizona Cardinals on the clock and the Arizona Cardinals and their fans. And when you think about Arizona, I uh, think a lot more than just who they're going to pick in the first of the Denny Green era. Uh, in 2001, Pat Tillman was completing his fourth season as safety for the Arizona Cardinals. Here was a man that had a chance to sign a five year deal for nine plus million dollars with the St. Louis Rams decided I'm loyal to Arizona. They're the team that drafted me. I'll play for less money. Then, after 9-11, here in New York and elsewhere around the country, he decided at the end of the season, football was not his calling. His country was the calling. So he turned down a multi-million dollar contract to play safety for the Cardinals in a state that he loved and the game that he loved to serve with the U.S. Army Rangers. 
when he enlisted in the army, along with his brother, he turned down all interview requests because he said, I am no more important than any other man or woman serving in the service, whether in peacetime or in wartime. I don't want to bring any attention to myself. That was the man that Pat Tillman was, and of course, we heard the news on Thursday night, killed in action in Afghanistan. Chris Connolly remembers. What does a hero look like? From his earliest days in big time football at Arizona State, Pat Tillman was an overachiever, admired for making the most of his physical skills, his smarts, and his aggressiveness. If his achievements in the NFL made liars out of those who doubted his ability to compete at that level, his decision to leave the game he played to serve the nation he loved made liars out of us all, all of us in sports who casually invoke such concepts as sacrifice, selflessness, and dedication. Hip deep in a culture that prizes cold cash and fame's heat, Pat Tillman turned his back on them both to embrace the values of what sometimes sounds like a different era entirely, duty, honor, country. In life, he sought out challenges and met them head on. In death, he may have performed one final service for his fellow soldiers and for America by reminding us all that every man and woman who has fallen in that theater of battle also has a face and a story that must not be forgotten. We honor his memory by thinking of them, for Pat Tillman's death has given their bravery a new life. What does a hero look like? Maybe you have to lose one to know that you've found one. New York has a, uh, a poignant, uh, to say the very least, and Pat Tillman will be on our minds today, tomorrow, all year, and every year. The Arizona Cardinals, there'll be nobody wearing number 40 again at Arizona. Uh, there will be nobody wearing 40 at Arizona State. And uh, as we say, everybody drafted today. We hope they can live up to the man that Pat Tillman was. Arizona and Denny With Green's the, uh, first pick. Third choice in the 2004 NFL Draft, the Arizona Cardinals select Larry Fitzgerald, wide receiver, University of Pittsburgh. Now let's go to Arizona and a wonderful story. A wonderful story. Larry Fitzgerald was a ball boy with the Minnesota Vikings. Denny Green, as Viking coach, knew him when he was eight years old. He's been friends of the family. Uh, Mr. Fitzgerald, a newspaper report, sports reporter, radio host in Minnesota. This, it, you talk about scouting a player, Denny Green has scouted him for 15 years. Larry yes, Fitzgerald, has. amazing. And I think when you look at Larry, he was the number one player on my board. I think when you look at Larry, 6'3", 225, had a chance to meet him this year. We were at the Virginia Tech pit game with College Game Day. And I think when you look at Larry Fitzgerald, you see a kid big, and he has that Lynn Swan ability to be that acrobat and have that body control and the work ethic of a Jerry Rice. And you see the ability there. When that ball's in the air, it's his. I think people talk about, hey, he's got to get off the jam. He's got to off that press coverage. Yeah, he can work on some things, but he's going to put the time in on the practice field to do it. Yes, I think Arizona had needs above wide receiver, but keep in mind, Denny Green's going to attack with three wide. He's got Anquan Bolton, offensive rookie of the year. He's got Bryant Johnson, and now he has a Larry Fitzgerald, who's 6'3", 225, presents coverage matchups, and you can attack with those three guys. And in Minnesota, he had Chris Carter, and he had Jake Green. Then he brought Randy Moss into the fold. So Denny Green, you think, hey, why not quarterback? Denny Green really is ecstatic about the potential of Josh McCown. Josh McCown played well in those last four games. The game against Minnesota, touchdown pass to Nate Poole, knocked the Vikings out of the playoff. Denny Green's pet project now is making Josh McCown an effective starting quarterback. Cole Pepper was in his second year when Denny gave him the reins. McCown's going into his second year, and he will have three wide receivers. Granted, they're young. Bolton's proven. Johnson needs to improve. Fitzgerald will play as a rookie and play a major role. Marcel ships in the backfield. And I think second round on, they will address the defensive needs that they have. Now listen, another storyline which is shoved aside, and we're going to get to these six special players, is that we will have maybe a dozen receivers pick the first two rounds. Mike. 
Larry Fitzgerald, I mean, is he an acrobat up there catching the ball? Man, he, boom, I'm telling you, he has the best hands I have seen since who? Chris Carter, mm -hmm. another guy that played say Michael for Urban. Denny Green. No, it, Chris has better hands than I do. But it, 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 and as long as Denny Green uses him like he used Chris Carter, look for Larry Fitzgerald to be a Hall of Famer. Now, also, you, you alluded to it, Mel. I say that third pick, I, 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 I say, Larry Fitzgerald, a great pick. You set them out wide, you put the three wide sets, but Anquan Bolt, such a great wide receiver, I would have been careful. Michael, with but, ju but, but just as Eli Manning was not the cons unanimous number one quarterback on a lot of boards, either neither is Larry Fitzgerald the number one receiver because right. Roy Williams, I believe, surpassed Fitzgerald on most boards. That's why this personal relationship between Dennis Green and the Fitzgerald is very pertinent at this point. It means a lot to Dennis Green. He knows exactly what he's getting with Larry Fitzgerald. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, 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 Larry Fitzgerald, I, I know he knows, and, and, I, and I like Larry Fitzgerald as a wide receiver, but I also know the mentality of a wide receiver, and you have an Anquan Boat who has played well for you, overly well. He caught over 100 receptions last year. You have Bryant Johnson right there, who you drafted in the first round couple, uh, last year also. So with that, I don't take Wouldn't that for Joe, because I don't want to mess with well, that. Well, that's what I'm saying. Wouldn't Roy Williams I, have been a Randy Moss type to compliment Bolden? Aren't Bolden and Fitzgerald similar Right, guys. But, but that's too much of a luxury for Arizona. They don't have Why that don't luxury. You go get you a defensive player right. like Sean Taylor, and you let Unquan Bolt do what he does They're both best. special players. Both they special are both players. best players. And after all, the Arizona Cardinals scored the fewest points in football. They allowed the most. One of the reasons that Denny Green is the new head coach, a year ago, he was sitting in Michael's seat, the head coach next year, obviously. Well, the New York Giants are now on the clock, and maybe, just maybe, there's some drama. Don't know. Maybe Sal Palantonio knows. Let's go across the river about eight miles to Sal with the Giants. Sal? Boomer, while the Arizona Cardinals were on the clock, the Giants confirmed to us from their draft room that if Phillip Rivers, the quarterback from North Carolina State, was sitting at number four, there would be discussions with the San Diego Chargers that the Giants would take Rivers and then swap quarterbacks with the Chargers and that the Giants would eventually wind up with Eli Manning. We can only assume that those discussions are taking place right now, Boomer. Well, that's what we thank you, Sal. And we said as soon as Gallery was picked, because that was the player that the Giants were talking about all along also, that that might help a trade in, I don't know, 10 minutes or... Well, it, this is a very interesting so spot because the Giants have Ben Roethlisberger rated over Phillip Rivers. So they have to take their best shot right now with the Chargers in order to do this. But otherwise, with Roethlisberger there, I guarantee you, as Kellen Winslow and Sean Taylor of the University of Miami sit there, that the Cleveland Browns are also in this picture trying to get into the Giants' spot and maybe another team or two because Winslow and Taylor are big-time players, and Roethlisberger probably could be had a couple of slots down. This is going to be interesting to see how this plays out. What else might... Look, I mean, those are enough scenarios, Mel. Gallery gone. Who would be the next just, just player? Let's forget everything else. Next player. Because we really haven't gotten into... Maybe we can. We Sean Taylor is one of the highest-rated safeties in a long time. Kellen Winslow the second, one of the highest-rated tight ends in a long time. Larry Fitzgerald and Roy Williams, Mike and the guys just talked about. Gallery, one of the highest rated tackles in a long time. You don't see this that often, all in one draft at the top, Mel. There are the big six, and they're all, all these great guys that you see are number one on some team's draft boards. And we've already had Manning and Gallery and Fitzgerald gone. We still have three remaining Kellen Winslow, Roy Williams, and Sean Taylor. And that's why you have this jockeying for position, as Mort said, because some of these guys. All these guys are number one on somebody's draft board, and that's a rarity. When you get to that sixth spot, you can still get a guy that's number one on our board. Right. That doesn't happen often, Chris. And so, Giants four, Washington five, Detroit six, Cleveland is at seven, others a little bit below. Therefore, the top six are your premium spots. So, we're looking at the trade from San Diego to New York, maybe. There may be others. We didn't think this would be the fastest moving first hour because there are lots of phone lines buzzing. So, do you agree that these are the, I mean, look, I'm not saying that Roy Williams, the safety who Dallas has, isn't equal. I'm not saying Sean Taylor is better 
or Kellen Winslow, but these grades are about as good as we've seen. Well, right? there are six of those six premium players that Mel has talked about. But the other thing that's happened that'll make a lot of players, uh, teams happy is that we are seeing Eli Manning and Ben Roethlisberger probably go or Rivers here, which slides those guys down another notch or two. So a lot of teams that we're picking, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, and on down, we're hoping the quarterbacks would go early, and we're going to see at least two go early, maybe three. Well, and maybe three, and another storyline, and there's Ben of Miami of Ohio, a guy that many say, just let him sit and watch for a little bit, and he may have the best side of all of them. So you do get the different opinions, and it's, it's exciting, and you may see J.P. Lossman, I expect, quarterback in the first round, probably fourth, four first-round quarterbacks, probably six, seven wide receivers, not a lot of offensive tackles. There are a couple of running backs, so it's heavy at the top, and then there's the next little group of six or seven players, and then who knows? I, I tell you, those two Miami players, Winslow and Taylor, are coveted by a lot of teams, and I'm telling you, there is talk right now, as yep. you mentioned, about those players. Kellen Winslow is the top-rated player on a lot of draft boards, period. Well, I think you've already seen what other tight ends that may not even have the ability that Kellen Winslow has have done. Tony Gonzalez, certainly Jeremy Shockey, and Todd Heap. Todd Heap has been tremendously effective in that Raven offense, so there are much more than tight ends. Ernie, of course, he made that point when he drafted Jeremy Shockey. He said, hey, if he was a tight end, he wouldn't have been our pick. He's much more than a tight end. He can expand your offense. Kellen Winslow can do just that. Sean Taylor is a destructive force in that secondary. He was just a safety who had ability. Fine. Ed Reed had a lot of ability. He dropped a 24-25. This kid brings a Ray Lewis passion, and Ray Lewis has helped to make Ed Reed the great player he is in well, Baltimore. This is Sean Taylor, one of the men, and he is uh, with friends and in Miami. You saw that uh, at, a, at a gathering, and it will soon be a party. But right now, it's not yet a party. But let me, let me just change for a little bit because we have six minutes left with the Giants. You draft early in the draft, therefore you had a bad season, therefore seven new coaches in the NFL, many are coming up right now. Jim Fossil did a nice job, took the Giants to the Super Bowl a few years back, but last year was a downer to say the least, and now Tom Coughlin is in. Are the Giants a contender for the playoffs again, or are they in a rebuilding mode, guys? I, uh, Tom, they've had a terrific season, I think, in picking up value-free agents, and Tom Coughlin, I don't see him uh, taking three years to turn this thing around, I see a quicker turnaround there. Let me ask you this, Morton. I think a lot of people in our audience are asking this question. Why is a trade now being consummated, possibly, when it could have been done before the pick was made number well, one overall? Hey, if it's a trade, block. hey, listen, right, right. it's true. Now, maybe it's the charge, but I'm telling you, if there's a trade here, do not rule out the Browns who covet Gallery, who's gone, Robert Gallery, and they covet Kellen Winslow. The Houston Texans might covet a guy like Sean Taylor. So I say, you watch. If there's a trade here, it isn't necessarily necessarily the Chargers. Correct. It could be some of these other. We, well, teams. I don't know what it means. Sean Taylor's been on the phone with quite a few teams back in the green room in the last five minutes. Now, that could mean He's that he likes to, his to mother. use the phone. And, or, and, oh, his mother's and, with the, Well, not in the green room. Back, uh, that is uh, gathering in Miami. So maybe what you say is correct. Giants could go down, which, by the way, still leaves a Rivers scenario alive. I don't know. Right? What a trade. Anything they can goes go down, right still now. Take them. Anything goes right now. With, with, with the way it fell, with Manning and Gallery going right off the top and Fitzgerald, right now there is a lot of phone activity going on between various draft rooms. And the two players, Chris, that were really associated with the Giants, Eli Manning and Robert Gallery, they're gone. Ben Roethlisberger's names come up. You have some other great players there. The Giants looking at possibly moving down. But I think scenarios like a lot of Giants fans hope would have would have happened have not yet. Gallery is a Raider, and right now Eli Manning is a Charger. So we have to wait and see how that shakes down as we move on. But if you're going to work out a deal, deals have been done. This isn't the NBA draft. This is the NFL, and we haven't had many opportunities to see a player drafted and another, for another team like you do in the NBA. You know, right. just to the side, you know, and a lot of people haven't really focused on football for a while. NFC East, you had Joe Gibbs in Washington. You get Bill Parcells in his second year with Dallas. You got Tom Coughlin, who certainly has been around the block with the New York Giants. So here's Andy Reid with Philadelphia, who's going to three straight title games. He's coaching in an NFL coaching a fantasy camp. I mean, all of a sudden, he's junior again. It's How almost like happened? the old NFC East when there yeah. was Parcells, of course, in New York. You had Joe Gibbs in Washington. You had Buddy Ryan in Philadelphia. And then Jimmy Johnson came on in Dallas, taking over for Tom Landry. I mean, I mean, look, I mean, this is, you talk, I, 
I don't think you're going to slip one past the coaching staffs in this division. No, very competitive division, and uh, it'll be very interesting to see how it plays out because all those coaches are as highly competitive and as good at evaluating talent, not right. just coaching talent. And, and, and look for all right. those coaches. To do, to Tom Coughlin being a quick turnaround in New York. New York has talent. All they needed was somebody to push them in the right direction. Tom Coughlin will do that. Well, here's the first push. The Giants have made a pick. Let's go up to the commission. Cleveland. Never know. With the uh, fourth pick in the 2004 NFL Draft, the New York Giants select Phillip Rivers, quarterback, North Carolina State. Well, as we told you, what did we tell you? As soon as Gallery was gone, I now this doesn't mean there's a deal. Well, no, it, it's got to be. Listen, one. it tells me there is a deal because Thank you. the Giants, from what I understand, had Ben Roethlisberger rated over Phillip Rivers. Now maybe that, that was bad true. information, but at the same time. By taking Rivers, it tells you there is a significant trade here in the works between the Chargers and the New York Giants. Phillip Rivers, a name that not many knew because you play football at NC State. Only Roman Gabriel and Eric Kramer have been uh, signal callers in the NFL from the Wolfpack now. Exactly. I think when you look at, at, at Phillip Rivers, I saw a lot of Bernie Kosar and Phillip Rivers. And you say, okay, who coached Bernie Kosar when he came out of Miami in the supplemental draft? Marty Schottenheimer. And I always thought that in San Diego, and we talked about it, it's not that complicated. You can take your guy or you trade down. And if you're debating both and you're, in, you're waffling back and forth, that's not the way to do it. Who was Phillip the general manager in Cleveland when they did Kosar? Bernie, of course. Okay. Exactly. And I think when you look at, at, at Phillip Rivers, you see that ability, that cerebral approach, and everybody said, well, it's unorthodox delivery. His arm strength is questionable. You're looking at passes here, and you tell me if his arm strength is suspect. This kid has that quick release, even though it's low. Not many passes batted down at the line of scrimmage. 4-0 in bowl games, 5-0 if you count. MVP performance at the Senior Bowl down in Mobile. Came back on the plane with Philip, his wife, and his child. Mature kid, a kid who was the guy. Remember, he came in in uh, spring practice prior to his freshman year. It seemed like he was in college forever. And I think when you look at his track record of success, the fact that he didn't have his left tackle, Chris Colmer, one of his top receiver, Sterling Hicks, and T.A. McClendon, their fine running back, was in and out of the lineup, yet he put up huge numbers, completing over 70% of his passes. Phillip Rivers, I think, will have a career in the NFL similar to Bernie Kosar. You guys like Bernie, be you'll good. like Phillip. That'd be pretty good. Yeah, who cares if the throwing motion isn't picture perfect? All right, now are we going... We have Phillip Rivers here in the green room. Uh, let's no, go actually, first. Phillip decided not to make this trip, okay. I believe. All right, all right. Let, let, let's go to Sean Salisbury in San Diego. We suggested, Sean, once Gallery went, that might sweeten the possibility of a deal. Has it? Yeah, Boomer, the talk now with the San Diego Chargers is that there's a definite possibility there could be a trade. The parameters they don't know about yet, but I expect now with the Phillip Rivers and Eli Manning situation that you will see something happen with the Giants and with the San Diego Chargers, which begs the question, Sal Palantonio, if the Chargers like Phillip Rivers from the beginning, why in the world didn't they take him? Well, that's a good question, obviously. Uh, the, 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 obviously, the Giants want Eli Manning. That was the first guy that they had targeted all along. We heard <clears throat> early on that once Larry Fitzgerald went to the Arizona Cardinals, that there would be discussions between the Giants and the Chargers. We can only assume those discussions are ongoing. And we will hear shortly, I hope, from Ernie Accorsi. It's back to you, Boomer. It, all right, Sal, thank you very much. Let's, uh, Philip Rivers is here. Um, hey, look, he's drafted fourth in the NFL draft, okay? You've made any mock draft in the middle of this season, the name isn't on the board at all. But here he is with Susie Coleman. Suze? All right, Chris, and Philip Rivers joins us from his parents' home in Raleigh. He did decide not to come here to New York. So, Philip, what have you been hearing today? I can't. Philip, what oh, have been you right been hearing? I've been right here at home. I've been right here at home with the family in Raleigh and uh, just kind of waiting. Uh, I'm excited. <laughs> what have you been hearing? We know you've been on the phone. What are the teams telling you? Well, I hadn't gotten a call yet uh, from anybody. I'm just excited, uh, you know, as of right now, to be a giant. And uh, I don't know how everything's going to play out, but uh, I'll be excited to see what happens. There's been so much talk of possible trade. San Diego, New York Giants. We know that Marty Schottenheimer and the coaching staff there in San Diego loved what they saw of you on tape. How would you feel about playing for the Chargers? 
You know, I'm going to be excited uh, wherever it is. Uh, you know, as of right now, I'm approaching it like I'm going to be a giant. And uh, if that's the place, I'll be excited to be there and be a part of that team. And uh, if it ends up being somewhere else, I'll be excited too. I, I hadn't heard anything yet other than uh, what all y'all are saying. So uh, I'll just be excited to see what's uh, uh, for sure. Philip, there's been so much talk about the unorthodox delivery. What's your message for the NFL? Well, I just think that uh, there's been a lot of talk about it, but it gradually decreased throughout the season and throughout the combine and the senior bowl. And uh, I don't think it's going to be an issue. And uh, that's kind of the feeling I get from most teams. And, uh, you know, hopefully the Giants feel that same way and uh, things will work for a long time. Philip, we'll keep in touch with you. Right now, let's go to Ed Werder in Washington. Ed? Thanks, Susie. You know, Joe Gibbs making his first draft choice in 12 years, and it may be the only one he makes all day because they have really tried to bolster their offense to the detriment of their drafts. They only have one pick today. It's this pick. It's because they traded for Clinton Portis giving up a two. They traded for quarterback Mark Brunel, and Joe Gibbs told me he feels like Kellen Winslow, the tight end, could really put this offense over the top. He says it's the kind of guy he's never had before at this H-back position and that they consciously did not, in free agency, as active as they were, did not sign a safety or a tight end because they liked the two Miami players, Sean Taylor, the safety, and Kellen Winslow, the tight end. The two players are rated so closely here, in fact, that uh, Greg Williams, the defensive coordinator, told me he went to a meeting this morning still thinking he could convince Joe Gibbs to take the defensive player Taylor but I am told they are leaning heavily toward Winslow at this point because he's told his coaches Winslow is just a unique player and remember he coached his father when he was at San Diego changed his entire way of playing offense because he had Kellen Winslow the original the Hall of Fame tight end boomer back to you all right Ed, thank you look one little note on the Giants and what, what a proud day for the Rivers family there you know wherever he ends up he's the fourth pick in the draft if Giant fans like that twang just a little bit Last time they picked a quarterback in the first round, 1979, a little bit of twang, Phil Sims, that turned out all right. So whether it's Rivers, whether it's Manning, whether it's whoever it might be, um, the Giants, now, one little question, but I'll get the answer when I come back. If it's Rivers or Manning, with or Kerry Collins, just something to throw out. As we anticipate, the Skins, the Lions, the Browns, and the upper echelon of this draft. ESPN's exclusive coverage of the NFL Draft is presented by Rocky Mountain Cold Coors Light, the official beer sponsor of the NFL, and in part by Nissan, who invites you to shift the way you move through the world, and Lowe's, where you'll find all your home improvement needs. Lowe's, improving home improvement. Now well, a beautiful day in New York and certainly a wild early afternoon here in the Big Apple in the theater inside Madison Square Garden. Manning, Gallery, Fitzgerald, Rivers. Gone one, two, three, four. Where they end, we still don't know. Now Washington, Detroit, Cleveland. Those players you heard Ed mention, what what will be burning the phone lines now? Well, actually, what, let's go back to what was burning the phone line. Frame some of that drama why the Giants were on the clock. I am told that the Cleveland Browns thought they had a trade worked out with the Giants to go up to that number four spot and take Kellen Winslow when the Giants pulled out at the last second clearly with some something heating up there with the Chargers over Phillip Rivers. And interesting that Rivers said, oh, by the way, nobody's called me because if it were, you always get a call from the team you're going to be playing with. Very good point. Okay. But, but now we're on to Washington with Joe Gibbs' first, first round pick in 12 years. And the commissioner, a one-time season ticket holder of the Washington Redskins when he was a lawyer in the nation's capital. He's been the commissioner a long time, but you always have an extra eye open for what your team might do. With the uh, fifth pick in the 2004 NFL Draft, the Washington Redskins select Sean Taylor. Oh. Safety. Well, University of I Miami. thought so. And I Hello, Detroit. Just a little background Winslow. on this. Yep. When the Redskins held a, a when Joe Gibbs ran a uh, personnel we also have meeting a trade on Friday. Oh! No. The uh, San Diego Giant, uh, Chargers and the New York Giants have exchanged their draft picks. Let me have a great question to Eli ask. Eli Manning and okay. Philip Rivers. 
And also, the Giants are assigning to the Chargers their third round pick in this draft and their first and third round picks in next year's draft. The Detroit Lions are on the floor. Well. I'll take it. Well, well then. And uh, as Jackson Brown once sang, when you hear that crowd and you see those lights, you remember why you came. As we told you, one gallery, I think, was the final part of that. Let me put what I know, okay? You just heard what the commissioner said. They've traded quarterbacks, okay? So they get a three this year, does uh, San Diego, and a one and a three next year. San Diego, let me take it from their angle with what I know, was out to get better than the Vic trade of three years ago. And what that trade was, was a, to, from one to five, this is one to four, for a number one pick, which they got. They picked Tomlinson with the ladder. They picked a two next year, a three that year, and a pretty good player in Tim Dwight. Hold on. First and fifth round picks, oh, not the uh, okay. third round pick. However, but the big number is here, Mel and Lord, a one next year, right. which the Giants don't expect mm -hmm. to be this high, of course, but you don't know. Right. So San Diego may have indeed gotten something comparable or a little better than the Vic. I don't know. I think San debate. Diego capitulated a little bit here. But sure they it did. It is also. not the trade of the century that they had been framing. And, and it just tells me that they came to their senses thinking, we do have an equal grade on Phillip Rivers. And why go through the mess what, we're about what, to what go they through? Did, what they did was reach for the sky and, and it fell a little short. And they should be happy with their job. Here, 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 here it is. Here, let everybody. Ahead, here, here, here it is. I mean, just to recap. So they trade the rights to the two quarterbacks, essentially trading the first round picks, okay? okay? And so San Diego gets a three later today and a one and a five next year. They both capitulated. I just had a feeling this was gonna, it's funny that they couldn't get this done in days, mm -hmm. right. but we got it done in a half an hour, but they got it done. <laughs> I have an interesting question. Who gets to negotiate as the number one pick? Eli Manning. That'll be it. I bet you both agents want to negotiate as well, the number one pick. Of course, both pick. agents want to do that. <laughs> right. Chris, it's a steep price to pay. You could say on paper. I think, when you look at, I think when you look at it for the New York Giants, they believe. I think Ernie, of course, he had, of course, drafted John Elway. He sees Eli Manning as a special quarterback. You have to determine the key to this trade is what is that first round pick next year? How high is that pick? If the Giants are picking in the 20s or are they picking in the top five? That, that remains to be seen how the Giants, right. you know, turn this thing around, how quickly they get back on track well, this coming well, year. Clearly, next year's number one was a key because. Ernie, of course, he would not give up. He's the general manager of the Giants, of course, would not give up this year's second round pick. I think that's really what the Chargers had wanted, but a number one next year obviously did the trick. And also the comments, I think when you talked about Dean Spanos yesterday, Morton said, okay, our entire draft this year and a first round pick next year. Well, they didn't get as much as they said they wanted for a guy that they said was one of the elite quarterbacks were, coming out look, of all there time. There were a lot of emotions and there was a lot of anger and I think people had to sleep another night on a lot it. Of and cooler heads prevailed. Yes. Look, so a Eli Manning property, Giants, Philip Rivers property, San Diego, the man that engineered this trade right across the river for the Giants is Ernie Acorsi, the general manager, who was certainly involved, as Mel pointed out, involved with the Baltimore Colts. On another end, when John Elway was picked by Baltimore, said he didn't want to go there. He took a few days. Elway went to the Denver Broncos for uh, a very good player, Chris Hinton, the veteran quarterback, Mark Herman. That's ancient history now. Everybody's on the other side of the tracks. And I just throw out, I know a lot has happened in hurry, but Jess, you think both Rivers and Manning could come right in and start. Rivers very well may in San Diego, which then might end the Drew Brees here. They had Doug Flutie as backup. New York, they have a guy that took him to the Super Bowl, Kerry Collins, albeit a few years okay. ago. All right. Would Eli Manning, like Peyton, come in and take the first snap in week one? That would be something that we would have to see. So I'm just putting everything on a fast track. But boy, there was some fast tracks the last half hour, right? Ernie's not ready yet. We're going to go out to the Giants in a moment, Ward. Well, one thing you say, and we are seeing Ben Roethlisberger on the phone right now, which means somebody probably is, is trying to trade up there and maneuver up into this spot. 
with Detroit. Well, we'll see what happens on that one. All I can tell you is, in terms of this trade with Eli Manning and Kerry Collins, as you mentioned, I've been told that Tom Coughlin is determined to play if he took Eli Manning from day one. That's it a, tells that's me it, that's shocking. Kerry, and, and now, Tom hasn't been quoted on that. That would tell me that Kerry Collins is headed out of New York because there's no way they're going to have him back up Eli. That's based on what I've heard, not what he has told me. You hear well, stuff it all, sometimes. It all just happened. All right, now we um, we told you that the Giants have taken Phil Simms, and that's been a long while, 25 years ago. It's the third longest drought, and see how the names keep coming around. Ernie, of course, he involved with that way. Archie Manning was still the last quarterback drafted in the first round by the New Orleans Saints. You saw Bill Munson. Well, I mean, that's a long time ago. Phil Simms took the Giants and led the Giants to their first Super Bowl in 1986. It was seven years later. Phil Simms, who we got to know even better, worked with us. We're moving on on the broadcast booth to other networks. And Phil Simms was a great player in New York. And now look, the New York Giants have a man. Hello, Ernie Acorsi is with Sal Palantonio. Sal? Boomer, thanks. Ernie uh, was a nail biter throughout this first four picks of the first round, but you got Eli Manning. Buffalo or Pittsburgh? Well, what you just learned is Ernie is a man of very few words. <laughs> I mean, he didn't want to spill all the beans right there in that interview to Sal, apparently, Mel. Maybe only you can get the information out of him. Well, I think when you look at Ernie, I think he's happy with the fact he got his young quarterback. I think nobody prioritizes young quarterbacks who have elite skills and we can debate whether Manning has elite skills more than Ernie Acorsi does as I said you look at John Elway he would have been a cold it was up to Ernie Acorsi unfortunately it wasn't the owner made that deal not Ernie so I think you look at this opportunity if you're picking down the line you're not going to be able to make this trade by picking fourth and they hope it's an aberration they were able to make this deal and I think that's a lot of teams now are getting away from the young quarterbacks Ernie Acorsi never will all right look here's a little trick of the trade it's live TV these things happen Sal, caught in mid-sentence, now finishes the sentence with Ernie Acorsi. Thanks, Boomer. I am with Ernie Acorsi, the GM. We had a little technical difficulty there. Ernie, go back and tell us what the parameters of the draft, of the, of the uh, trade were. Sal, the trade was uh, Philip Rivers for Eli Manning, and we gave San Diego uh, our third this year and our first and fifth next year, not our first and third. Why Eli Manning? Why was it so important for him to be in a Giants uniform? Well, we all kind of had the unanimous opinion that this was a, a special quarterback. Uh, you know, you don't get a chance very many times uh, per decade to be able to select someone like him. We scouted him heavily as a junior because we weren't sure that he you know, might come out. Uh, we tracked him this year, and I think we all felt that this was a quarterback that, you know, that you, you wait for for a long time, and, and uh, we're just thrilled to have him. What were the discussions when San Diego was on the clock uh, at the beginning of uh, the first round there, and why didn't the trade happen then? Well, we really never had any discussions. Uh, we only had a discussion when they, uh, you know, we we decided to pick Rivers, and uh, we had our reasons, uh, you know, and and um, the, you know, sure, we thought maybe, you know, possibly that that, that could interest some clubs. And, and if not, we had a pretty good quarterback for, for as far as we were concerned. We loved him. And then, then the selections, then the discussions began after that. New head coach here, Tom Coughlin. Coughlin you're starting over uh, with uh, basically just a re-energizing of the franchise. Where do you see Eli fitting in as a starting quarterback here at some point? And what happens to Kerry Collins now? Well, first. Well, yeah. We'll try and get him live next time. Maybe that'll be the way to go. But uh, Ernie's certainly very busy and was gracious to come out. So Detroit is on the clock, but we understand there's a trade with the team right below them, the Cleveland Browns. We can explain that to you in a moment. We're pretty much sure why. But right now, how about Sean Taylor? Huh? He's he's. As high a safety as you've graded the last 15 years? In the end, Chris, yes, he was. And I think in the end, I think it's about that lineage at Miami. You go back to Benny Blades, Darrell Williams, and Ed Reed, and the level he took that position to at Miami. And the fact of the matter is, at 6'2 and a half, 227 pounds, 
can run like a corner, and he's that tough physical safety everybody compared to Ronnie Lott. And if you look at this division, what Joe Gibbs and the Redskins have to deal with in Jeremy Shockey, it's expressed to me that, hey, we have a guy in Sean Taylor now for the Redskins that can match up against Jeremy Shockey and negate all the skills that he brings to the table. So this is a guy who has multi-dimensional talent. I've said it before when we're discussing the elite six players, the passion for the game of a Ray Lewis. And Ray Lewis single-handedly elevated that Raven football team, not just the defense. I think the Redskins hope that he will make everybody around him better. That's a sign of a truly great player. And because of that, a safety, normally not this high, that's a special quality that I believe allowed Sean Taylor to go up and the fact he had 10 INTs and 13 pass breakups. This guy is a ball hawk in that secondary. When he comes through with the interception, a former running back in high school, he can do some damage. He can get you great field position or take it all the way for the touchdown. This kid is thinking big play all the time. He's a little sloppy tackling this past year. Shoulder injury. Quincy Wilson, West Virginia, did a good job breaking tackles. That's not the normal Sean Taylor. When he's at 100%, he's healthy. He is a complete player, and he is going to add to a defense that already has Cornelius Griffin, Marcus Washington linebacker, and Sean Springs cornerback coming in through free agency. And just for Michael, he's from the U. He's from the University of Miami, one of what could be a record for six wrong. first round selections we could have. We told you Detroit and Cleveland were cooking something. Here it is. Can you smell what the Lions and Browns have been cooking? Uh, with the uh, sixth pick in the 2004 NFL draft acquired from the Detroit Lions, the Cleveland Browns select Kellen Winslow, <laughs> tight end, University of Miami. Well, we'll get the details on the trade in a minute. I will are. tell you one thing, Mort, that Detroit had a dead heat, and you could be happy with all of them. Sean Taylor, Kellen Winslow, Roy Williams. You, if that's true, you go down one spot, you pick up something, and, and you get a similar player. Well, no, as we know, Cleveland board. was talking to the Giants about getting up to get Kellen Winslow. And as you mentioned, Roy Williams, actually for Matt Millen, had a higher grade last year than Charles Rogers had he come out. And of course, the Lions took Charles Rogers. One other note here, though, if Detroit takes uses this pick, obviously it'll be Roy Williams. And there's no question that the Jacksonville Jaguars are trying to get up to this spot again to try and take Roy Williams. All right, let's give Kellen Winslow II his due. His father was one of the all-time greats, not only a tight end. Hey, he's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. They're on, they've been playing football, professional football, since 1920. There's about 200 guys in there. He's one of them. So, again, you talk about a pedigree like a Manning. Oh. Right? It, 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 he fits in that same mold. You know you got a great football player with Kelly Winslow, the second. I was surprised Washington didn't take it because I could dream of looking at Vernius Coles at wide receiver with Kelly at tight end and the running back, Clint Portis. A lot of UM guys right there. But in Cleveland, of course, Butch Johnson, he, uh, uh, Butch, he knows a lot about him, the head coach for the Cleveland. God, Browns, he knows a lot about this guy. This guy, you see his father right there. He can play football. Yeah, look, you know, Kelly, hey, you know what? And Mel would talk about him. Just a tight end holding up a number one jersey with Cleveland Browns. Not only you think Kellen Winslow, who was his dad, uh, Ozzy Williams. Uh, Oz comes. You think of Ozzy, no question Oz. about it. And then I think when you look at Kellen Winslow Jr., a Miami Hurricane, as Michael Irvin said, and Butch Davis passed on Clinton Portis a few years ago to take William Green, paid the price for that. He wanted a Hurricane. The only way he was going to get one was to move up. And I think when you look at this team and this position, they had nothing of quality coming back. Four tight ends none of which are starter material. Garcia, the new quarterback, Jeff Garcia, is going to go the tight end. Mm -hmm. And you look at Kellen Winslow Jr., an underrated blocker. He can at least, I think, do an adequate job in that area, but he has that approach of, I'm a dominator. I'm a presence. People say, well, it's an arrogance. Well, hey, that's what I want great players to have. They want the football. He was not fed the ball as much this past year as he really should have. Oh, he had one touchdown reception. That came in the first game. I think the quarterback situation, going from Ken Dorsey to Brock Berlin, hurt Winslow. But when you saw the spectacular catches and the ability there, look at that athlete. Athleticism. Remarkable. This kid is much more than a tight end. You watch him game after game when he had a quarterback who looked his way. And here, Berlin. And this was a fourth down play that saved the day. This is a catch, a clutch catch that Kellen Winslow Jr. makes time and time again. Looks a little careless with the football in the open field at times. Kind of becomes a running back. It's that ball outside. You can strip it some. He's got to work on that with the Cleveland Browns. But they get a hurricane and they don't pay the price like they did a few years ago when they passed on Portis over it, William Green. Let's, 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 let's recruit him. Let's not, yes, I was going to say, let's him. not forget that Butch Davis knows this group of Miami no. players better than any coach because no. he recruited Winslow and, of course, this entire class. And what Cleveland needs, they need a guy that just loves to play the football game 
They deserve that. Get that new dog pound going. Hey, look, and Jeff Garcia, all right, let me get to him for a minute. I, you know, people, ah, oh, you're not that good. Wait a minute. It's cold. He didn't have a strong. I mean, he played and won a great cup in Calgary. You know, he's won. He played in San Francisco. I don't see those things happening necessarily with the 49ers in the next year. Just what I'm saying is a quarterback like Garcia, who admittedly is not, you know, Randall Cunningham eight, or, you know, 80-yard uh, rainbows, what a perfect idea to have a tight end like Kellen Winslow. Well, we've heard Steve, right? he, he, we have and heard Mike, Steve Young even say, I want to put this on my, we've heard Steve Young say he would prefer a Pro Bowl tight end right. over a Pro Bowl But receiver. Steve was lying because also. he had Jerry Rice. He was just <laughs> but, joking. But Steve, he had Jerry Steve Rice. has said that. Peyton Manning but, will tell you but, what, how valuable a great tight end is. Of course, Troy Aikman will tell you yes, how good. great, how valuable a great it, it, tight end is like he had with Jane for, a most, for most quarterbacks, when all else fails, you fails, I got a court, I got a guy at the tight end position that I can just toss the ball oh. to. And he's always in my view. So the tight end position is a very important And Michael, position. it's a tight end if you can get the ball to him. If you're not running around and trying to scramble for your life. Mm -hmm. That offensive line at Cleveland is still a problem. They had an interest in Robert Gallery. They were not going to be able to move up that high. Left tackle, that offensive line in general has got to allow but Garcia to have the ability to do damage in the passing this game. This is through Winslow and company. It's a good move by Cleveland, all right? The Cleveland Browns are under the microscope a little bit. Really? A lot of changes up the top with the President Carmen policy only being a, a, a consultant after May 1. Butch Davis in control with the son of the old order, Al Lerner, Randy Lerner. There's some questions about Cleveland, but today, they certainly look like they did a good job. Hey. All right. We are back in New York. Detroit again on the clock with their trade with Cleveland. We'll find out about the trade and their pick with the commissioner. With the uh, seventh pick in the 2004 NFL Draft, the Detroit Lions select Roy Williams, mm -hmm. wide receiver, University of Texas. Well, and you got to like the outfit of Roy Williams, Mike. He obviously knew you were here. I, I love the outfit, and it's, it's fitting because, like you said, they liked Roy Williams last year, so they finally get some this year. They get him, and they put him with Charles Rogers. Ooh. And for, for a young quarterback to join Harrington, who has to step up and play this good, play well this year. All right, listen. I mean, well, let, let's talk about Roy for a minute, because many thought equal or higher than Fitzgerald. Last year, Detroit, with the second overall pick, took Charles Rogers, who was hurt. They're certainly giving Joey Galloway, uh, Joey Galloway, Joey Harrington, a heck of a chance to throw to people in his third year as a starter. No question. As Mort pointed out, the fact that Rivers jumped up, he was not one of that elite group that was number one on team sports. Roy Williams was, and they get him at seven for the Detroit Lions. Put him opposite a big receiver like Charles Rogers. Now you get Roy at 6'2 and a half, 2'12. You're keeping in mind, this the kid was a high jump standout. He was an excellent overall player at Texas, considering the fact that his numbers would have been better had it not been that conservative of offense and the fact that the quarterback in this past year was below average when you talk about passing skills not the accuracy you're looking for but a spectacular talent as a sophomore at texas i did a top 30 for espn.com Thir top 30 college players any position any year they got surprised a lot of people. I had Roy Williams as a sophomore number one. Took a lot of flack for it, but I think when you look at Roy Williams, even as a sophomore, he was that good. He didn't necessarily take it to the level expected because of the offense and because of the quarterbacking this past year. If he was in a more of a pro-style attack with a big-time quarterback, his numbers would have been off the charts. Let me speak quickly to Matt Millen, who's been vilified as a general manager. His drafts have actually been better than you realize, but when he took over the Lions, he was so disappointed with the speed of this team that that has been his number one goal. And Chris the speed on both sides of the football. Charles Rogers last year, a sub 4 3 40 guy. Well, Charles Rogers of Michigan State. Now here comes Roy Williams. I think Matt Millen is doing exactly what he set out to accomplish. And it's fine to have Roy Williams. I think yeah, he's equal to the number one player. Obviously, they may have had him number one, but keep in mind, this team has to run the football for Joey Harrington. They're going to so They need a running but back. They, they have to Roy. obviously target Hold that on. spot. Let's, let's I might make his comment. I'm going to tell you where they're going to get. And, and, okay. But Roy, you got another speed guy. I still need the guy that will move the chain. I need the guy to go get me seven, eight, ten yards, go across the middle of the football field and make the big play. They got the third level. 
taken care of on both sides of the ball. I like Roy. And my only cautions against Roy was, why did he take so long to come out? There's so many challenges, so much competition Here, waiting on you in the NFL. You're not going to guy for staying in school? Yes, I am. Well, like, Mike, Mike, I, I Mike, do. Hey, it's Mike. great he stayed in school, but I say, go to the NFL because this is what he does. Michael, I, I, I love hey, I love. Mike, I love he it, didn't have a Michael Irvin mentality as a junior. Yeah, I think it was too okay. humble. And, I think he laid back a little bit. I think the attitude, when I talked to him a couple weeks ago with Andy Poland on our radio show, then he told me that, hey, I'm the guy, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. He didn't talk like that as a junior. He had a Michael Irvin and mentality. That's exactly now my point. He did another year. Exactly my point. And, and I said, do it. Good. You went back to get that other year. I'm just telling you. You just said he should have come out. I wanted a guy, I want a guy that eats football for 12 months. I don't want a guy that plays it for six. I want you eating it breakfast, lunch, and So dinner. you're saying Roy Williams does not eat football for 12 months? I said he doesn't eat the best football because if he did, Mike, 12 months ago, he would have came to the NFL. back because he wanted to develop his talent. He and didn't he think did. he was a complete, I'm he wanted to be you. the top guy. I understand he went that. back for those reasons. I understand Mike. that, uh, and I love that. And now, now he knows he's ready because there's no other chance he has to be ready. And so, I applaud So you still that question now. Roy Williams? I just question the love. Roy Williams, Charlie Rogers, Joey Harrington, all right? Here's the trade, which we didn't announce to you. They get a second. Wow. Which, so in the second round, uh, the Detroit Lions will pick back to back with the fourth and now the fifth pick. So if you're wondering where they're going to get a running back, it will be in one of those two spots, and they will get the third or fourth ish running back on people's boards. Right now, let's go to Cleveland and on our force, uh, first uh, course light video conference of the draft, which I don't know if that's a moniker that necessarily the head coach Butch Davis cares about, but Butch. You, you made the trade to, uh, for Kellen Winslow. You've known him since he was in high school. What do you know about him that maybe his play on the field even more than we can see ourselves? Well, Boomer, I don't know that there's necessarily anything that we know more. Uh, his film pretty much speaks for itself. This kid has lit it up his entire college career. Uh, an enormous amount of energy he brings to the game, the passion, the way he plays. Uh, and he's a three-down player. I mean, this is a guy that... Uh, not only is a tight end, is he a big time receiver? He's a, he's an awesome special teams player. He's a lightning rod. He's a guy that's going to bring a lot of energy and uh, and can really help this offense. I mean, you know from the Dallas days with Novacek and Michael sitting next to me, what a tight end can do, especially with your new quarterback Jeff Garcia, short intermediate passing. Do you see this as a click right away? I'm sure you do. Well, absolutely. I mean, I, we really believe that Kellen's going to bring a tremendous amount of versatility that uh, we felt good about our receiving core. Uh, we feel good about our good group of young running backs. We added a very talented fullback. And this kind of completes and helps with the uh, existing tight ends that we've got. We think it's an excellent uh, choice for us. Butch, Butch, it's Chris Mortensen here. I Hi, do Chris. have a question about this. Giving up a second round pick to just go one spot up. Was that mm -hmm. tough to do? Can you tell us a little bit about your talks with the Giants? Well, you know, Chris, we had some discussions with several teams above us uh, during the course of the day. And um, just trying to gauge whether or not we could move up, uh, what it was going to take. Uh, Matt and I had spoken over the last week or so about the possibility of, of actually flipping sixes and sevens once, we got on, once they got on the clock. Uh, we felt like, you know, the second was a uh, was a pretty good price to pay, but we really felt like for our football team, trying to pick guys that are going to make our football team dramatically better, Kellen Winslow was the right choice for us. Uh, Butch, Butch, you look at Robert Gallery as somebody that evidently Cleveland, and you can speak about that, had somewhat of an interest in the offensive line, Butch, still a question mark on paper. Mm -hmm. Don't have that second-round pick right now. How do you plan on improving that offensive line going into uh, training camp? Yeah, Mel, well, certainly... Uh, you know, we've added Calvin Garman as a guard. Uh, we've got a good group of young nucleus of guys. We're going to keep looking. We're not out of this draft yet. And uh, uh, there may be the possibility we may be able to get back into the second round before the day's over anyway. Which, uh, a different subject. Tim Couch, how long mm -hmm. does he remain at Cleveland Brown? But, but through the weekend, uh, might we see some movement there, or will he be with you? You know, it's it's possible, Boomer. Uh, you know, we've had some obvious some discussions with the with Green Bay. Uh, you know, anything is potentially possible during the course of uh, the entire draft. Well, as we've seen, anything is possible. Kellen Winslow, you knew him when. Uh, get back in the room. I know you got some work to do, although you'll have a little time off in the second round. Thanks, Butch. Thank you. All right, Butch Davis, and, and let's face it, stuff is swirling a little bit in Cleveland. It's unsettling. It's unsettling from the outside. It is only April. That's all I'll get into that.
but the Browns need to make a move. Kellen Winslow, perhaps, is the first part of that puzzle. And here's a different shot of the Mannings. We'll be back. All right, we are back in New York. The Atlanta Falcons with their first pick from coach Jim Mora Jr. They're the eighth selection. Here is the nine. With the uh, eighth pick in the 2004 NFL Draft, the Atlanta Falcons select D'Angelo Hall, cornerback, oh. Virginia Tech. Reunited with Michael Vick yes, from sir. Virginia Tech. And that's all he talks about. He wanted to be reunited with Michael Vick. Well, there's a lot of connections here thus far in the draft. Yeah, and look, Atlanta, their pass defense was the worst in the National Football League. Their overall defense was the worst in the National Football League. Jim Mora Jr., defensive coordinator, been around the game a long time, defensive coordinator, San Francisco 49ers, is the new head coach. Is there any shot that this is the type of guy they got to go with? I think when you look at it, there's no question D'Angelo Hall, Chris. He says he's a shutdown corner. I think that term is overused, and I think exaggerated a lot about cornerbacks in the NFL. This kid says he is. Daryl Green had world-class speed coming out of Texas A&I as the last pick in the first round of the 83 draft. D'Angelo Hall, world-class speed. He's been timed. He claims 4-1-5 to 4-2. A kid who's tremendously confident. You will not find a more confident cornerback. Here's Larry Fitzgerald. Here's the Angelo Hall. Obviously, Rob Rutherford, the quarterback, made it easy for Hall in that particular play. Here again, you see the ability here to make a tackle in the open field. Chiseled. So you say, well, he's 5'10". He's 200 pounds. He's got great strength. And he runs that 4-1-5 to 4-2. Former prep All-American running back. And you see his punt return skills. Averaged 16 yards per return during his career, during that one season. Here, a game breaker in that particular role. Darryl Green could have been a phenomenal punt returner. He was used in certain situations when they felt the need to do that Joe Gibbs did in Washington. I think D'Angelo Hall as a punt returner can be a game changer and I think with Jim Moore Jr. bringing in Jason Webster for the 49ers. They had him out there more now with Hall. How much will he use him as a punt returner? Well he will use him as a punt returner early in his career and you have heard D'Angelo Hall refer to himself as another Deion Sanders. Interestingly enough it was the Atlanta Falcons that took Deion Sanders to be a shutdown corner to be a punt returner. D'Angelo Hall will play the left corner. They signed Jason Webster from the 49ers play the right corner and this is a guy who's very confident in fact michael you'll like this some of the nicknames that his teammates have given him behind his back is me angelo hall and, and that's quite all right when i talked to d'angelo we talked about exactly that i said there's a lot of pressure being put on a shutdown corner he says michael i don't care about that i want to show you i can play i said what about the big wide receivers in this league today he says in practice i get the biggest wide receivers and i work bumper run against them i like the guy i like a guy with that attitude i like a guy that wants to be up be the best wait a minute but the nickname that he may have, if he's as good as Atlanta thinks, is Michelangelo Hall. Right? Well, that's, that's what they're trying to do. You're going to give a move, and that's, that's a go. I give the nickname. <laughs> <laughs> that's hey, the way that this That game works. against Larry Fitzgerald made him a lot of money. That game he had against Larry Fitzgerald made him a lot of money. Well, look, so Atlanta, remember, just one little word on Atlanta. They now have a healthy Mike Vick, which was put on hold for a complete year. And so now we see what Dan Reeves saw two years ago except the more mature Mike Vick and, and a new reign there they may be a quick rising team but look the story of the day here is the trade between the Chargers and Giants that couldn't happen until Eli Manning was picked by San Diego Robert Gallery I think has played a role in it was picked second by Oakland and then uh, Eli Manning became a giant when Rivers went with the Giants and then they made the swap why did the trade happen on the clock when it couldn't happen for days. A.J. Smith is the general manager of the Chargers. He's with Sean Salisbury. Sean. Thank you very much, Boomer. A.J., you said you needed a blockbuster trade for this to happen to get rid of, to get out of that first slot. Why? Well, we're very happy with it. Uh, you know, we were going to stay with Eli Manning and, and see what was going to happen. And as it unfolded, obviously, in the draft strain, things happen, and you, you take it step by step. And uh, when the New York Giants selected Phillip Rivers, uh, some dialogue took place, and uh, we're real happy. What took the deal so long? Well, we had some dialogue, and it just didn't work out. I'll just leave it at that. You know, there's give and take on both sides, and we were determined to, to get something that we wanted, and that's why we selected Eli. So what was the deal maker? 
Well, the deal maker was just uh, when the New York Giants kind of surprised us and took Philip Rivers. Obviously, that's somebody that, that we love and have for a long time, and the league recognizes that. A little dialogue took place, and it came together. If Eli Manning, who stated that he did not want to come here, did you have any intention of keeping him if you couldn't work out a trade, really? Oh, absolutely. Eli was our choice, and uh, he was going to be a San Diego Charger, and uh, we were going to do what's right for the franchise. And as things developed, obviously it took a twist when the Giants selected Phillip Rivers, and uh, you sit down and entertain things, and we, we decided that that package was very, very good for the Chargers, and we executed it. Who was the highest-rated quarterback on your board? Well, I've always told you there were three quarterbacks, and uh, I won't break it down. Now, obviously, excuse me, with, with Eli going, that tells you something. If, if Eli said he wanted to be a Charger, would he be a, a Charger in 2004? Would the trade have happened? Oh, I, I can't answer that. You know, that's something that we'll talk about as an organization. Uh, we know there was a twist to this whole situation, and I'll just leave it at that. We took care of it. Now, you got Philip Rivers, who I know you've coveted for a long time. What's the situation now with, I guess, kind of incumbent Drew Brees? Is his days as a starter and a player in San Diego over? Oh, I wouldn't say that. We're just collecting talent at all levels and all positions. And uh, Coach Schottenheimer in August will decide what's going to be. We'll probably add another quarterback. We're going to take a few people, four or five, to train the camp, line up the best football players. Competition brings out the best in everyone, and we'll see what happens there. AJ, thank you, and good luck with the rest of the rounds. Appreciate Thanks, it. Susie Culver, back to you in New York. Okay, back here in the green room, Eli Manning, flanked by his brother Peyton. Describe the sense of relief when you put the Giants cap on. Well, obviously, we, uh, we wanted something to happen to Trey. We, we expressed uh, our opinions of what um, you know what we wanted to happen in this draft and we never said we wanted the Giants to do it but uh, you know we wanted a trade to happen and obviously it did so we're excited now. From the time you were chosen by the Chargers up until you found out you would be a Giant what was that like for you? Um, it was mixed emotions obviously I was excited to be you know drafted the first pick in the draft it's a very it's a great honor um, something I've worked hard to, to be, you know, get to that point but obviously we didn't want uh, you know that, that situation to occur exactly so uh, you had to go through a lot of press, a lot of questions, and you know, hopefully the questions get easier now. Peyton, you didn't have to go through drama like this. What were you feeling for Eli? Well, uh, it was, it's, it's an exciting time, no question about it. For Eli to be the first pick of the draft after all the pressure he's faced in college with the comparisons to myself and my dad and him to get to this point. And I just kept believing something good was going to happen. And uh, like I said, I still didn't know what team was going to end up taking him, where he was going to end up being traded to, if it was going to happen. But now that the Giants have drafted him, he's going to be playing here. Uh, I'm just real proud of him, real excited for him. It's a tough way to go through the day. What have you advised him throughout this process? Well, this was his decision, and just to stay strong and believe it. And it's kind of like when I decided to stay in college for my senior year, and Eli did the same thing. Uh, you don't ever look back. You make the decision, and you stick with it 100%, and you just keep believing that something's going to happen. So we have a lot of respect uh, for all the organizations out there, for the Chargers. It was not a knock against them. Uh, this was just something that Eli wanted to do, and I supported him 100% as his brother, and uh, I'm just proud it's all worked out. Again, in terms of drama, there were no questions when you were drafted by the Colts. Kerry Collins is the quarterback of the Giants. What do you expect? Um, you know, I don't know what to expect. Obviously, Kerry Collins is a, a proven player. He's been in the league a long time and had, has had a great career. So, uh, you know, all I can do is, is worry about I'm going to go in there, I'm going to work hard. Um, you know, where I'm a you know, backup or starter, I'm going to pretend like I am the starter, prepare like I'm the starter. So it'll only make me better down the road. Congratulations. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Sal, let's go to you in New York. Well, Susie, now that the Giants have Eli Manning, the question is what happens to veteran quarterback Kerry Collins, who took the Giants to the Super Bowl four years ago? I just had a discussion with Giants GM Ernie Accorsi, and he said, first of all, the Giants would like to keep Kerry Collins. They're going to have a private discussion with him to decide his future. It is a cap consideration, he said, and it may not involve discussions with Kerry Collins about him renegotiating his contract. He's got a, about a $7 million cap figure, and this is the last year of his contract with the Giants. So it's very much in, up in the air, but the Giants would like to accommodate Kerry. They would like to keep him. As Ernie said, you can always always use a veteran quarterback around here. Let's go to Trey Wingo in Bristol. All right, Sal, thanks. Welcome back to the EA Sports Matchup desk here, guys. Eli Manning draws maybe nobody because of the city he's going to and the way this went down comes into a locker room with more pressure on his shoulders now in the brightest stage in the NFL than Eli Manning. Tell me he can handle it by what he does on the field. Well, that's what he's going to have to do. He's going to have to play well because certainly he has created a lot of pressure on himself. And some of these wounds are self-inflicted by the fact that he did not want to go to San Diego. But clearly, as I study Eli Manning, he is a quarterback that can play in the NFL. When he was at Ole Miss, he had to make every throw. He can throw the short pass accurately. He can zip the medium-range pass into a tight window. He can make every throw in the NFL.
On this play against LSU, Eli will throw to his Z receiver on an intermediate in-breaking route. Two critical pocket quarterback attributes. His ability to recognize the coverage to quickly determine which defender he's throwing off of and the timing and anticipation of the throw. This is when Eli made the decision to throw the football. His receiver has not yet made his break. This is the anticipation that's necessary to play at a high level from within the pocket. Another element I look at is a quarterback's ability to read the defense after he turns his back, executing a play-action fake. Here, Manning immediately locates the safety sitting down on the tight end. He properly throws the ball over the top to the Z on the post, and that's a great throw. Eli is very polished as a pocket quarterback. I believe he will not have a long learning curve. Last year at Ole Miss, Eli his completion percentage was very, very high. Also, his yards per completion was over 13 yards per completion. That means he can get the football down the field. And I also like the fact that Tom Coughlin, the new head coach, now has his quarterback. Whenever you have a new head coach come in, he always likes to have his guy. The guy is going to be Eli Manning. But regardless of what play we're talking about, there's always going to be some flaws. If we're trying to take him from college and put him to the National Football League, as I studied Eli Manning, the one area, the one flaw, which I think is going to be very huge when you get to the National Football League, is how does he perform when defensive pressure is around him? When people make him move his feet, he is above average quarterback in that circumstance. In the National Football League, you will constantly have pressure on you. He didn't perform very well in college under those circumstances. Going to the National Football League will be very difficult. I think he will struggle in that area. Well, he's going to have to step up. And one person that stepped up, Boomer, on draft day was A.J. Smith. Vilified this week, perhaps, by the way he handled this thing. He comes out smelling like a rose. A first, a third, and a fifth. A.J. Smith swung the hammer well, Boom. Yes, San Diego did a good job. I want to reiterate one thing before Jacksonville makes their uh, pick. Is that Eli Manning was classy enough to go out there and hold up a Charger jersey. All right? So just, I think everybody is doing their best today to come up smelling like roses. By the way, three dog night records on sale in New York. Greatest hits. Eli's coming. You can buy them now on CD. <laughs> now Jacksonville's made their pick. Here we go. Oh. With the uh, ninth pick in a 2004 NFL draft, the Jacksonville Jaguars select Reggie Williams, wide receiver, University of Washington. Um, not as big a surprise uh, as you may think. Okay, Texas well, not a curveball. This isn't David, David Klingler with the seventh pick, but this is Listen, a little I, early. I, I, all I can tell you is, as the it's draft is player, near, now I don't spend a year on the draft like Mel does, but as I spoke to teams, there were teams when Southern Cal's Mike Williams was supposed to be in this draft who had rated Reggie Williams, this guy right here, the University of Washington, ahead of Mike Williams. He's a tall, big guy who can run after the catch, and, all I can, and Mel can tell you more about him, but Byron Lefwich is the Jacksonville Jaguars quarterback taken by James Harris, their general manager. He wanted to make sure that Byron Lefwich is enhanced by the best possible receivers around him. Jimmy Smith, obviously, is a veteran on the other side. Now. And you see Morton Island package right through the size, 6'3 and a half, almost 230 pounds. Speed is average, but I think when you look at the ability he showed right away, first game ever at Michigan, going from high school to college, became the first Washington Husky freshman to start his first game, and he put up good numbers in that game against the Wolverines, who always have talent at the cornerback spot. If you look at Reggie Williams, what I would say here is, were there any offers to move down? Or were they locked into Reggie Williams? Because there were other wide receivers kind of bunched in that group with Reggie, like a Lee Evans, Michael Clayton, and the like. And I think if you were picking that early, and of course they have a defensive end need to move down, I wonder if that was a possibility, how many offers they got to do so. I, I like Reggie, and I, I, like the, I like the tier of the receivers. In the first tier, it was the top three receivers. Michael Williams no longer there. Reggie moves right in that top three. Jimmy Smith getting up in years. Now, let me set a mini drama now, okay? Two quarterbacks are done. Houston is on the clock. They have theirs in David Carr, followed by Pittsburgh. Ben Roethlisberger will hear his name awfully fast. If anybody wants Roethlisberger, they must deal with the Houston Texans now because he will be gone at 11. the 2004 NFL Draft, presented by Coors Light. All right, welcome back to the Earth. Houston on the clock, then Pittsburgh. And look, 
the Houston Texans, I mean, his second year team, did they play enough exciting games at home? Oh, yeah. I mean, did they almost beat New England who won the Super Bowl? They they almost beat the Titans. They made the Colts sweat to win the division with a huge long field goal by Vander Jack at the end. They beat Carolina oh, by the win the Super Bowl. They beat Miami. Dom Capers gambled on fourth down better than anybody I've seen. This is an interesting team from off the pace, but the, the you, Houston Texans need defense. The, and you, you, the Houston Texans, you win close games by getting impact players. They did have an interest in trading up to get Sean Taylor, the Miami safety. But right here, if either cornerback, D'Angelo Hall of Virginia Tech or Dante Robinson of South Carolina was available here, that's going to be their pick. So there's no way anybody can jump up into the number 10 spot and take them away from taking the corner, that one of the corners that they wanted, that being Dante Robinson. I'll be shocked if Dante Robinson's because, not their pick. Let's go to Mel's board and explain Dante Robinson, a name people may not know. There are two corners, D'Angelo Hall and Dante Robinson, rated way ahead, and Mel will attest it in a minute, way ahead of the others. And so this is one of those slots that that's after what you want. The Houston pick. With the uh, 10th pick in the 2004 NFL Draft, the Houston Texans select Dante Robinson, cornerback, South Carolina. There are two teams happy right now, I think. Pittsburgh will get to. Houston, we got. Mel, Dante Robinson. He's, you have him, where do you have him rated with Hall? Yes, and I think when you look at the two, and you're right, Chris, I think you look at D'Angelo Hall, Dante Robinson, Chris Gamble, Ohio State, he figures to be a mid to late first rounder, mixed opinion. Will Poole, USC, has probably dropped into the third round area. Matt Ware, cornerback safety, debate there, but look at Dante Robinson, no debate about this kid's cover skills or his toughness. See the size, 5'10 and a half, 186. Strong kid with 4'3", four, 4'4", four speed. And here's a guy that when you look at it, four INTs back early in his career, was team captain this past season, broke up 12 passes in that Gamecock secondary. You see him there, the ability he has in man coverage, the instincts to locate the ball and make the play in coverage. A kid who was a consistent, reliable corner. Now, what I liked about him was his toughness. You talk about run support corner, he's at or near the top in any year over the last five or six seasons in terms of his tackling ability and his toughness at 5'10 and a half, 186. And you talk about level of competition for Eli Manning, you see him there. A vicious tackle on what was set up to be a wide receiver screen by Tennessee. You see him here, the ability to close and make the play. That's Fred Gibson, who goes back 6'4", 200 pounds against the 5'10 and a half, Dante Robinson. This kid in my top 25 senior board all year and elevated, I think, once he ran that 4'3", 4'4", at the combine work. Mel, and in a, in a draft that is full of wide receivers, in a league that is full of talented wide receivers, you must must have people to cover them and that's why you've seen D'Angelo Hall and Dante Robinson go on the top 10 and it, it's an otherwise shallow cornerback draft but guys like Ahmad Carroll of Arkansas and Chris Gamble of Ohio State other corners in this draft now become first round type talents when previously nobody thought they would be and the because separate, these guys are gone. The things that separate the two corners that you're talking about D'Angelo Hall and Dante Robinson these guys not only knock down passes they can intercept them and take them the other way. I can deal with the quarterbacks that knock them down, but the guys that intercept it and take it the other way, those are the dangerous guys. These are. This is why these two are ahead of everybody and, else. And plays, as you mentioned, you guys mentioned, bigger and stronger than his measurements. All right, now, the Pittsburgh Steelers are on the clock. All right? They have Tommy Maddox coming off an off year, which the year before he was coming off a great year. But obviously, Tommy Maddox is not there forever. The Steelers don't usually draft at this point. Uh, you know, a 6-10 and ten, uh, season in the Bill Cowher era is not very often. So they, as Roethlisberger, might be in a position different than we'll see about Eli Manning. We think we know with Rivers to start pretty quick. Roethlisberger could sit, learn, behind a Maddox, but maybe it's going to Pittsburgh. Remember, he's an Ohio young man. It wouldn't be a far commute, says he called her. Well, and Chris, as you say that, the phone rings right here, and Ben's agent, Lee Steinberg, is on the phone, and and it happens to be the Steelers. Yes. It's going real well, thanks. I'm sorry? Absolutely. No, I'd love to. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Hey, coach. Absolutely. Thank you very much. 
Well, guys, Ben Roethlisberger has never had it easy. In fact, in high school, his high school coach's son was the quarterback, and he had to wait to play to a senior year. So yeah. Ben Roethlisberger is used to waiting. <laughs> Congratulations from his family. Obviously, good news. Ben, <laughs> are you a stealer? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. What was, the, what was this experience like? Uh, it's unbelievable. You know, it's a great opportunity um, to be here and now to go to the great city of Pittsburgh. What did you anticipate this day would be like? Um, I don't know. It's hard to put into words. I feel a great, you know, relief right now, and uh, uh, it's everything and more than I thought it would be. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Woo! Well, we'll make it official with the commissioner, but... So this, what I started to say was that Ben Roethlisberger from Miami of Ohio, by the way, it's not like that league doesn't have quarterbacks in the NFL. Uh, Chad Pennington Gents, Byron Leftwich uh, with Jacksonville, uh, Dante Culpepper from Central Florida, and the last one's all... It, it, it's all They're not right. bad. No, that, so there's there going to be five in there. And he has a little luxury to sit and learn at the NFL level. However, and we'll wait till it's official. I think it's pretty official. All right? Yeah, we should. But now let's make it official, and then we'll move on. And uh, with the 11th pick in the 2004 NFL Draft, the Pittsburgh Steelers select Ben Roethlisberger. Quarterback, University of Miami, Ohio. Ohio kid going to Pittsburgh. Hey. He, he gets it. He gets that form of life. I, 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 I like it. I know there was divided opinion before we get to Mel about who the best quarterback in this draft was, but I talked to enough good quarterback coaches in this league who says this guy is the best, has the most upside. In fact, one coach, head coach in this league, who does pretty well with quarterbacks, didn't want to be identified. He says he thinks this guy is the best since John Elway. That's a mouthful, Mel, but you know more about him. Mort, when you look back to the Steelers, I go back when they took Plaxico Burris over Chad Pennington. Now that you talk about a Mid-American Conference quarterback, Chris, that decision, I thought, hurt the Steelers organization. I thought Pennington would have been the guy that we wouldn't have needed a quarterback here for the Steelers, but they do. I think bring a quarterback in has a ton of ability. Ben Roethlisberger, as Susie explained, wasn't even a quarterback until his senior year. The coach's son had been the quarterback. He had obviously star in other sports as well as football. Senior year, he put it all together. Comes to Miami, Ohio, red shirts, then starts lighting it up. You talk about competition even as a freshman against Cincinnati, 20 of 25 against Hawaii, threw for almost 500 yards. And you look at the ability he has, 6'5", 240, outstanding arm, releases a little slower than some of the other quarterbacks, but he can whip it in there. And I think when you look at Ben Roethlisberger also, a very mobile quarterback for his side. He is not a sitting duck in the pocket. He can move around. He can utilize his legs to allow him to bide some time and make some plays. And that arm strength is outstanding. And I think when you look at Ben, athletic ability, 300 hitters, a shortstop senior in high school, averaged 26 points per game on the hardwood in basketball. And a guy that I think comes out as a junior, but has a lot of experience. And I think when you look at Ben, the adjustment's going to be as far as in the Mid-American Conference in Miami, Ohio. He had receivers wide open. He didn't always have to stick it in there. And I think when he gets in the NFL, it's going to be that adjustment period that hopefully in Pittsburgh more, he'll have time to transition effectively and not be force-fed like some of these other you, quarterbacks. You saw that shot of him speaking in the locker room passionately. This coach I told you about who thinks He's the best prospect since John Elway also told me he has got the passion of Peyton Manning, but with more physical ability. That, that's saying something, but he's a third quarterback taken. He has the best set of wide receivers that he's going to mm. at Pelexico Bears and Heinz Ward. And that will help and them develop Antoine quickly. And, and, and Antoine ran and this guy, as far as Chris, I think that the separation for me was the Iowa game. You say, well, you put all that stock in one game, that Iowa game. Four interceptions, no touchdowns, and Ben came on College Game Day with us on the radio and said, "Hey, I take full responsibility. Tried to do far too much. It was Iowa. It was early in the season. He got all geeked up for that game and really said, "Hey, I'm going to go out and show the world that I'm not just a product of the Mid American Conference. That one game, you could say, had hey, it's one game, but it was the separation, the Iowa game. Not the best effort for Roethlisberger, but I tell you what, he steps up. He takes. He is accountable. He's responsible. He's a great kid. He loves to talk football. Talk it all day. And I say we use that word passion." Find me a bus of these three. If we come back two, three years from now, you can play this back right in my face if you want. I will say that Roethlisberger, Rivers, and Manning 
None of the three will be bust. And I will say this right now, and I had Manning number one. Manning right now is in the toughest spot because the expectation level is up here, and he's in New York. And I the Giant fans, and the way the pressure, I'll tell you what, been that way he's all the one life. I would worry about the most. Hey, here, all right, let me wrap up something with Pittsburgh. Whole new offensive staff. Remember, their offensive staff went to Buffalo. Mike Malarkey, who was the offensive coordinator. Tom Clement, who's now Buffalo's offensive coordinator in Malarkey. Wiz and Hunt is the new uh, offensive coordinator. And Mark Whipple, a great teacher of quarterbacks, is the new quarterback coach at Pittsburgh. What, he's just come off the college campus as a head coach of Massachusetts. What a perfect time to have a college coach coaching a guy coming out of college. Two other notes. First quarterback in the first round, picked by the Steelers since Mark Malone. And the longest Whoops. name ever in the first round. 14 letters. Longer than Jim Druckenmiller and Blake Brockemeyer. Just some tidbits you need to know if you're sitting there with chips and sodas. Oh, by the way, the Jet fans are revving up, and the pick is coming in quickly. Defensive yeah. speed. They got to take Bill yeah. and Jonathan yeah. Zilma, don't they? Yes. Don't they? Yes. <laughs> Unless they like the other linebacker I, better. I can't. I, mean, I, don't want it. I think Fred Flintstone's about to be teed up. With the uh, 12th pick in the 2004 NFL Draft, the New York Jets select Jonathan Vilma, linebacker, University of Miami. Too many hurricanes going too early. Too many hurricanes in this draft. So I can't miss clear. <laughs> Look, the Jets have had a linebacker. Some players who have been really outstanding for a long time. Mo Lewis, Marvin Jones. Gone. Yo, Sam Coward, not with this is prime need. Speed, linebacker, and as Fred Flintstone would say, Vilma! How is he, Mel? Chris, I'll tell you what, he's the most distinctive linebacker to come out in years, and I think the debate is, and Jets can say, why not trade down and get Vilma Wells? Seven teams, Denver, eight teams, New Orleans, 19 teams, Minnesota, and 21's New England all could look at linebackers, one of their top two need areas. Jonathan Vilma, you talk about tackles, 133 as a junior, 127 this past season. But this past season, he was more of a force in the backfield, 12 stops behind the line of scrimmage. He sips through traffic. Having Vince Wilfork and company up front certainly helped him. But here's a guy that has to be protected by the defensive line. And Dwayne Robertson is a key guy. He needs to come through big time for the New York Jets. You look at six foot and a half, 225 to 230, not real big, but I tell you what, if those defensive linemen do their job and he can float to the football, he's fast. I questioned Victor Hobson last year, didn't have a lot of speed, he'll start. Now you get speed with Jonathan Vilma, something the Jets desperately need at the linebacker position. Yeah, they couldn't make the plays last year, right? They could not make the plays. To not get to the football. This yeah. kid gets to the football. And as I said, we talked about Dwayne Robertson. The Jets were bold last year. They traded up for Robertson. A little slow coming around. He needs to have a breakout year and create a disturbance and wreak havoc inside to allow Jonathan Vilma and the rest of those linebackers to do their job. But I'll tell you what, Vilma, you look at a guy that was on the rise because a lot of teams, even this morning, were saying, hey, some teams, like I say, 17 to 21 in that area, we're going to look at this kid. Well, as the Jets have picked, their AFC East rivals, the Buffalo Bills are up next. With pick number 13, Bill Cowher will be on the phone with us or the video conferencing phone. The Quest. Pick a winner who passed the test. The nerve-wracking weight and separation of elite peers. You're checking the start of careers right here. Yeah! Chunky soup. It might throw wavable bowls. Eat up, guys. Put big chunks of meat. Come back to the 2004 NFL Draft, presented by Coors Light. Well, the Buffalo Bills are on the clock. You have to think they may be looking offense, considering last season Drew Bledsoe and company finished 30th in the National Football League when it comes to offense. So far, we have had three quarterbacks taken. Eli Manning going number one overall, but ending up with the New York Giants because of the trade that sends Phillip Rivers down to San Diego. And just moments ago, Pittsburgh Steelers selecting Ben Roethlisberger from Miami of Ohio. Welcome back to the EA Sports NFL matchup set. Trey Wingo here with Merrill Hodge and Ron Jaworski. 
Three quarterbacks taken. Which one will play the best right away, Jaws, in your opinion? Which one is in the best fit scenario? No question it is Phillip Rivers going to the San Diego Chargers. And the number one reason is LaDainian Tomlinson. When you have a back like LT in the backfield, it takes all the pressure off the quarterback. You have a foundation of the offense. The play-action passing game will work. But in San Diego, they must get some wide receivers for Phillip Rivers. And when you look at Rivers, his ability to manage a football game in his career, he had under 2% of his passes intercepted and if you project his collegiate rating a year ago to the NFL it's 118 in the NFL rating system so clearly Philip Rivers is ready to step in and play and probably will play early yeah. problem is right now in San Diego doesn't have a lot to throw to with well, Danny and Tomlinson also had 100 catches last there year the go. running back position they need to upgrade the wide receiver okay let's bring in uh, the head coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers now Bill Cower who joins us now and Bill I guess first question for you what are you gonna do right away with Ben Roethlisberger will he start will he sit behind Tommy Maddox well you know you look at it Trey I think first of all you know we feel good about Tommy and Charlie two veteran quarterbacks and you know coming into this draft we had a number of players we thought that would be there or hopefully would be there at 11 and we felt good that uh, you know if Ben were to drop to that that you know we don't feel like we're gonna be here uh, every year and, and to be able to, to get a quality player like that uh, it'd be too hard to pass up Hey, Coach, when you look at uh, his skills, obviously John Elway is a comparison when you look at what he can do. But what really stood out to me studying him on tape was his arm strength, how he can throw it to any part of the field. That has to also get you excited about what you'll be able to do with him once you put him as your starter. Well, Merle, I think when you look at his physical attributes, there's no question that he's up there with Philip and Eli. I think the thing that separates him is his experience. He played one year of high school football. He's only played three years at college. and. You know, I think that's the thing that uh, both Philip and Eli have been fortunate. You know, Eli having a lot of the quarterbacks in his family, his, his family. Philip had the, 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 his dad who coached him. So I think from an experience standpoint, that's the only thing that's lacking with uh, Ben Roethlisberger. Bill, any concerns at all about the level of play he had in college coming out of the MAC? Well, I mean, you certainly, you know, that that's something you take in consideration. But certainly, you look at Chad Pennington and and uh, you know down in uh, uh, call, you know down in uh, Jacksonville the quarterback so I mean th those guys have been you know very productive and you know I don't think that uh, again when you watch him play he played better as the season went on I know everyone talks about the Iowa game but uh, he played very strong going down the stretch and again I think when you look at the upside in this guy I think it's uh, something that we had to take in consideration Chad Pennington also doing pretty well and then there's that Randy Moss fellow who came out of the Mac he was okay too Bill we appreciate your bad. time thanks for joining us All right, thanks guys Boomer, let's send it back to you in New York. All right, Trey, thank you very much. So, the Buffalo Bills are on the clock. Now, I had to get down to the garden today from our hotel. I got in a cab, and wouldn't you know it, it's the same cab driver as he's driven me for about 15 years. I don't know how it happens. He wears a Buffalo cap. I, and boy, this is a tough pick, isn't it? Well, they'd like a quarterback, this and that. But you know what? Maybe another wideout to really replace Peerless Price. Maybe that guy is Lee Evans. I don't know. That's what the cabbie told me. <laughs> Let's go up to the commissioner. <laughs> With the uh, 13th pick in the 2004 NFL Draft, the Buffalo Bills select Lee Evans, wide receiver, University of Wisconsin. Hey, there's the Bills draft party at Ralph Wilson Stadium. They got an offensive staff. They're looking for a comeback here for Drew Bledsoe. And they got him a guy to put in the ball. Still to come. Maybe tight end. Maybe, you know, pass rusher. But Lee Evans injured. But boy, Mel, if he's not injured, where might he have been in this wide receiver? Well, fortunately, Chris, I'll tell you what, it's a great story because he got back into the middle of the first round. I think when you look at Lee Evans, where he was before the serious knee injury, which I'll get to in a second, he had speed, he had big playability. 75 catches, 20.6 yard average, nine touchdowns. Then the knee injury, final play of the spring game. Sat out 2002, comes back this year, 64 catches, 19 yard average, 13 touchdowns. Then you say, okay, did he lose any speed? after the injury. Runs a 4-4-1 four, 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 at the combine. Some had him 4-3-8. Lee Evans has that speed back. Lee Evans is a force to be reckoned with as a deep threat. And keep in mind, the Buffalo Bills, disappointing year for the receivers. Eric Moles had a 100-catch season two years ago, 64 catches, only a 12.2-yard average. Jake Reed didn't get it done. Excuse me, Josh Reed didn't get it done. And I think when you look at a situation now where they need Lee Evans to have an influence right away, Peerless Price is in Atlanta. 
Josh Reed did not make people forget about Peerless Price. And I think when you look at it, a need area to put pressure on Reed and to hope that Moulds can revert back to his old form. Big arm of Drew Bledsoe. Drew Bledsoe missed Peerless Price sorely. He wanted that guy to get the ball downfield, which, as you know, Michael, did make Eric Moulds a better receiver. This opens up this Pittsburgh off I mean, this Buffalo he, offense. He gives you that. He can get Careful. deep and get deep quickly. Hey, look, the, the new confidence, I don't think Drew Bledsoe is going to be the Bledsoe of last year, do you? I think, I think. I've talked to a lot of people who think he's got plenty left in that arm, just put the right players around him. Well, they started by doing that. The Chicago Bears first pick for Lovey Smith when he returned. Welcome back to the 2004 NFL Draft. I'm Andrea Kramer in New York. The headline of the day, quarterback Eli Manning drafted number one by the San Diego Chargers. Subsequently, his rights were traded to the team he wanted to play for all along, the New York Giants. Now joining us in the studio, the 2000 NFL Executive of the Year, Randy Mueller. Randy, how unprecedented is it for Eli Manning to have orchestrated the team he wanted to play for. Well, Andrew, we've obviously seen it done before in John Elway's case, but what makes this unique is that now we have a salary cap and a rookie pool to deal with. So it's always been a hard trade to make in the past because the money changes hands. The way the rookie pool works is if you get picked one at the top of the round, you get X amount of money, you get picked second, little less, little less. So obviously in trading uh, Eli Manning's rights from one back to four, I think the way it'll work is he gets a little less money. Obviously the guy who hits the jackpot here is Phillip Rivers, who now goes up to the top spot and gets paid like he was the first pick in the draft. So it'll be up to Eli Manning and his representation to, and, and Tom Condon, to uh, find a way to make up the difference in that money. We know it's going to be a coach's decision, Tom Coughlin's decision, whether or not to play Manning right away. What would your input be if you were the general manager? Well, I think it's a new era of giant football. Obviously, Tom Coughlin wants to put his stamp on it. I think, as we all know, New York, uh, you don't get a long grace period. So the rope will never be longer for Tom Coughlin than to play the rookie right now. I think there's a chance that fans will be more forgiving, at least in this first year, and they can advance the learning curve. I think Kerry Collins is a good player, but we all know also that he's in the last year of his deal. So in looking down the road, I think it benefits them to start the learning curve right now for Eli Manning. All right, Randy, thank you. We'll be back to you now as we join our players here on the roundtable. Kyle Bowler, first-round pick a year ago, number 19. You played from day one, posted a 5-3 and three record until getting injured, which ended your season. Should Eli Manning get out there and play right away? Well, I think you have to look at it two ways. Uh, he's going to get great experience doing it. But at the same time, in my situation, my supporting cast, I had Todd Heap, I had Jamal Lewis, I had Jonathan Ogden. I had all these great players surrounding me, so people would think it was easy. Um, you know, he... You know, he, I, th I think he's a great quarterback. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be up to him and to the team to decide what he does. I think success totally dictates, uh, is determined by uh, the supporting cast. Uh, Patrick came in two years ago. Patrick Ramsey. Uh, Patrick Ramsey for us, and 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 really did well in his first game. He had to come in and, uh, in the second quarter of, of the Tennessee game and did real well. Team started to game plan a little bit more against him rather than uh, at the time we had Steven Davis, but Steven wasn't in our game plan. We didn't have Lavernius Coles that year to go to as a receiver. We just needed more of a supporting cast to help Patrick along. He did well, but could have done better if, if we had more to go with him. Right, Corey Chavis, your Vikings play the Giants this upcoming <laughs> season. Are you salivating at the prospect of facing a rookie quarterback? Well, I mean, anytime you get a chance to play against a rookie quarterback, you get a little bit excited. I certainly do. Anybody else would. But I think when you look at the offensive line for the Giants, the fact that Luke Pettigold is probably their most effective starter right now, and he may, he may be moved to the right side, I think you might be able to get some heat. We have a good defensive front, so if we can get some heat and get after him, I, I think the fact that the offensive line still has to be upgraded is what I'm excited about. And I, I have to agree with Corey, because whether or not if you play a young quarterback early in the season or later in the season, when I break the huddle and I turn around and see him walking up to the off, walking up behind his offensive line, I see the fear in his eye. He's telling me a lot what's going on in his mind. He's worrying about the snap count. He's worrying about trying to set the front, making sure the line checks off as far as, okay, who's coming down the cornerback, seeing how many people is in the box. So that tells a lot right there. And right then, I'm no, okay, Takeo, let's go. Let's get in his mind. Let's talk to him a little bit before the play goes, and, uh, and let's see what happens. He has to beat him. All right, we see what Peyton Manning has to look ahead to. Chris Berman, back to you.
All right, Andrea and our crew there, Tequila looking pretty uh, dapper as well. <laughs> Tequila like, just as well. Well, you know what? They had a second best defense in football, and they had some offensive help. That Bills, you know, nobody's that far away. I mean, that's what we've Not seen. With league. Carolina from two years, one of 15, to almost winning the Super Bowl. Now, Chicago here in the middle of the draft at 14, with Lovey Smith, a defensive coach, making his first pick at the Bears. So you would think D line, but this is about the spot here, somewhere around here, that Mike Williams. Wide receiver USC had the Claret case turned out at least before this week a little differently that he might have gone. Sal, what? Let's take through the last week and then where do we go from here with guys like Mike Williams? Well, Boomer, I covered the case in the federal courts all week long here in New York, and as everybody knows, Mike Williams, wide receiver from USC, a sophomore declared himself eligible for the draft after the U.S. District Court in February ruled that Maurice Claret could be part of the draft. That was overturned on Monday when the U.S. Court of Appeals issued a stay in that case. The Claret case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and on Thursday, two justices of the U.S. Supreme Court decided that Claret and Williams were out of this draft. The Mike Azzarelli, the agent for Mike Williams, decided that he didn't want his client even in the country hearing about today's draft. He has sent him out of the country to an undisclosed location to got to get away from the spotlight so that he wouldn't have to hear about how many receivers were going in the first round. And they've gone four so far, and everybody thought that Mike Williams' name would be picked somewhere in the top 15. But right now he's out of the country, and they'll regroup sometime during the summer after the U.S. Court of Appeals issues its final ruling and opinion they will go perhaps to the Supreme Court to get Mike Williams and Maurice Claret in a supplemental draft this summer. But that is all depends on what the U.S. Court of Appeals decides this summer, Boomer. And here was what we'd also like to see just from a football fan standpoint, Sal. That will go on. And the NFL has had supplemental drafts before. Uh, Bernie Kosar was taken in a supplemental draft. That worked. Brian Bosworth. I mean, there's, there's names. Dave Brown, quarterback, Giants. So we'll see. But I would like to see the NCAA, if that's overturned, say, you know what, Mike Williams and you other guys, this is a special year. You want to come back and play in the NCAA, that your eligibility is not done. They will do now it. Let's, well, let's hope that they do. And I'm sure the NCAA is paying attention to it. But here's from a football and a, you know, these guys are just young men. Give them that chance, all right? He, he doesn't know what the Supreme Court's going to rule. I would say give them that chance. That's just looking ahead. When we return, the Bears will have their chance. Then Tampa Bay. In San Francisco, could we see some more receivers coming soon? Building up to the new breed, build a trap. The speed is what you need, build a trap. If finesse is what you want to possess, build a trap. Dirt the power get us here at last, the NFL trap. Yeah. We are back here in New York. There's about two minutes to go with the Chicago Bears on the clock, who finished nicely last year, but it was not enough to save Dick Jerron's job. He's now the defensive coordinator at Detroit under Steve Mariucci. Um, Lovey Smith, a defensive guru under Tony Dungy when uh, they were at Tampa, the defensive coordinator of the St. Louis Rams, much improved defense, gets the chance to be the head coach of the Chicago Bears. This is his first pick. You got to think that Tampa style, fast, quick defensive lineman is what the doctor ordered. Pick in the 2004 NFL Draft, the Chicago Bears select Tommy Harris, there he is. defensive tackle, Oklahoma. I didn't say the name, but that it, it, he is Mel, right? He is. Oh yeah. Tampa Bay right here. <laughs> he is quick. He is sap-like. I mean, I, well, I'd say if I said three technique, who's the perfect three technique defensive tackle? Warren Sapp. Right. Tommy Harris comes out in that similar mold. I think when you look at a three technique, fast, athletic, penetrate, and give you a pass rush, that's what Tommy Harris can do. He's been a player since his freshman year, a big-time defensive tackle since his true freshman season, comes as a junior. When you look at Tommy Harris, 6'2 and a half, 295, that weight was up. He played at about 280 a lot of his career, and you watch him throughout his day. This was against Alabama <laughs> early on at attacking Brody Croyle. You see the ability. Remember, three technique, the quickness, the explosiveness, get in that backfield and give them a pass rush up the gut. Lovey Smith wants to attack 
the line of scrimmage, and the line of those defensive ends up wide. Defensive tackles have to pursue, they have to penetrate, and they have to be quick. And this kid is as quick as it gets. You see that ability to get into backfield, stuff the running back for a loss, and he can also give you that pass rush ability as well. Here he is against Texas, the inside running game, stuffed by Tommy Harris. So he's not just a guy who's one-dimensional. In this defense, poor Lovey Smith got down to Vince Wilfork, 323, 328 pounds, where Tommy Harris just pushed his weight up to 295. I thought Will Fork could have played in this defense. They obviously went the conservative route and got the guy that they know for a fact could be like a Warren Sapp in Tommy well, Harris. Well, if he were Warren Sapp, though, athletically, he does have those abilities, but I heard he still didn't make enough plays. For his athleticism, he still could have made more, more plays. They rotate. College. In Oklahoma, they rotate. I thought that was a, something I agree. They talked about that, well, but they rotate their defensive line in Oklahoma. He doesn't, he's not on the field for as many plays. Which as means Will he should Fork make more plays when he's on the tackles. field. That's not on the field. They had more opportunities, more. And I, I agree. It's productivity. In terms of tackles, wasn't up the level some expected. But, hey, they rotated. That was the style that Bob Stoops believed in. And I think had he been on the field for more plays, I think those numbers would have been elevated. This kid is a heck of a football player, and he's perfect for Lovey Smith. Well, work for Bob Stoops. He's going to need to be a heck of a football player because there's a lot of pressure put on that position in the Lovey Smith system. They love to play cover, too. That means we don't have safety support. The lineman has to get to the quarterback to make the plays, stop all the running backs at the line of scrimmage. He has to be a and great Michael, player. Four defensive linemen, Chris, have not. Uh, we said would go pretty high. This is the first of those four. Will Fork, Will Smith, and New Kenichi Udeze still there. Obviously, defense line, we said all along, the toughest position to evaluate and the biggest risk factor is defensive linemen. 50% of these guys will disappoint. Offensive tackle, the easiest position to hit on. So those four have dropped, but it is a risky spot where you don't have all the answers coming out of college. I don't know how in Killian, Texas, and you saw where, where Tommy was, how they would say with a Texas twang, monsters of the midway. But they're going to have to learn that. And Susie, I guess you uh, can talk with Tommy Harris, the newest bear. Well, Chris, I think the biggest party going on in the country right now is the one going on in Khalid, Texas, with Tommy Harris and a cast of thousands there. And as you said, the Oklahoma defensive tackle is now the Chicago Bears defensive tackle. Tommy, how does that sound? Uh, it, it feels great. You know, uh, the funny thing is that me and, me and Lebby, Coach Lebby, uh, we prayed about this thing when I was on my recruiting trip. And, you know, I didn't go as high as I go, but it's not how you start, it's how you finish. So I believe I'm going to do well in the NFL. Compare for me your expectations for this day and what the reality is like. I feels great, you know, to be, this is the third, third one for our family. First Stalker win, then Jerome went, so I'm right behind him. But uh, as long as we keep this ball rolling, then good things going to happen, hopefully. What do you get, what advice do you get from your family members about what it's like making this transition from college to the pros? Uh, just knowing that it's a business and you got to be ready to play every Sunday and um, I'm looking forward to this and um, I'm just getting ready to play. Now, Tommy, I know that you can sing, but we also saw when you were chosen that you also have some pretty good moves dancing, too. How does this feel? How do you express yourself through all of this? <laughs> 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 Yeah, that's my dad right there. <laughs> yeah. Well, now we know where you get it as well, right? Yeah. Yes. Tommy, how do you think you fit into Lovey Smith's speed and aggressive defensive style? Oh, Levy, Levy Smith is a lot like, um, you know, um, the, the Tampa Bay. He had Warren Sapp and then D. Lewis at St. Louis. And now he has Tommy Harris at Chicago, and hopefully great things will happen. And I'll tell the NFL one thing. Watch out for 97. Yeah. <laughs> You got it, Tommy Harris. Congratulations. Now a member of the Chicago Bears. <laughs> well, the 2004 draft has lived up to the hype, perhaps the most dramatic series of events in its 69-year history, and it has been the story of three quarterbacks. Eli Manning, chosen number one by the San Diego Chargers. He maintained his refusal to play, but made the classy but uncomfortable move of holding up the Chargers jersey. At number four, the Giants chose NC State quarterback Phillip Rivers and then traded Rivers to San Diego along with draft picks. Rivers, the top-rated quarterback in the country. Meantime, Miami of Ohio quarterback Ben Roethlisberger had to wait. Perhaps the most talented physically, chosen by the Pittsburgh Steelers at number 11, the first quarterback the Steelers have taken in the first round since Mark Malone in 1980. So a whole lot of offense so far in the draft. 
four wide receivers taken in the first 13 and three Miami Hurricanes taken in the top 12. And Tampa Bay is on the clock. And we'll be right back from the theater in Madison Square Garden as the 2004 draft rolls on. ESPN's exclusive coverage of the NFL Draft is presented by Rocky Mountain Cold Coors Light, the official beer sponsor of the NFL, and in part by Southwest Airlines, friendly nonstop service all across the country. Southwest Airlines, a symbol of freedom, and Motorola, official wireless sponsor of the NFL. Well, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are on the clock, but you could make the case they've been on the clock all season long. This is some of the key departures from the Tampa Bay Bucks. They have 15 players that have left this team since the offseason began. They've brought in 18 players. They have basically taken a roster that two years ago went to the Super Bowl and have torn it apart and are rebuilding from scratch. Welcome back to the EA Sports NFL matchup set for the draft. Trey Wingo here with Merrill Hodge and Ron Jaworski. Guys, Tampa Bay, 24th in the running game last year. They're totally reworking this team. Yes, they brought in Charlie Garner, but you think they have to look at a running back, and there's one name out there, Merrill, that has been called the most complete, complete back, back on the draft. Right. Please fill us in on what we're talking about there. Well, the, and the guy's name is Steven Jackson yes. from Oregon State. When you look at him, what makes him a complete back, yes, he is a big, strong, physical guy that can run the football, but it's in the passing game which makes him complete is why people love him in the National Football League and know that he can come in immediately play because he understands blitz pickup. Here's Steven Jackson offset to the left side of the formation. First thing, his head's on a swivel. He's scanning the defense, and you'll see he does a great job of recognizing and reacting to the blitz. Jackson is able to do this because of his understanding of the called protection. Second thing I like, once he reads blitz, he aborts the play fake. Why? Because protection always comes first when you have a blitz pickup responsibility. With his tackle blocking the first linebacker, Jackson, by staying patient, has put himself in position to clean up the garbage the second linebacker attacking from that side. This is why Jackson will be able to stay on the field. He can execute multiple protection schemes in any down and distance situation. Here's another one. In this turn back protection, with the tackle stepping down to the inside, Jackson is responsible for the first defender who shows up outside the tackle. But Jackson's path is dependent on how hard the tackle is forced to step down to block the defensive front and he must read this before the snap and adjust his path after the snap. It's about understanding angles so that you're in position to pick up the first threat that shows. There's 20 to 30 different ways to protect depending on the defensive fronts. Jackson can handle them. He's ready to play now. Now, when you study a running back and you look at the transition to the National Football League, the one thing that I look at Steven Jackson, I study him on tape, he is a stretch runner or a downhill runner. Why is that important? How will he be used? If he goes to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which would be a great fit for him, that is how you got to use him. He is not a misdirection guy. He doesn't have quick feet. He's a power guy, so he's got to be used in that fashion. And I think John Gruden, if you remember when he was back at the Raiders, remember, he was a two tight end, power style, style running guy. So he will adapt to this guy if it's a guy he goes and gets. Uh, and Merrill, in your playbook, you talked about protection. And that's really when you look at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, that is what they have addressed in the offseason. They basically got rid of the old offensive line, bring in a whole new offensive line. And the other t the problem they have is lack of speed. And the one thing John Gruden wants to integrate on the offense is speed. It may not be in the first round, but it'll come later in round two, three, or four. He's got to pick up the overall team speed on the offensive side of the ball. And Joe, you know, Steven Jackson got, has great speed. He's absolutely. a big guy, but he's got great speed. Joe's are not completely bereft of speed because they did get up Joey Galloway in the offseason to finally give them that wide receiver burner that they haven't had forever. But I'll tell you right now, Boomer, some team that's probably very nervous right now with Tampa on the clock and still seeing Steven Jackson is Denver, who traded up to try and get Steven Jackson. Well, we'll see, Trey. And, uh, fellas, thank you very much. Uh, look, Mike Allstead and Derek Brooks are like the last of the Mohegans. Uh, they showed you all the all the the, the, the difference in Buccaneers and from last year to this year. It was a team that admittedly fell out of the Super Bowl championship to a below 500 record, seven and nine. Although they're one of the one of like one or two teams who was in the top ten of offense and defense. But they're talking running backs. 
Now let's look at our running back board. This is not a draft predominantly filled with running backs, although by the end of the second round, I think you'll see your normal complement going. How do you have the board? I think Steven Jackson is the guy. Kevin Jones, Virginia Tech. And I think then you get a debate. Chris Perry, he's certainly a guy who can run, catch, and block, but he's not flashy, not dynamic. Tatum Bell's going to be, I think, the most explosive back in this draft when we look back maybe three, four years from now. But overall, Steven Jackson, head and shoulders above. See the ranking there. Kevin Jones, a lot of people have higher than that. I don't. Tatum Bell, I have a lot uh, further up the draft board than some people do. Probably will think third round because he had the fumbling problem. Chris Perry, I'm not as high on some other people. And I think Greg Jones goes in the second round and not in the first only because of the questionable pass receiving skills. If he caught the ball a little better, Greg Jones would have been a solid lock first round draft choice in my opinion. And we are in a spot here as, as they've been talking about with Tampa Bay who by the way Michael Pittman was sentenced yesterday had another domestic dis, uh, dispute problem. He was sentenced to 30 days in jail. He is now facing a suspension by the NFL. It would be his second. We know that they lost Thomas Jones the free agency to the Chicago Bears. They do have Charlie Garner but they need a running back. Could be Steven Jackson. Next. San Francisco 49ers pick. They don't need a running back, but the Eagles might be talking to them about going up there for a running back. Of course, Denver falls behind there. Need a running back. No question, this is where Steven Jackson, I think, goes somewhere in this area. How about Dallas? They need a running back as much as anybody. Well, Dallas needs a running back. However, however, you have for value, well, well, you as might, usual, who's Bruce, got value? As, as usual, Bruce Allen took the full 15 minutes. Here the we go. Sabres had value. Uh, with the uh, 15th pick in the 2004 NFL Draft, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers select Michael Clayton, wide receiver, LSU. Well, I, I, I can tell you he is one of the names on my list of guys that Bucks were looking at. Well, John Gruden likes big, bad receivers. Go ahead, Mel. You look at him, you look at that big, he is six to eight, he's 210, and I think when you look at the ability that he has, now he doesn't have the incredible vertical jump, he doesn't have the 4-3-5, the 4-4-5 speed, but you see the ability there to adjust to the poorly thrown ball. I tell you, you look at the ability after the catch for Michael Clayton not having the great speed. He is quick, and he is an excellent route runner. Precision and timing, you see the ability to extend to play taller than six, two and a half. You see the cornerback there cannot keep up. Quickness out of his break, the feet, the ability there to separate. He he had and the toughness Nick Saban thought had he played safety on the defensive side he could have been an all-american at that spot Michael Clayton is a talent Michael Clayton's only weakness and I went through every category of playing wide receiver people in the NFL yes to everything except for the 4-4-5 speed he runs in the 4-6 area Michael Urban didn't have 4-4 speed Jerry Rice didn't a lot of receivers Terrell Owens didn't but they were effective and they weren't possession, they were big plays. And I'll, I'll automatically label Michael Clayton a possession receiver because he runs a 4 6 4. And the thing that you're talking about that he has that makes him a quality wide receiver, he has great body control. He knows how to go in and out of cuts. When I watch him on tape, I was like, woo, he will do so much, he'll do so much better in the pros than he did in college because in college they're not running routes anymore. But in the pros, he will be a great route runner. Michael Rams coach Mike Martz told me that this is the best guy on those in and out in cuts and all those in and out of his routes other things that a scout told me about Michael Clayton said that this guy runs through the ball when he catches it doesn't put his hands up into the last second probably the toughest best overall football player in this draft was one scouts uh, analysis evaluation of Michael Clayton of LSU and those things that you talk about that means he's a natural a natural receiver you'll see other receivers that you have to learn, you have to teach him how to catch it how to run through a football when you get that guy doing it when you get a guy doing it at the college level in the high school level that means this is what he was born to do good and thing they got rid of Keyshawn Johnson so they could take Michael get Clayton. out of here with that. <laughs> go well, here more there are now five <laughs> wide receivers now five wide receivers picked in the first round of the draft the record in one year is six. Michael's involved with one of those two years. We'll wait till six comes. We'll put it up there. But, you know, wide receivers going five in the first 15, which nowadays is the first half of the draft. Well, we're talking running backs. This is Steven Jackson, the fine running back from Oregon State at home in Las Vegas, Nevada, waiting the word. We'll be back. Philadelphia trying to trade with San Francisco. Well, that was a few moments ago. Stephen Henderson uh, 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 at right outside of Las Vegas. Stephen Jackson wondering, well, is there going to be a trade? It's been talked about for a week that Philly, maybe there's yes. others, moving up in that San Francisco spot because Philly, remember, 
Uh, Deuce Staley is now a member of the Pittsburgh Steelers. So although Buckhalter, healthy. His contract's up young, after this next and year. And young Brian Westbrook, different type of runner, was tremendous until he got hurt. So who wants you hurt already? Trey mentioned Denver certainly would be in the market for Steven Jackson. So who might want Steven Jackson might have to go up and get to San Francisco. And don't forget Dallas. that Dennis Erickson loves this guy. Yes, he he does. coached this guy. So and Garrison Hurst is gone, but it's not one of those. Well, you can argue whether it's a need pick or not. But Dennis Erickson, who coached him at Oregon State, loves Steven Jackson. And let's too. talk about the 49ers quickly, because if they do trade down, are they fast becoming more the Arizona Cardinals of the NFL? Yes, well, there's no question me. that there's a lot of uh, criticism of 49ers uh, team president John York. Uh, ownership there that they have basically cut back the budget so far that they are not committed to winning. Of course, John York gets pretty angry when you say that. Well, and it's been written, it's been uh, spoken. The only and that is the perception of the 49ers right now. The perception of the 49ers is that they're not the 49ers. All right, that's the perception. Of course, the 49ers were the best. Sorry, Mike, the best for 20 years. And so they go into this season with Tim Rattay at quarterback, Ken Dorsey from the U of Miami, back up. We might see him, but that's not, at least right now, in the lineage of Montana, Young, and even Gwanda Garcia. So the 49ers, look, the coaching is, there's no perception that they have a bad coach. They got a good coach, Dennis Erickson, but they need to stop the slide quickly. So let's see what happens with the pick or with the trade. Now we're going to Sal in uh, across the river, New York. Hey, Len. Heavy between the San Francisco 49ers and the Philadelphia Eagles. The Eagles want to get from 28 to 16, perhaps targeting Steven Jackson because they lost Deuce Staley in free agency. They only have Carell Buckhalter, and don't forget Brian Westbrook was lost at the end of the season due to an injury. They could be interested in getting depth at linebacker, maybe DJ Williams of uh, the University of Miami. But I was just on the phone with Joel Siegel, the agent for Will Smith, the defensive end from Ohio State. And Joel Siegel told me that Will Smith is on the phone with the 49ers right now, and the 49ers may be pre prepared to take him, Boomer. Well, why not? I mean, that's one of those. I, I, that'd be a smart pick for San Francisco. Uh, look, uh, they are not on the front wall what they once were. Young, young Andre Carter is a heck of a player. Bryant Young, one of the great warriors of the National this Football League. This pick has been traded. Huh? This pick has been traded. Uh oh, well. So they were on the phone, but they hung up. They hung Is that up. what you're telling me? That's correct. I saw some Eagle fans jumping up, maybe in anticipation, but the trick has been traded. And so it is going to be the Steven Jackson pick for somebody I would expect, especially with Denver sitting behind this slot, knowing that Denver is looking at running back as one of the positions they are trying to improve. This is a spot. If you want Steven Jackson, you probably had to go get him. Well, there's a trade as they work it out down there. Let's see who else other. Well, we mentioned Dallas, who could use a running back. Philadelphia certainly would be interested in a running back. And it is Philadelphia. Well, who do we think it's going to be? I had that. You, you do have that. <laughs> well, you know, we talked about Coral Buckhalter. This is a guy who has gone through a major injury. He has got a contract that he's Here up with. Here it is. Here's a trade. It's got to be. Here's a trade. With the uh, 16th pick in the 2004 NFL Draft, acquired by trade from the 49ers, the Philadelphia Eagles select Sean Andrews, offensive oh, tackle oh, from Arkansas. Oh, oh, I love it. Oh. Hey, let me tell you something. Well, hey, this, is a, this is you better talk about this pick. No, this is one of, a very interesting pick. This is Sean Andrews is the University of Arkansas tackle. Some people thought he'd be a top 10 pick, but he had weight issues. But the Philadelphia Eagles, with John Runyon, with Trey Thomas, clearly have surprised some people, even though he's one of the names on a list of players that I had there. Sean Andrews is a guy who was coveted by the Miami Dolphins. The Dallas Cowboys may have tried uh, to trade up to, to take a look at Sean Andrews. But there are some disappointed teams that were hoping Sean Andrews would fall to them. Heck of a tackle. Well, certainly the Denver Broncos now, maybe, I tell you, you look at Steven Jackson a little relieved. You don't know how they felt about Steven Jackson, but Denver certainly had moved up from 24-17. You would have thought he could have themselves in the mix for a linebacker, running back, or a wide receiver. Now, all of a sudden, Sean Andrews goes to the Eagles, the consummate right tackle. Talking about Robert Gallery being the top left tackle by far. Sean Andrews the top right tackle. His weight 
has been estimated to be upwards of around 350, 355, 360. Well, it's been down recently at about 340, 345. That helped Sean Andrews. You look at what he did as a track athlete, shot put discus in high school. Those are skills that you can use, utilize very effectively in the NFL at offensive tackle with the ability to get the running game going. This kid is a road grader. He's one of the best right tackles in terms of dominating as a run blocker to come out in years. And I think the ability for a guy like Sean Andrews to keep his weight at the level necessary. He's going to balloon up to 360, 370. Will he manage that weight properly? That will go a long way into determining the length of his career and just how long he can play at a Pro Bowl level, which you know Philadelphia, who was upwardly mobile last year, and what they moved up last year to get Jerome McDougal. They are aggressive again. Andy Reid is moving up to get Sean Andrews. McDougal did not pay dividends at defensive end. Now, all of a sudden, you have Sean Andrews coming in. Pressure's on Westbrook and Buckgolfer because they passed up an opportunity to get a Steven Jackson. Oh boy, he's, he's such a player. When you talk to people like you said, and I talk to guys like Lou Dallas, on, they John. love this guy. Reminding them a lot of Larry Allen, who's not who's thinking about leaving Dallas. But he's the kind of guy that once he puts his hands on you, his hands are on you. Don't worry about he's got, going He's got else. great feet. Now, this is a guy who admits and admitted at the Indianapolis Scouting Combine that he was up to 401 pounds and blaming in part a severe sinus problem. He fell off some team's boards, dropped a little bit because he skipped the last bowl game with the Arkansas Razorbacks. Some people thought that was a character flaw, but he's a, he's a great personality, and he, some, by, by some people's accounts, think he could be equal to Robert Gallery, the difference being he has played right tackle in college instead of left tackle. Well, John Wellborn went on the uh, radio this week and blasted the Eagles and start numbering those days. The trade, and it's not for Steven Jackson, it is the Eagles give up their second round pick late in the round, but so the 49ers pick up an extra second round pick. Look, San Francisco needs players, so uh, there's something that, that they can do about it. They did that. A surprise that Andrews was the guy for Philly, but now Denver, if they want Steven Jackson, which I think they do, will have a chance to pick a running back Fill the slot vacated by Clinton Port. Sean Andrews will enter the NFL as a physically dominating offensive tackle. His size and strength can be imposing to opponents. But to the people in his community, he is simply a big man with an even bigger heart. He generously volunteers his free time to speak to the elementary students and plays the role of big brother to foster children. Because, as Sean knows, with a little help, they can also achieve more than they ever thought possible. At Microsoft, we see your potential. We're inspired to create software that helps you reach it. Welcome back to the 2004 NFL Draft, presented by Coors Light. Well, there's Steven Jackson at home outside of Las Vegas. As you saw for a minute. Wondering if he will be the next pick. Uh, his dad a higher up at Caesars Palace uh, in, in Las Vegas. That's why he is there. Uh, here is the Denver spot. However, do keep in mind that Mike Shet, nobody is better at drafting a running back later in the draft. That's right. And making him a star or having the correctly uh, scouted, like Terrell Davis, just to name one, uh, than Mike Shanahan of the Broncos. So. Do they go right, running back or not? Well, they have linebacker, back or linebacker. As well. The Mobley's we'll injury see. situation, Ian Here's Gold's the injury situation, Chris, linebacker, running back are definitely With need areas. With the uh, 17th pick in the 2004 NFL Draft, the Denver Broncos select D.J. Williams, oh. linebacker, University of Miami. Yeah, just, just as Mel was just talking about, John Mobley, Ian Gold, you have those problems there, and they linebacker was a need. Running back, wide receiver, linebacker were the need for the Broncos. Let's say something about Mike Shanahan real quick before we get to this. Mike Shanahan has been a masterful offensive coach in this league for a long time. Since they won the two Super Bowls, when John Elway left and Terrell Davis got hurt, he has seen the New England Patriots and defense in this league dominate. Thus, Clinton Portis gets traded for a Champ Bailey. And they take a D.J. Williams here over a Steven Jackson. It tells you that he knows his defense has got to become more dominant to get back to the Super Bowl. And overall, I think more finding players in the first round. You go back to Belfo O'Neill, disappointment. He's now in Cincinnati. Willie Middlebrooks was a bust. And you look at George Foster last year, still coming around. I think you look at this particular player, D.J. Williams, a little bit risky because of this reason. He was a former 
running back coming into Miami. Certainly when you look at what he did at the high school level, it was an outstanding play on both sides of the ball, but a running back fullback initially, fullback at Miami. Turns out to be a weak side linebacker, can play on the strong side or the weak side in the National Football League at 6'1", 250. Speed, that's his forte. Certainly a great athlete. Is he as instinctive as Vilma? No, he's not. Does he sift, sift through traffic like Vilma? No, he doesn't. So I think D.J. Williams is still a work in progress because of the fact he was, as I said, early in his career at Miami, a running back. Does he have upside? Does he have talent? Yes, he does. But you'd have to say he's a roll of the dice this early. He played against top competition. That's the play he makes against Rand Carson and the Florida Gators. But a guy that I think when you compare, and everybody tried to compare and contrast, Vilma, E.J. Williams. D.J. Williams, bigger at 6'1", 250. Vilma, 6'5", 225. But instinctively, Vilma got to the football, I thought, a lot better than D.J., and that's why Vilma went a little higher. They need him with gold situation injury-wise and Mobley Mort, but this is a pick that I think when we look back, we'll have to see how he develops in the NFL if he's coached up at the linebacker position. And we have speculated hard about Steven Jackson being the guy here, the Oregon State running back being the guy right here, certainly no later than here. But Steven Jackson did not feel good about Denver, had not heard from the Denver Broncos in over more than 24 hours, and actually had more contact with the Denver media than the organization itself. So he had a read that the Broncos weren't as hot to try to as you think. And of course, you mentioned Shanahan has success at finding running backs in later rounds. Mm -hmm. He told Mike Shanahan says he, there are 10 running backs that he likes in this draft. I'm sure Jackson was one of them, but there's 10 of them. You're going to get one. I mean, they're going to pick a running back, but obviously just not here in round number one. The Denver Broncos, they, we're going to get back to Philly, by the way, shortly because they came up quickly. But we're going to hear from Coach Andy Reid shortly, and then we'll debate Philadelphia on whether they have put the final pieces to the Super Bowl puzzle. Um, the Denver Broncos, uh, obviously the, um, the last time, you know, the Colts just scored again, if I go back to the playoff <laughs> game. So it's apparent the defense with the linebacker and with Champ Bailey, they're going at least somewhere that they know that they're not stellar. Yeah, and, and it surprises me. I, I hear you mention the trade. Never do I, ne never do I give up the trade, Clint Portis, for Champ Bailey. Never do I make that trade. I don't give up a possible 25 touchdowns for a cornerback that may give me one, especially in the AFC West where there are no, no, no big-time wide receivers that you have to set down. But D.J. Williams is a great pick. He is a great pick pickup because he just has such speed, and he has an attitude. He brings an attitude, a winning attitude from the University of Miami. Mike Shannon has had success, as we keep hammering here, at finding running backs in later rounds. He has not had success at finding a shutdown corner, and he has tried, and Champ Bailey is proven, and the, that trade, to me, made sense, even though it's been criticized by plenty of folks. You mentioned running backs, and Mike Shanahan's confidence he can find one. You go back, and we're up at the pick number 18 right now in New Orleans. They have Deuce, and some of these other teams now have running backs. Dallas probably keeping their fingers crossed. They could have an opportunity, and they have their pick. 2003, Willis McGay, he went 23rd. 2002, William Green went 16th. We're beyond that now. And in 1984, Greg Bell went 26th to Buffalo after they had traded down with Miami. Doesn't happen that often in the NFL draft where a running back, the first running back, is not off the board until this point in the first and round. It, this will it, be a, and the third mentioned? lowest and, point and, that a running back has ever gone. And certainly not three years in a row. Yep. Maybe three years in a row, which is interesting. All right, we said we get to Philadelphia. Our Coors Light video conference. So we bring in the head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles, and that would be Andy Reid. And uh, Andy, you made the trade with San Francisco. You just like those big guys, don't you, Sean Andrews? You just can't stay away from them. Well, I know one thing, Boomer. You win with the offensive defensive line, and I think that's very important, and we needed to address it, and we did. Is this, is this something that, look, I mean, a need in the first round? I mean, how do you see this shuffling out? And of course, you had a little issue but with Wellborn this week who went out and publicly trashed the team. Yeah, this didn't have anything to do with Wellborn, mm -hmm. but it did have a lot to do with what the Philadelphia Eagles want to get done, not only now, but in the future. And we needed an offensive lineman in the mix. We haven't taken one up there for a while, and it needed to be done. Andy, obviously, just to hit on this a little bit more, you have John Runyon and Trey Thomas at your tackles. Uh, we have seen a Leonard Davis come into this league and play guard. Is, is Sean Andrews going to play guard? Is John Runyon going to play guard? What's going to happen here? Mort, it's absolutely right that he can play offensive guard, and I have no problem putting him in that position, and uh, we'll give him an opportunity there this year. Andy, you guys have loaded up for the big run. Terrell Owens, Javon Curse. Let's go one by one. Terrell Owens, 
He, at the Pro Bowl, certainly was on your sideline, and Donovan McNabb was with him all week, clearly wanted to come to Philadelphia. What made you know that Terrell Owens will be the great receiver but not be Terrell Owens a distraction? What made you know that? Well, the one thing I know about Terrell is he's a good person, and I thought that was number one on the list. And then I love his uh, ambition and the uh, way he plays football, the way he attacks the game and the, and the sport, and uh, that's welcomed. And he has a great relationship with Donovan McNabb, so I put that into the factor also. Yeah, they, they might hook up a couple of times. Javon Curse, we know what he can do when he's healthy. Pass rusher extraordinaire. His health obviously didn't worry you when you made the deal. Um, but his durability has got to be some concern. What made you know that he'll have a healthy year? Well, I'll tell you what, our team docs and Rick Burkholder, our trainer, did a great job of analyzing his situation. We're a little bit familiar with it, with Derek Burgess's foot. We felt great about Javon. What an energy he'll bring to that defense. Well, you have energy with Javon Kurse. You got an energy with Terrell Owens. You got a big, buy, big guy like you and me who he just drafted in the first round. We'll talk with you later. Thank you. All right, Boomer. All right, so eight. The Eagles are loading up. There's no mistake about that, as they should in their position. New Orleans is on the clock. We can talk more Philly in a moment. The New Orleans Saints. They, they got to get a corner here. Another Ohio State guy, Chris Gamble. It's about there time. It there Ahmad it Carroll of Arkansas. They need a corner. With the 18th pick in the 2004 NFL Draft, the New Orleans Saints select Will Smith, defensive oh. end, Ohio State. Ohio State is what they need. Right, well, they got the fresh Prince of Bel Air. Chris, oh. I'll tell you what, he dropped a lot further. I didn't bet eighth, ninth on the board. He drops all the way down to the New Orleans Saints at 18. They again, for the second straight year, passed up a cornerback. They passed up Marcus Trufant last year, take Jonathan Sullivan. Now they pass up Chris Gamble to take Will Smith. You talk about value, it's the best value I've seen so far in round one. As I said, eighth on the board. You look at Will Smith consistent Raz career. People say, well, he's not dominant. Well, I'll tell you what, game in and game out, he showed up ready to play. Consistent football player week after week. Has that mean streak you look for. I'll tell you what, from a quickness standpoint, you line him wide off that edge in the right defensive structure, this kid can be a guy who gets you maybe 12, 15 sacks a year. He was a force to be reckoned with in the Big Ten. Well, up against the elite offensive tackle, both in practice and in games, and more than held in his own. People say, hey, Gallery gave trouble. Well, Robert Gallery's going to give a lot of people trouble, but I think you look at Will Smith at this stage of round one and really yesterday when I did the final first round projection board I think going 19 to Minnesota just looked like because of needs and things that were happening that he could drop but surprisingly goes to New Orleans again as I said second straight year quarterback available and they pass on the corner to take a defensive well, one line. way to compensate for a weak secondary is get a pass rush going they are loading up on that defensive line no question about it I think they just did not want to make you right Mel. that's all they didn't want to make Mel right I did they, they took once but no it's a good let thing. me say this like, so Jim right. Haslett they called me out last year when they took that's why you know, it, and he said hey I feel a lot better than our corners than you do and I think he was referring to me because I came out strongly about true fine so again like you said pass rush over secondary here is the most important part of the this pick. Will Smith goes to the Saints. The Saints wear black. Will Smith, Smith is truly men in black. Yes, I think it's perfect. Minnesota's <laughs> next. Miami's after that. All right, boom then the Super Bowl champion Patriots. And we'll be back. <laughs> Hi, I'm Eli Manning. You're watching the 2004 NFL Draft on ESPN. NFL! Yeah! Minnesota Vikings are on the clock. Scary news for anybody in the state of Minnesota. Will they get the pick on time? They have failed to do so <laughs> the last two years. Mike Tice may be going for the hat trick. Welcome back to the EA NFL matchup. Trey Wingo here with Merrill Hodge and Ron Jaworski. Again, here's what we've got set up so far as we wait for Minnesota to make their pick. We've had three quarterbacks taken. We've had five wide receivers taken, one shy of the record for a first round. But we have had the donut when it comes to running back, zero. And Travis look at the next four picks, guys, and the starting running backs on these squads. Minnesota looks like they're set with Michael Bennett. Without hair, Miami is pretty set with Ricky Williams. The Patriots make the big trade for Corey Dillon and sitting there at 22. The Dallas Cowboys, who may actually literally be salivating at the idea of having Steven Jackson fall into their laps. Perhaps no team benefiting more guys from Denver not taking Steven Jackson than the Dallas Cowboys, who desperately need 
a running back. Take a look at Steven Jackson. Cannot believe a few moments ago that but, Denver didn't take him. This is perfect for Bill Parcells, yeah. isn't it? You know, and we, we talked already about Steven Jackson, the style of runner he is. He would have fit perfect in Denver because he is a, he's a stretch runner. He's a downhill runner. But if you look at where the Dallas Cowboys could be in this position, he fits Bill Parcells because he is a nasty runner. He's a downhill runner. Bill Parcells will cater his running game to fit Steven Jackson. I would expect Steven Jackson to go with the Dallas Cowboys. Troy Hambrick, that guy. <laughs> I, mean, I know where you're going. Yeah, I mean, you know, just study him tape all year. The guy ran out of bounds. The guy quit on runs. You cannot have that as your feature back. Steven Jackson won't run out of bounds. Yeah, you know, and don't forget Kevin Jones in this situation too. Another, right. uh, you know, athletic back that could also help. But clearly, when you look at Dallas, it's an area they must attack. And you know, the other area they have attacked in the offseason, the quarterback position. Right. I think they've done a real nice job getting Drew Henson. I went back and looked at every pass he threw in 2000. If I would have been projecting Drew Henson this. year, Year, he would have been my number one pick. So I think Dallas has a quarterback in the future. Now they got an opportunity to get a running back in the future. They could be in good shape. Drew, Drew Hansen, four years since he's played, I mean, football, which that is certainly a concern. Fair, fair fair enough, but if he had come out a couple of years ago, a lot of people had him projected higher than right. David Carr, who went number one overall to the Houston Texans. For more on this, let's bring in Ed Werder. Ed, what are you hearing? Well, Trey, Steven Jackson is a player that Bill Parcells has consistently spoken very highly about. And last week, he actually got on the phone with Steven Jackson. He expressed to Jackson a vast knowledge of his career, told him he was really impressed with the way he played. Clearly, he's much more of an inside tackle-breaking type of runner than a Kevin Jones, who was probably the number two back on the Cowboys board. This is certainly a position the Cowboys never expected to be in. They couldn't have imagined things falling this way. In fact, I know that at various times, in the last week, they have talked to the Chicago Bears about trying to go up as high as 14 to try to get maybe the second running back. But now it looks very much like they're going to be able to substantially improve a running game that last year featured Troy Hambrick failing to gain as a replacement for Emmitt Smith 1,000 yards in the season. In fact, there were nine games last season where Troy Hambrick failed to average three yards per carry. Back to you, Boom. All right, Ed, thank you very much. Miami and Minnesota have made a trade. Now you could say... Minnesota wanted to buy more time on the clock. I mean, you could say that, right? <laughs> I know it's not fair, but you could say it. But Miami and Minnesota is going to pick up something. We don't have the details yet. Remember, two years in a row, Minnesota had clock management problems. Last year, we saw the, the speed rarely timed by the guys sitting at that table down there. The guys were running four 340s with their cards. Three or four teams <laughs> passing over Minnesota. Making uh, making the pick. Well, Mike Tice not going to miss the pick, but he's now below Miami. So the Dolphins are on the board. Look, here's another team that feels, boy, how do we not make a run? They have some things to address at quarterback. Yes, they had they got Feely from Philadelphia along to go with uh, Fiedler. They changed a majority of their offensive line. Clearly, other than Ricky Williams and Chambers, a couple receivers, some offensive changes. What do we see? With the uh, 19th pick in the 2004 NFL Draft acquired from the Minnesota Vikings, the Miami Dolphins select Vernon Carey, guard from the University of Miami. All right, first question. Uh, well, all right, we'll talk about the player first. Did they have to come up to do that? Although they need to change their offensive line, it was clearly a weakness last well, year. When, when Sean Andrews went off the board, Vernon Carey just went up in value. In fact, the Minnesota Vikings like Vernon Carey over Sean Andrews. Okay. So the Dolphins went up and had to get this guy. That was the greatest need. The thing about Vernon Carey is more versatility. He played guard. Of course, he had the ankle injury. He's a senior, which hampered him. But as a junior at right tackle, That's you think about McIntosh and St. Clair coming over. Big question marks about Rex right tackle. You have Wade Smith over on the left side. You have Whitley at the one guard spot. You have McKinney at center. And then you have Geno James coming over from Carolina. Good acquisition at the other guard spot. But now all of a sudden, you get a right tackle in Carey, who, as I said, as a junior, MVP on the offensive side in five games that junior year against Florida State, Florida, Virginia Tech, and Pitt. Battle tested against top competition. As I said, had that ankle injury. He even played left tackle, filled in for Bryant McKinney against Virginia Tech when McKinney got hurt in that game. He's played all four spots on the offensive line except for center. As Mort mentioned, at Miami, he'll be in that mix with McIntosh, St. Clair for that starting right tackle job in a completely restructured offensive and line. Look at, let's look at the Dolphins and the, all the pressure on Dave Wanson. That's an offense that has been under fire. We know they have A.J. Feely at, in a trade with the Philadelphia Eagles. They did this in the offseason. Jay Fiedler still in the competition. 
competition there. But they added David Boston to the mix at wide receiver, along with Chris Chambers. Now you got Ricky Williams. Now you fix this offensive line. All of a sudden, they might talk, talk offense about the Dolphins if, if A.J. Feeler or Jay Feeler step up. It, it is a good pick for my man. I'm a little surprised that I didn't see Dallas trying to jock him more for position and get Stephen Davis, like you said, maybe he falls. Steve, Stephen Jackson maybe he falls at Dallas at right, right where they're sitting. But they you worried about the now. Cowboys? Or I, I am. I'm, 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 I'm already Those circling are the Cowboys. With. Hey, Listen. I live in Dallas. I'm circling that pick <laughs> oh right goodness. now. Two other, a, a couple other things to remember about Miami. They acquired the troubled, and I don't know what else to say, David Boston, wide receiver who was nowhere close last year in San Diego, who's had good season in Arizona, who's, who's back but, with they, Jerry but they Sullivan. tried him. All right? A note on Miami. Their cold weather games, they don't have any this year. They're at Buffalo early. They're at the Jets early. They're at New England early. Just throw that out there. They've always had trouble in the cold. They don't have any this year of those divisional cold weather games on the road past early November. We'll come back with the Vikings on the clock. An interesting phenomenon. We put 25 years ESPN NFL draft. 25 years of coverage for the first to the last. Gavel to gavel from beginning to end. We're picking superstars of the game again. NFL! Yeah! NFL draft presented by Coors Light. All right, so Minnesota's on the clock. <laughs> you got to give Viking fans the nod. They're all looking at their watch. They vow that the third year, there will not be a clock malfunction. Here's the pick. With the uh, 20th pick in the 2004 NFL Draft, the Minnesota Vikings select Kenichi Udize, defensive end, Southern California. Kenichi Udize from the University of Southern California, the national champs, the co-champs. And he was, he went down a little bit, Mel, right, because of injury, correct? A, sh a shoulder injury, Chris. The final regular season game against Oregon State. The questions about that, and you get the leads leading up to the draft the last two, three weeks going up to April 24th today. And I think when you look at Kenichi Udeze, a defensive tackle, got his weight down to be a defensive man, and a guy that I thought was disruptive behind the line of scrimmage. Look at his numbers. He talked about 26 tackles for a loss. 16 and a half sacks and you cause five fumbles. That means you're getting in that backfield, you're creating a disturbance, and you're doing a job there as he did tackling Julius Jones, who had a great year for Notre Dame at the running back spot. They're not only back down to pass, come away with the INT. Here's against Washington off the left side. Beats the left, the right tackle, gets in for the sack and creates a turnover. This kid is looking to strip the football any chance he gets. They're sacking John Navarre, getting the best of a very good Michigan offensive line. So up against good players in practice, and in games, when you look at Kenichi Udeze, I thought he could go as early as Jacksonville at nine. He drops down to Minnesota. I thought Will Smith would be able. He went to New Orleans one pick above, so I think Mike Tice was, I think, keeping his fingers crossed that one of those defensive ends would be there. And there, of course, he sacks Derek Anderson, makes a play there against Chris Perry. Look at the talent of the players he's making plays against at running back and quarterback and who he's going up against on the offensive line. If it wasn't for that shoulder injury, he may have gone a little bit earlier. As I said, once projected, maybe ninth overall to the Jacksonville oh, Jaguars. Well, and in fact, that shoulder injury, it's a torn labrum or it's a labrum injury. And, and there are some teams that are saying he's going to need surgery at some point, and, and it did scare them. But it is something that can be surgically corrected, and it doesn't have to end your season. And this is a guy that Mike Tyson was just praying would fall to them. In the Metrodome, with that noise, on AstroTurf, they have become the even more of a dominant whole team with this guy well, rushing the passer. And you know what their problem was on D? They were one of the slower teams in the league. Now, I don't imply that ESPN's Corey Chavis who also is a Pro Bowl safety for the Minnesota Vikings, who's with Andrea right now. I don't imply that he's one of those guys, but I'd like to get his uh, thoughts on a new quick teammate up front. Andrea? Thanks, Chris. And I just want you to know that when you said they were sort of slow on defense, Corey went, ooh. Is Chris Berman's right, though. You need to add speed. What does Udaisy do to, to that end? Well, I mean, I, he does a lot. I mean, obviously, I think he uses his hands better than most of the defensive linemen coming out this year. And the best thing about you, Daisy, I think, is the fact that his work ethic improved so much uh, while he was in school. He lost all the weight. He proved that he was determined to be one of the best in the Pac-10. And obviously, it was a big reason why they won the national championship. Now, we know the Vikings got off to the strong 6-0 start. A lot on the strength of turnovers from your defense, but then really almost collapsed down the stretch the entire team. 
what does the defense need to do to pick up the slack, especially with that prolific offense that you have? Well, I just think we need to be overall more consistent. And I think when you bring somebody in like Antoine Winfield, mm -hmm. uh, you got to credit our personnel department and our coaching staff for identifying that. Uh, he's a guy who can add a lot of energy to your defense. And you don't go through those types of lulls when you have somebody who I think gets to crowd into it. He's a big-time hitter. And I think people will enjoy watching him play in Minnesota. And um, I think that's probably one of the bigger reasons. You also were able to pick up Martin, and now you pick up Udazi. I think overall, you certainly improved your talent level, and that's what you have to do to be successful. What other needs do you think the Vikings have at this point in the draft? Well, I think that's something that Scott Stubwell and uh, Frank Gilliam and, and Coach Tyson and the rest of our personnel department have a lot better feel about. It. They do a great job. Last year, they did an excellent job, I think, of identifying uh, the best players available throughout the draft, and all of our players were able to contribute. If you look at... Um, each one of our guys that we drafted in the seven rounds, each one of those guys contributed. Even our seventh rounder, Keenan Howry, was our starting punt returner. So if we continue to get uh, the depth like we've gotten so far, adding somebody like you, Daisy, I think we're going to be in good shape. And the best news, of course, they made the pick on time. <laughs> the NFL draft will continue from New York. The New England Patriots are on the clock. Please stay with us. A short time ago, Robert Gallery was picked number two overall by the Raiders. He's making a call on a phone provided by Motorola. Motorola will provide a voice to the fans on ESPN.com. Log on to Ask Mel a Question, and it might even get on in our You've Got Mel segment. All right, welcome back to New York. Uh, just let me clean up one thing. Uh, by Minnesota dropping down one and allowing Miami to pick ahead of them, they got a fourth-round pick. Now, the only team with two first-round picks... Happen to be the Super Bowl champion, New England Patriots. This involved with the Kyle Bowler orchestrations last year. Uh, so this is the pick that was originally owned by the Baltimore Ravens. The New England Patriots, mm, what do they do lately? Well, they won 15 games in a row to win the Super Bowl. They uh, have six picks in the first four rounds. And oh, by the way, this past week, it was a second round pick, they acquired Corey Dillon. A one time the single game record holder for yards rushed in a game. So a New England Patriots team, which you say, boy, how could you win a, two Super Bowls in the last three years without a big time running back? Corey Dillon certainly could be that. So here's a team that's won 15 straight. They got two first round picks, although I'm not sure that the phone lines aren't burning right now. As a matter of fact, I'm sure right. they are. But there are a couple, they don't need anything. But they, there's a player or two that's kind of popped down. Well, let, let's go to New England first. Well, when I look at a knee, and you're right, I mean, Corey Dillon, if Corey Dillon comes through for them, then then it's a wonderful thing. But they, listen, they did lose Ted Washington. Yes. Big run and, and we are looking at Vince Wilfork, the University of Miami defensive Big tackle, who's a 340-pound type guy. He would seem to fit beautifully here. But you also, we talked about running backs have fallen. Dallas is sitting right behind New England. Anybody who wants a running back probably has to go through New England right now or else Dallas gets the pick of guys like Steven Jackson of Oregon State and Kevin Jones of Virginia Tech. That's the scenario right now. And more, we were debating all along that the Patriots were, what running back could slide to 21? Will Steven Jackson be there? Will Kevin Jones be there? Well, they're both there. And I think that's probably surprising to Bill Belichick and Scott Pioli that those running backs are still there. But you mentioned the defense, the back seven. You look at the linebacking core, four of those linebackers over 30 years of age. The secondary, three of those four over 30. Yeah. And, of course, the only young kid is the second-round pick last year, Eugene Wilson. So I think age on defense is getting a, becoming a factor, and they want to go a little with some more youth in the back seven on the defensive side. Keep in mind, they did take Ty Warren in the first round last year on the defensive line out of Texas A&M and added uh, Rodney Bailey as well, Chris, for a late-round pick on the defensive line. Let me line. just throw out one thing because, look, now they can pick the best player that they have, and, and there's another player that's fallen some. I'm not exactly sure where they are on this. And two years ago, they used the number one at tight end to pick Graham. But there's Ben Troop, who's there, who on some boards might have been gone by now. Might have. Okay, so, Mel, let, let's look at your names. And, I, you know, this is something they could do. It won't be Gamble. Right. It won't be Gamble? What no. about guys like Ahmad Carroll of Arkansas? Another corner. If you're trying to get younger in the back seven, the linebackers are gone. They, probably, they might have looked at a linebacker, wouldn't they? Sure. They, they would, but they certainly, they're pretty good on the outside, wherever they are right now with McGinnis and, and, and Brabel and Roosevelt and, Colvin, and, who didn't play one down for them last year. That's like getting a new player also. And, this coming keep year. in mind, Rodney Bailey comes over as well. So I think they have done some things to fortify that front seven on defense. They'd like to do a little more. And I think right now, has the board fallen properly for the Patriots? Is the right guy there? The two Miami linebackers are already off the board. You talk about a hot guy right now. 
And I know there's some teams that are saying, Vince Wil the last Miami Hurricane of the six is Vince Wilfork still on the board. This kid is an athletically gifted 328-pounder, Chris, a, a heck of a talent. And a defensive tackle with that kind of ability normally is not there this late in round right. one. One thing you can say he's possibly, possibly, Big Terry Washington's one of the best run stoppers in this league. What, what? He could possibly be an athletic, a more athletic Ted Washington and allow... You're talking about Vince Wilfork. You're talking about be, Vince yeah. Wilfork. Well, one thing it, it, it could be great for New England. One thing about Bill Belichick we should note here, and Scott Pioli, the vice president and player personnel of the Patriots. And executive of the year. An executive of the year by the sporting news uh, and vote of his peers. They like to stockpile picks for the following draft to reset their draft. So if they are talking to teams, it would be a surprise if it didn't involve getting a draft pick next year so they can stop, start stockpiling again. They might have gone up. They might have spent a third to going up, but they could go down and then pick something else up. They're going to they got three and a half minutes to go. Uh, let's go quickly to Ed Warder because it's it, the next two on the clock, Ed, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> New England, Dallas, Belichick, Parcells, what do we got? Well, the interesting potential thing is here that only the Patriots now stand in front of Dallas getting its choice of any running back in the entire draft. And I was told by Cowboys people that they can't discount the possibility that even though they signed Corey Dillon, they should not assume that the Patriots are, quote, out of the running back business. Now, it's possible, given the acrimonious relationship or at least the estrangement between uh, Belichick and Parcells, once very close, once sharing a Super Bowl title, that perhaps Belichick would call the Cowboys, perhaps on a bluff, and ask them if they would give up a pick so that he wouldn't take Steven Jackson, Boomer, and allow the Cowboys to have their choice of any running back they want. Well, I, I'm sure, Ed, that's a possibility. Uh, they know each other's phone number, I would think. Uh, but, I mean, look, if, if Michael tipped on it, and, and we all did, there were a couple of names that, that might have fallen for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but... Ted Washington was such a huge part of, huge. That, of that run defense huge. last year. Yes. Okay, let me just tell you something about it. If you look at the statistics in the Super Bowl, Ted Washington, no tackles, no assist. Then put on the film of that Super Bowl. That's true, boy. And you watch, That's true. He, he had like 45 assists, mm -hmm. but not in the true sense of the mm -hmm. word. Now, he's a member of the Raiders. They, they really would like that, and so. I, as you guys have all talked about, with Vince Woolfork sitting there, they... I think they're a little surprised, but I think and they, in terms of, 10 minutes worth of calls, but let's make the move. Let's go. Let's go of, with the Wolf Fork. That's what I think they'll do. In terms of the Cowboys worrying about the running back and Steven Jackson, it's just going to depend how much higher is their grade on Steven Jackson over Kevin Jones of Virginia Tech. I think that would determine how, what the Cowboys' attitude right Let now. Let me say this, more. I have Steven Jackson ahead of Kevin Jones, but there are some teams out there that do feel that Kevin Jones is the best running back in this draft. He's an athletically gifted kid, plays faster than he times, and a guy that hit a lot of home runs at Virginia Tech. And I think from a completeness standpoint, Steven Jackson may be a little bit better at this stage, but there are teams in the how National about, Football League that do like Kevin Jones over Steven Jackson. How about this size? If Will Fork becomes a good player, if they pick him, they might. And if if Ty Warren, last year's number one, big guy up front, and Richard, Richard Seymour, Pro Bowl, boy, you have, you have boy, isn't, what, didn't, isn't that pretty formidable up front on defense? By the way, he's a good defensive coach. With, with, with Teddy Bruschi roaming around there, you better believe us for Let's defense. go to the commissioner and see what the Super Bowl champion Patriots will do. With the uh, 21st pick in the 2004 NFL Draft, the New England Patriots select Vince Wilfolk. <laughs> Defensive lineman, University of Miami. Good. That's good. Really? Is that a six the line? rich get richer. That's what it is. The rich get richer. Who's done the drafts better than them lately? Every, well, it's not only that, though. There are teams that if you sit down at the bottom of the draft, everybody says, oh, we're never going to get a player. Players always fall. Ooh, Daisy fell to the uh, Minnesota Vikings. Will Fork has fallen to the New England Patriots. But it's not such a terrible area to be drafting. Right, in. but players pan out towards the bottom of the draft. Players like Will Fork because they go to a program where the pros teach them how to be pros. This is how we work. That's what would be great for What are you talking about? He's a big guy. In New England, they will teach him how to become oh, yes. a professional football player. And he won't have a weight problem because in New England, they work hard. Mike Watson, the strength and conditioning coach there, will have him on ready. We'll have him ready. And Michael, you look at Keith Trailer and you compare Vince Wilfork to Trailer. Short arms and a missing tackle every now and then because of that. But I'll tell you what, athletically gifted. His weight was
estimated to be 350, what have you, 355, 360. He was 323 at the combine, 323 during his individual, then 328 a few weeks before the draft. So he's maintained that weight at a level which can, max, which can maximize his ability in the NFL. Six one and a half, a kid who ran in the 498 to 503 range. And I'll tell you what, you go back to this year, Florida game, eight tackles and a sack, six hurries, and a fumble recovery against Florida State. Productive, and I think what a lot of people really like about Vince Wilfork is this. You talk about stamina and durability. He was on the field for 55, 58 plays in a lot of games, more than Tommy Harris was. And I think people look at that weight and say it's a concern, but I'll tell you what, he showed stamina. He played into the fourth quarter, didn't wear down. Miami of Florida now with six first round draft. I believe that's 19 over record. the last four years. Here, here it is. Let's just go down this and we'll continue. So Mike, the Miami Hurricanes with 19 first round picks, as Mel mentioned, in the last four years, six today. Breaking the record of last year, Brian McKenzie, Jeremy Shockey, Philip Buchanan, Ed Reed, and Mike Rome. At 1968, USC with Ron Yeri, now a Hall of Famer, Mike Taylor, Tim Rosovich, who ate uh, glass bottles, Mike Hall, and wide receiver Earl McCullough. Uh, this is a new record for Miami. All right, so off New England for a minute. How can they not win the national title every year with four, 19 guys in the first four? In the they win most of the time, oh, okay. except when they're taking them from us in Ohio State. Okay. Well, I, I, have told, I, I have told this story before in the last couple of years. When Butch Davis left the University of Miami to go become the head coach of the Cleveland Browns, I asked him, was it a tough decision? He said, Chris, a very tough decision because I know, based on the recruiting we have done here at Miami, I'm leaving maybe three national championships right here in Miami to go coach in the NFL. You know, I, for, I forgot about trailer too. So it, they, they, Will Fork is called Baby Shack, right? Miami, Baby that's Shack. his nickname, Baby Shack. Keith Trailer is Baby Ted. So Ooh. if a couple of babies come, so, would grow up real big fast, babies, big babies. <laughs> I think New England, and they still got another first round pick. The Cowboys next. How about them Cowboys? Yeah. Now in New York, we've had 21 first round picks. We have now at number 22 the Dallas Cowboys, who have about nine minutes to go. And Michael with the fist up, <laughs> Cowboy waving to New York fans. What is the matter with you? The guys are waiting. They're chanting Michael Irvin. I know we're in New York, and the fans went straight to board. But right here, it has to be Steven Jackson. We need a run. They, I mean, Dallas needs a running back. Let, let me add a Dallas note about Steven. Do you remember the last I number one pick we. that Dallas had as a running back? Do you remember who it was? It was my good friend, Emmitt Smith. That worked, and how did that see, work out? And, and that worked out Well, he's only all-time leading rusher. And one who so slipped a little bit greatest. farther than everybody thought. Remember, Emmitt Smith, uh, Emmitt Smith slipped a little bit farther, and Jimmy Johnson jumped up and took him. Add this note about Steven Jackson, even though you could say, boy, is he disappointed. No, the Dallas Cowboys is his favorite football team. It's his dad's favorite football team. He would love to play for the Dallas Cowboys, even if it means being taken six or seven spots later, if this is the pick. So you're, He's a smart so you're football player in Dallas, and Bill Parcells, he loves smart football players. This guy, he knows how to pick up a blitz. He knows how to protect the quarterback. He knows how to not fumble. That's and, what and, Bill and he is a he is a tough guy. I had one scout tell me that Steven Jackson took about five times more hits than anybody else at Oregon State, but, but he never showed signs of slowing down. Morty's 238 pounds. I think what Steven Jackson gives you is the bounce outside. He doesn't play like somebody that's 238. Normally, 238 pounders will not give you the long dimension. He will. 227, now 238. And you're looking at Steven Jackson with the productivity. Look at that receiving yards total. He was able to, in Mike Riley's offense, catch a ton of balls this past year. And I think that when you look at not just those swing passes, he can get down the field. You see his ability there to run through a tackler. And I think this year he danced a little too much at times. You say, hey, is he as tough as we're talking about? Yes, he is. The problem was, and you see it right there, the offensive line at Oregon State, one of the worst in the nation, yes. certainly the worst in the Pac-10. He had to earn his real estate. He even admitted he danced a little too much because he knew he had to create went a little east and west. But I'll tell you what, he gets some help from an offensive line with the ability he has. You see that catch there from Derek Anderson. Low pass. He went down and got it. He is a factor. He'll block. He's got a phenomenal attitude. I'll tell you, when you look at a complete back, 
That's Steven Jackson. Chris Perry is complete, not as dynamic as Steven Jackson. Kevin Jones, a better athlete, but not the receiver or the blocker that Steven Jackson is. This kid runs downhill, and he'll run with authority, and he'll run with power once he gets a little help and gets that full head of steam, which he could rarely do this year. Very rarely could Steven Jackson get anything close to a full head of steam behind that porous offensive line of Oregon State. Work but, but, but do, right? but do you know, know it's oh, Steven yeah. Jackson, Mike? Well, you know, what, you know what the Cowboys need. And we can sit here and talk all we want. They need a running back. Troy Hambrick did not get it done. You know about that. Troy Hambrick running out of bounds instead of running into players. They need a tough running back to solidify their offense. They got a wide receiver, Keyshawn Johnson. I'm going to leave that alone. Oh, no, I love they Keyshawn. got a wide really receiver in Keyshawn Johnson. Now they need somebody in the backfield to handle the chores of running the football. And while we're talking Dallas, remember they acquired Drew Henson, the ex-New York Yankee farmhand, but ex-Michigan quarterback from uh, the Houston Texans. So, you know, Quincy Carter took this team to the playoffs last year, which is a quantum leap, and ahead of where the coach, Bill Parsons, very little help. our old compatriot, uh, ahead of where he thought that they might be in one year. They do have Drew Henson back there. What What's the word on him? Well, obviously, they don't know. He's in camp. He's working hard. And Quincy Carter did give them 10 wins. It was Quincy Carter's first full year of starting, and he's a playoff quarterback. What Bill Parcells wants is he wants a quarterback that they can bring know. him from behind, that can run the two-minute drill with the game on the line. They have a free agent quarterback named Tony Romo they love. So it's going to be up for grabs. He's going to let those guys compete. I think but Hutchinson you know, is out of there Tony myself. Tony Romo sounds like a Jersey guy. No wonder Bill likes Yes. Him. Let's uh, head up to our uh, EA matchup set. With Trey and Maryland Jaws. Fellas? All right, Boomer, thanks. You know, you talk about the quarterbacks for the Cowboys, all three of them on the roster right now, besides Tony Romo, former baseball players, Chad Hutchinson, Drew Henson, and Quincy Carter, was in the Cubs organization as well. Real interesting here, though, Bill Parcells, the things he's done in the offseason, he gets Keyshawn Johnson. Maybe the most underrated offseason maneuver, picking up Marcellus Wiley from the Chargers for a team that was the number one ranked defense last year. Well, that stays with their style defensively because they're going to attack. But if we look at where the Cowboys sit as far as a position, if they take Steven Jackson, how this helps Quincy Carter. The one thing that really stood out last year is Quincy Carter had to carry this team. Quincy Carter's not in a position to do that. And the one game that really stands out, when they went to Tampa and they had to play there, he had big eyes. He didn't perform very well there. So he needs somebody to take the pressure off him. Steven Jackson would be that guy. They'd be able to run the, run the ball. Then Manny's first, Manny's second down. Manny's the game better, and that will help Quincy Carter. And also a rock-solid acquisition in Keyshawn Johnson. When you look at Keyshawn Johnson, he's not a number one guy that's going to go down the field and make those big explosive plays, but you have a Terry Glenn and Antonio Bryant. What you're going to get out of Keyshawn Johnson is a workman-like effort. He's going to do the dirty work blocking. He's going to catch the short passes in the short to intermediate area and get the yards after the catch. He's going to do the little things that help you win football games. A good acquisition in the offseason, a solid football player in Keyshawn. He's going to make those slants to keep uh, first uh, third downs alive and keep drives alive, much like some guy named Michael Irvin used to make for the Dallas and, Cowboys. And a big target. A quarterback likes that big target that position his body, you know, block the defender, right. make the catch in the crowd. And you got, it still comes back to Quincy Carter, helping Quincy Carter out because, you know, I mentioned the Tampa Bay game where he really struggled because of the big game, the big atmosphere, he didn't perform well. But keep in mind, he had really no help. You look at the passing game, I don't think they had all the dimensions that they have now. And then the running game, the running game will help every team and every quarterback manages the game. It helps your defense as well. This is an attacking defense that struggled, wore down towards the end because they had no running game. Merrill, you and I watched that second game against Philadelphia in Philadelphia late in the season and there was a play in that game where Troy Hambrick had a chance to lower a shoulder and get maybe a touchdown or inside the five yard line and he ran right out of bounds. I think what Steven Jackson brings as a running back <laughs> is that same work ethic yeah. pounded up the middle effort that you're talking about Keyshawn Johnson. He will, looks like he will do the little things to keep that drive alive. The one one thing that always stands out when I watch tape on a running back, uh, are you nasty? Are you nasty? That means are you going to make somebody pay every time you run the football? Steven Jackson will do that. Troy Hambrick did not. He proved that. Now, the one thing you don't know about Steven Jackson, he hasn't played in the NFL. But what I have seen in college, he will come to the National Football League, he will flick pain on defenders, and he will really get better in the fourth quarter. And you also have a Richie Anderson, a very versatile sure. guy at the fullback That's a Bill guy yeah, as well. That's right. You know, right. you come out the backfield, catch the ball, he'll block. Again, we're talking about a lot of guys that'll do the dirty work for the Dallas Cowboys. Right. Well, one thing's for sure, Bill Parcells did something with the Cowboys he's never done before. His first year as a head coach as a, on a team, he took them to the playoffs. He always seems to do very well in his second year, which would just continue the success he's had for the Dallas Cowboys. In fact, three of the last four teams, I believe, he's been a head 
head coach on as you take a look here. As he gets into that second season, you see a marked improvement. Can he do it for Dallas? Well, keep in mind, again, he's coming off a playoff season right away, which has never happened in Bill Parcells' career. We'll see what happens. About a minute 30 left on the clock. Boomer Steven Jackson is sitting there. We'll see what happens. All right, guys, thank you. We're sitting here. And look, Bill, I imagine he's, he's just seeing if anybody is calling, right? Mort, there's a reason. Well, he's, he, you know, he does do due diligence, and Jerry Jones does the same thing. They both are friends of Al Davis, and Al Davis has always used the almost the entire amount of time on the clock to make sure nobody's calling to give you a deal. You can't. The Cowboys only have five picks in this draft. They've got to get at least four players out of this draft, and Parcells will tell you, they're not so good that they have to say, we got to have a running back. If there's a better player on the board, they'll take him. But to me, huh? the best player on the board. Well, all about a trade. Huh? So trade. we do have a trade, and that's the thing. They only have five picks in this draft, and they have to get more players. And certainly, you can't get a running back. Ooh. And I, let me just make this comment here about Buffalo being on the thing. Buffalo wants to come out of this draft with a quarterback. Tulane quarterback J.P. Lossman is a guy the Bills really like. And with Green Bay call, and St. Louis coming up, J.P. Lossman, the Tulane quarterback, probably is the Buffalo target here. That's and, and, and how about Buffalo and Dallas making a trade? Mike, you inflicted pain. On a lot of people in Western New York, you Yes, we have, and they just inflicted pain on the on the, on the Cowboys. Well, you see, payback is did a you see, Did you see the fans, the Cowboy fans? They were like, oh, what do you mean we're trading out of this spot? We need a running back, somebody that can make a difference right now. And Buffalo, Buffalo, you thought of getting the first round pick. New England and, and Baltimore. Baltimore got Bowler by giving up the first this year. Well, here we go. Here, here's the deal. Let's go to the podium. With the uh, 22nd pick in the 2004 draft acquired from the Dallas Cowboys, the Buffalo Bills pick J.P. Lawsman, quarterback, Tulane. Uh, just a, a note here uh, in terms of Lawsman. The Bills, love. they went to a workout at the Saints facility. The same day that Eli Manning worked out, Lawsman worked out after him. Some of the people there will tell you Lawsman had a better workout than Manning. That's just a workout. He certainly didn't play around a, a great team at Tulane, and some people think he, that's a plus. Physically, has all the tools. Some people think he's a little bit too cocky, a little bit too full of himself, however. However, Drew Bledsoe has a contract that the Buffalo Bills are trying to renegotiate. If they do not get it renegotiated, and they were unsuccessful in some talks on Friday, then you're going to see Bledsoe maybe play out his contract, go one more year. More, we had the details of the pick. Second round pick this year, 43rd overall. Fifth round pick this year, uh, this year as well, and a first round pick next year. So a steep price to pay to get J.P. Lossman for the Buffalo Bills on this pick from the Dallas Cowboys. Keep in mind, New England traded away that pick in the first round to allow Baltimore to get Kyle Bowler. Baltimore doesn't have a first round pick. New England had it this year, and uh, they took Vince Wilfork. So I think you look at the situation here. Buffalo, they can bring along J.P. Lossman. Of course, they have Drew Bledsoe. Granted, Willis McGahee, knowing that he wouldn't play this year to so their drafting Tom Dunno is for the future. J.P. Lossman snaps it off from the ear. You hear quarterbacks with a release. His is from the ear, right where a quarterback coach wants it. He's got mobility, runs in the 4-6 range. He's definitely got the swagger. He's definitely got the confidence. Call it arrogance. A quarterback that knows he can get the job done. He took up pounding. This offensive line, look at that Oregon State. Tulane's was worse. You can believe that. Tulane's offensive line was horrible. He got hit time after time, kept getting back for more. And I thought for 33 touchdown passes, considering the, the ability of, of that uh, inability of that offensive line to give him any press protection, he did a heck of a job. J.P. Lossman, you say, turned some people off. Well, I know St. Louis and Mike Martz liked them. They thought about it maybe in the late first. And here's Buffalo jumping in there as the situation. It just reflects last year when New England traded that pick, allowed the Baltimore Ravens to get Kyle Bowler. Now the Dallas Cowboys trade away a pick, get extra picks, a, a two and a five one. and a one next year to allow well, Buffalo to get J.P. Lawson. Let's, let's know this is going to be controversial because they gave up a number one pick. The Bills did for next year's draft. We know that Ralph Wilson Jr. and Tom Dono have courage. They took Willis McGahee last year. But let's go back to a Friday phone call between the Buffalo Bills and David Dunn, the agent for Drew Bledsoe. They wanted to get a contract extension done by today. They did not do it. So Bledsoe could pretty much play this year under this contract, but after that, they're going to need a big-time quarterback, and they had a big grade on Lawson. Well, they probably would have used a first-rounder on a quarterback next year. That was their thinking. Almost 1,000 passing attempts at Tulane. 
27 interceptions and a rocket arm you say well geez like McGahee he's not going to play all year but they remember they had another number one pick here uh, so they got Lee Evans so it's not like they, they have nothing to show for it very gutsy move by the Buffalo Bills uh, let's go to Sean Salisbury for your take on this Sean you know, Boomer, I don't think it's that gutsy, to be honest with you. Of all the quarterbacks in this draft, I think he's the most talented. He's got the best feet. He's got the strongest arm. And now he's going to a position where he can learn behind Bledsoe at least early on. And I don't understand where all this cocky talk comes from. Don't you want a Brett Favre or a guy with an attitude at the quarterback position? We always say confidence is the most important thing at that position, and he's got it. And talking, Mort talked about the workout with Eli Manning. Well, I was there the day before in New Orleans working with J.P. Lossman, and I sat down with him in the film room, and he walked me through his team and watched tape for two hours. So any knock on him about that he doesn't know much about football is completely wrong. I think this is a great pick, and I think you're looking at a future pro bowler with Brett Favre type of skills the one negative that I see that he's got to learn not to hold on to the ball too long like he did at Tulane. But what can you blame him for? Nobody blocked for him. Plus, he's got the toughness you need. And Jaws, I think this guy, I don't think this is too early. I think this is a great pick for the Buffalo Bills. All right, Sean, thanks. Well, one thing that J.P. Lozman in is, is polarizing. You either love him or you do not love him. I don't want to use the other word there, but people feel very strongly one way or the other about J.P. Lozman and what he brings to Tulane. Josh, you love him. I, I love him. In fact, I had him rated above Philip Rivers, who really? now is a You got everybody one. rated no. above Philip no, Rivers. No, I did not. I had Philip Rivers number four, and he's going to be an outstanding pro. But I'll tell you, when you look at uh, a young quarterback like J.P. Lawson, you see a very live arm. That's the one thing you can't teach someone, how to get the RPMs on the football. And when I broke him down, I saw a quarterback that projected very well into the NFL. In studying J.P. Lossman on tape, here's what I saw. A quick, compact delivery. His ball position is a little high, but that will be corrected in the NFL. He snaps his wrist, which allows for more RPMs, more rotations on the football. This makes for a stronger throw with much more velocity. From the waist up, Lossman is solid mechanically. It's from the waist down that J.P. needs work. What struck me was that, with no pressure on him, his footwork was lacking. His feet were not balanced and set, and there was either poor or no weight transfer. But he can flick it. Great wrist snap, good velocity. This is a kid who needs a lot of fundamental technique work. Look here in the Senior Bowl. No pressure, and he delivers with his feet in the air. He will need to be coached hard by a team that does not get blinded by his throwing ability and recognizes that his present mechanical deficiencies would never produce consistency in the NFL. J.P. Lossman's going to the right situation. He's going to the Buffalo Bills to back up Drew Bledsoe. He needs to get behind a veteran and learn. Tom Clements, the quarterback coach, must also do one thing. Stay on top of him all the time. He has the live arm. He has the quickness. He has the ability to make all the throws. Mechanically, he does break down with his feet way too often. But it's, it's a thing that can be coached up, and I think Tom Clements well, will do that. I think there's no question this guy is a major project. Now he you, says There's no way he's a major project. He is a major project and a three- or four-year project before he steps on the <sighs> field. When you look at his mechanics, you just showed it. The mechanics he struggles with. And then... The best way to describe him in the classroom and apply it to the field, he's spastic. He doesn't apply the football knowledge to the field. And if he watches tape and he really can say that he's like Brett Favre, then you know what? Then I got a question. You know what you're looking at. And tape, Brett Favre is an MVP of this league, has won a Super Bowl in this league. If you're going to compare yourself to Brett Favre, you better at least have one MVP, and you'll be at least a better played in this league. Right. You can't compare yourself You're to You're upset there's no running back's only, been taken. That, that, that's that, that has nothing to that's do with it. That's a separate issue that he's no. dealing with. Real quickly, though, 33 touchdowns, 14 interceptions. You, you can't argue his stats. No, you no, have a problem not, from here up? His maturity level. His maturity level is awful right now, and that's why being behind Drew Bledsoe for four years is the key. If he starts right away, he'd be a bust. Well, we shall see. Okay, the Seattle Seahawks are on the clock. I told you this guy was polarizing. We'll see what Seattle has to do. Seven minutes and change for their pick. Stay with us. Welcome back to the 2004 NFL Draft. I'm Andrea Kramer in New York. Four quarterbacks taken in this first round. Eli Manning, David Rivers, Ben Roethlisberger, and most recently, a bit of a surprise pick by the Buffalo Bills. J.P. Lossman, and 
On the other side of the ball, Takeo Spikes, the Pro Bowl linebacker for the Bills. What are your thoughts on, on why they would go for J.P. Lossman? I think just the main reason, not necessarily because of the fact that, you know, everybody wants to say Drew is getting old and Drew didn't have a good season last year. Uh, you know, we didn't have a good season as a whole last year. And I think Drew has a lot left in the tank, but as far as planning for the future, you know, this, I think this would explain this move right here that's coming up with J.P. And I had a chance to look at J.P. over the past couple of weeks. I have a good friend who goes to schools down there, so that's what kind of made my motive to get a chance to look down there. And J.P., what he brings to the table is just the fact that he's very confident in what he does. He believes that all the other quarterbacks, all the, the four quarterbacks, any quarterback who went before him, he thinks that, hey, it, it, I don't care what they do. They're not better than me. So he brings that confidence to the huddle. And also, uh, he's able to drop back, read defense as well. And also, he has a strong arm to deliver the ball real good. So uh, that's what I like about J.P. a lot. All right, now, Kyle Bowler, you can argue that the Bills did almost what the Ravens did last year in terms of trading away a number one next year to get a quarterback. In your case, though, you started right away. You got to figure that J.P. Lossman is going to sit behind Drew Bledsoe. What benefit do you think that you had getting right in there? Well, I think I benefited just pretty much from the experience. You're out there, you know, it's like standing in the middle of a freeway. You got a bunch of cars coming at you. You got to kind of figure out, you know, how to get across safely. Um, in his situation, you know, it's Drew Bledsoe's a proven veteran. He'll be able to go in there and learn from him a little bit. Um, I think it's a great pick. You know, I've watched him in high school. I played against him actually down in California. And, you know, he's got a live arm, good feet, smart guy. So I think it's going to be good. You know, it's interesting. I was talking to your head coach, Brian Billick, and he said he just believes that you got to throw quarterbacks in right away. But he actually felt that you benefited unwittingly because you got injured in the ninth game from starting and then sitting and watching. What did you learn about the quarterback position when you were forced to sit after you had the quadriceps injury that ended your season? Well, you, get, you really get a whole pers different perspective because, you know, when you're on the field, you're kind of just everything's going so fast. And when you, you got to get a chance to sit back, you know, I got to watch Anthony go out there and, you know, run the offense, see what the defense does, um, you know, watch our defense. Sometimes a punt is, you know, better than trying to force a ball on third down. And being a young quarterback, you come from college, and sometimes you can put balls in places that in the NFL you can't. And so you kind of got, I got, I, I was able to kind of, you know, watch Anthony and, and kind of learn from him. How difficult is it, Takeo, to accept a rookie quarterback. I mean, everybody's got a short shelf life in the NFL, right. and now all of a sudden you bring a rookie in, you've got to live through his growing pains. What are the challenges of doing that? I think the challenges of that coming into a, coming to a rookie quarterback, coming into a veteran team, is just the fact that, okay, we know what we have here. And a rookie quarterback coming in, you know that, okay, he's going to go through his ups and, ups and downs. He's going to struggle. And, and, and as a veteran, I've been through it with Cincinnati. You hate to see a rookie quarterback come in because you know that you're going to struggle bad. You're going to go through the times where you're going to lose games 16 to 17, 10 to 7, regardless of how well you play defense. So uh, that's the most struggling part about it is, is trying to accept that. But uh, the, the good thing about it, I think that J.P., he brings to the table all the athletic qualities that a quarterback needs to be successful in this league. And just by coming in up under Drew, you know, and just watching and learning, that's going to be unbelievable for him. And certainly for, uh, for Kyle Bowler, Chris Berman, Peyton Manning was 3-13 and 13 his rookie year, and Troy Aikman was 0-11. At least this guy was 5-3 and three with a positive record. Let's head back to you. I think the Seahawks are on the clock. All right, Andrew, thank you very much. We only got a minute left here on the Seahawks clock. A team clearly on the rise, a team that, a team that finally won on the road late, a team that was 10-6 and six and had a great finish, a team that lost a heartbreaking game at Green Bay, that great overtime game on the pass interception for the touchdown, a team that signed Grant Western for big money, to play defensive end, a team that signed Bobby Taylor, admittedly not the great Bobby Taylor that he was with the Eagles, but a pretty darn good player. A team that drafted two very good defensive backs last year with yes. Trufant and Hamlin. A team clearly on the move. Defense up the middle. That's what the Seahawks need. Defense up like baseball, catcher, short and second, center field. That's what the with Seahawks the, uh, need. Twenty third pick in the two thousand four NFL draft, the Seattle Seahawks select Marcus Tubbs. There it is. Defensive tackle, University of Texas. There, what is? Now, now Mel, you can <laughs> tell everybody. If we had twenty more seconds, I would have gone to that name because we already <laughs> talked about it. <laughs> they really the defense up the middle. They don't right? have anybody. Yes. They got the old, the old names of Eaton and Randall and Hand and Company. They're gone. Seattle is completely restructuring the defensive tackle spot. Marcus Tubbs will be the cornerstone of that restructuring. Now that he is a Seattle Seahawk, you'll get that size. 
great strength, was more productive this season, battled some minor injuries as a junior. This season, I thought he got it done on a more consistent basis. See him number 95, a big 325-pounder, pretty good athleticism, and a guy I think in the NFL has to turn up the intensity dial and, and maintain a sustained level of fire for four quarters. I thought he had some series where it was a little lackluster effort. I think if he can go full steam ahead for four quarters, he has the talent. And he's, you can say, boomer, bust type, whatever. If he can be pushed and driven to play to the maximum of his capabilities, Marcus Tubbs has a chance to be a pretty good pro. We set out the risky defensive linemen are. I think there's a risk factor here with Tubbs unless he picks up the pace just a bit. He has talent. That's why it's a first-round pick. He needs to get that, get more intensity for four quarters. It's a good name for a big defensive tackle, though, huh, Tubbs? Tubbs. Very, very <laughs> <laughs> Shadow will be picking more guys. And why don't I put this out here right now? NFC title game? Seahawks, oh, Eagles. You hope. Just throwing it out there. It's April. I can say whatever I want. When we come back, we will have the Cincinnati Shameless. Bengals on the clock. The rejuvenated Bengals with new uniforms and everything else. Yeah. Now we're getting going. New York, it's a nice day in New York, and it's been a wild day inside here in New York. We are four hours into the NFL draft. Uh, Eli Manning was picked by San Diego. They had him for an hour. Then it was the trade with the New York football giants. Eli Manning there. Phillip Rivers will be quarterback of San Diego, or at least I don't think he's going to start necessarily, but he could. And if you tune in late, you missed a very intriguing first hour of the draft. The reason I point out the role already four hours into the draft we have not talked about the Cincinnati Bengals for the first four hours of the draft. Now, if you think at the rich history of the Cincinnati Bengals in the 90s and the early part of this uh, decade, they were within the first hour. Not anymore. Marvin Lewis, 8-8, eight eight, had him thinking playoffs. He's done what very few can. He's made the Bengals respectable. He's given them a lot of hope. He's given them organization. And this year... Uh, Mort, we're going to get to it in a second. He's using last year's number one overall pick to play quarterback. That's right. That's Carson Palmer, and we'll, we'll debate that in a little bit, but I know this much. Marvin Lewis's face is now on the Bengals. That's a miracle in itself instead of Mike Brown, the, the guy who everybody liked to rip, the team president of the Bengals. But Marvin Lewis now believes with seven picks in the first four rounds, he has a chance to put his fingerprints on the Bengals even more so. And listen, they did give Corey Dillon, they traded him to the New England Patriots. They have Rudy Johnson, but you've got two backs like, yep. like, like Kevin Jones of Virginia Tech, who they really like, and Steven Jackson, who I don't think they thought was going to be there. And yet, Ohio State cornerback Chris Gamble is a guy they love. It's going to be really interesting to see them as they try to build this around Carson Palmer. Hey, dude, wait, wait, wait. Oh, that hurt me when you said that. That just hurt me. Yes. When you talk about what Cincinnati has done last year, I think they made great strides. You say you, Marvin Wilson's face is on Cincinnati. That's fine. But to make the change in the offseason from Kinder to Carson Palmer, big mistake. This football, this game we call football, the respect you earn is in the locker room. You, it, the, John Kinder did not lose a job. He did not lose a job. They gave his job away, and you don't get anything in the I, NFL. And I agree with you. I think Marvin Lewis's credibility might be on the line in the locker room. Now, he had a honeymoon year, but if for some reason Palmer struggles and this team loses, John Kitten, a very popular. The other note I'll make here, though, I think they made that call early so that Carson Palmer can get all the repetitions yeah. in the offseason, and if for some it. reason it isn't working, they can go Once back you, to yeah, Canada. But it may even be Michael. too late. It may be too late. Once you draft a quarterback number one overall, he's playing as a second-year quarterback. That's why the in Eli Manning situation. Stephen Mayer didn't play. That's in the, why the, the Eli Manning situation was so important because you got to put him in the right situation. Carson Palmer goes out and he doesn't have early success, and Cincinnati's expecting to make a move towards some more playoffs. They don't have early success. And, They're booing and Carson Steve Palmer. McNair, and Steve problems. McNair and Chad Pennington played in their third year. Steve McNair came from Alcorn State. This kid came from USC. There's no I think there he's, he's got to play right away. Culpepper played his second year. These guys, when you want to say force feeding or not, bottom line is when you draft him number one, he's playing by a second there year. There are many blueprints of how to do it. You know, Peyton Manning took every snap. I mean, that, that you say Steve McNair third year. 
Ron Jaworski took many a snap. Agree, disagree with what the Bengals are doing? I totally agree with the move. I think Carson Palmer is the better of the two quarterbacks, and that's no disrespect toward John Kitna. He certainly has made a significant contribution to bring the Bengals back to an 8-8 eight and eight plateau, and I think John Kitna has plateaued. I think the upside for the Cincinnati Bengals is Carson Palmer's talent. That's what it all boils down to. Who can go out there and make every single throw? I've been on the field watching Carson Palmer throw the football down the field zip the there's, warm -ups. A huge, there's a huge okay. difference in how Kitna throws the ball and Palmer throws the football when Carson Palmer is in the game the whole field opens up when Kitna's in the game you're restricted well quite honestly I think we have the system to blame because really is it Carson Palmer's fault he was uh, oh. that he was picked First, no. When you look at the system, the money that's being paid to these young guys, trust me, the owner's sitting there and looking at guys making $15 million, that is why Carson Palmer is going to play. Carson Palmer did not beat out John Kitna. Carson Palmer makes more money than John Kitna, and that's why. Physically, does he have some more, better skills? Absolutely. Has he proven it on the field? No. And actually, Tequil Spikes makes a great point. When you have a rookie quarterback, when you think of some of the veterans that won't come to you, some of that's because of that. If a rookie's going to be there, I don't want to go there. Michael, I know that's one of the big issues, especially with free agency. Who's going to be your starting quarterback? What's my chances of winning? Well, you know, what Jaws is saying, Jaws said, I watch Carson Palmer throw. You watch him throw on the sidelines. <laughs> have you ever watched him throw, <laughs> throw the ball with those boys burying down his neck? That's the way he'll have to throw during the regular season. Yeah, John yeah, Kenner, I watched him throw. I did see him throw the football yeah, at Michael. Southern Cal in the preseason. And the upside You're is with Carson Palmer. There's no question he brings the everyone in the game. And I, I, I hate to sound like I'm dissing Josh. John Kittner because I do have respect for him. But if you want to become a championship team, I'm not talking about going 8-8, eight 9-7. Eight, and seven. You want to win the Josh. Super Bowl, the if guy you win with is Carson Palmer. you're winning championship, Josh, that's you put right. the best player on the football field. And that's Carson Palmer. Hey, hey, I'm not talking about the best talent. I'm talking about the best player. And the difference is the best player a guy you talent eight, eight has potential. You were a eight, player eight. gets out and play. 8-8 eight eight is good coming with from the Bengals, 8-8 eight, eight, like 14 and 2. 8-8 is great coming from 2 and 14 for 100 years. You lead John Kittner, you get those results. Receivers, they build on it. They're building something. They hey, have something to build on. You let them play football. If he wins the job, he wins it in training camp. You've got like a, 30, a man, Michael, like you've an got NFL a 31 player. year old quarterback who's plateaued. You got a younger quarterback where the sky is the limit. That's the guy you play. The team will rally around Carson Palmer. They're throwing the kitchen sink, the grandmother, the granddaddy. Every time he steps to the line of scrimmage, they're throwing everybody at him. Wait, 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 we'll wait. Here, Michael. You Teams don't always kid, blitz the quarterback. They don't blitz the, the quarterback. Kid. They blitz the You're system. Ruined. If the you Bengals have the right the system to protect the young quarterback, yeah. they're fine. You'll get ruined the kid, Jaws. They nope. have to be careful. He's in his second they year. Have to be he's ready. They have to be careful. Second Either year is ready to go. Yeah, yeah, Put him yeah, out yeah. there. Let him go. That's why they made the decision now. I tell it's you what. I, I tell you what. I bet he cannot fail. He cannot fail, and he has the top eight and eight. Now, that's a tough chore for a rookie. <laughs> he's basically a rookie again this year. He cannot fail. If Palmer wait, wait. blows this thing, he will go back to Kitna, guys. Well, listen. <laughs> By the way, for our well, fans the out same. there, and you can go back hold to on, hold well, on. Be the hold same. on. For Who our cares? fans out there, Ron Jaworski, Michael Urban, available on TV, 90 minutes every Monday night <laughs> on Monday Night Shots. Yeah, uh, I, I love that we're debating the Bengals. I mean, just think about this. All right, now usually it's so exciting when a guy gets picked. He's here in New York. He has the jersey, and then he gets on a plane and he flies. And a long way to go, and then they have a press conference at the end of the day, the team that they've signed him. So Eli Manning held up the Charger jersey. Oh, it's maybe a long plane flight. No, it's an eight-mile ride over the George Washington Bridge or maybe through the Lincoln Tunnel to uh, the Giants. The Meadowlands, he's now with Sal Palantonio. Sal? Yes, the Eli has landed, Boomer. He's officially a New York Giant. Eli, did you ever think that this moment would come to pass? And when you came out of the car and saw Giant Stadium there, met Tom Coughlin, what was going through your mind? Uh, I was just excited. I was, it was a great feeling to, to be a New York Giant, to uh, see Coach Coughlin and then uh, see the stadium, uh, Giant Stadium. And it's been, uh, you know, it's overwhelming. It's been, uh, you know, a great day. The reception you got here from some of the fans at the uh, draft party was a lot different from the one that you got at Madison Square Garden, what kind of relief was that for you? Uh, it was a great relief to, to walk down, um, you know, the stairs and, and onto the field and having those fans cheering and, and yelling and screaming your name. It's a, you know, a great feeling. I had a little, yeah, a little different reception when I was at Madison Square. I, got, I had a few boos, and but uh, you know, it's it's turned out to be a great day. Well, now really, here comes the hard part. You're going to have to eventually replace a guy in Kerry Collins who took this team to the Super Bowl. 
You're coming with all the hype of not wanting to play in San Diego. You got your wish to play in New York. Be careful what you wish for, right? What do you do right now to get yourself prepared for this upcoming season? Well, I think the first thing I do is just get that offensive playbook as soon as possible. Start, you know, learning the system, learning the plays. And, um, you know, obviously Kerry Collins has proven himself to be an outstanding quarterback. He's been in the league a long time, and, you know, he's, he's got the job right now. But, um, you know, I'm just going to come in and do whatever the coaches want me to do. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to uh, prepare myself to, to play. And um, whether I do or don't, I'm just, it's just going to make me better for the future. Ready for New York? I'm ready for it. <laughs> All right, Boomer, back to you. There's Eli Manning. All right, and a smile on Eli Manning's face, which is very good to see. Thank you very much, Sal. All right, so now the Bengals, this was a move down from Denver, but now here's the commissioner because the Bengals have traded the spot to St. Louis to move that a couple more. Since he's moving down twice already in this first round, one was done a couple of weeks ago. With the uh, 24th pick in the 2004 NFL Draft acquired from the Bengals, the St. Louis Rams select Steven Jackson, running yep. back from Oregon it. State. This, Mike Martz and the Rams were going to target a running back in this draft. So why not go get the best Marshall one? Marshall Falk is getting some mileage on him, no question about it. They said that last year, y'all jumped you. Well, it's, um, it, who jumped you? Well, so what are you yeah. saying? It's it's Marshall, Marshall. Is that all it is? Not three months. Listen, the Rams have 21 of 22 starters back. They didn't feel pressing need, but they certainly were going to address the running back in this draft. Now, where is that? Or, or the Bengals draft party? They're cheering. They made a trade. We'll get the the uh, day, the uh, details of the trade. So the first running back has gone at 24, the second longest we've ever waited to have a running back go in this draft. We'll be back. Hi, I'm Eli Manning. You're watching the 2004 NFL Draft on ESPN. NFL! Yeah! ESPN's exclusive coverage of the NFL Draft, presented by Coors Light, is brought to you by Lincoln. There are those who travel and those who travel well. And Tractor Supply Company, the stuff you need out here. Welcome back to New York, where Steven Jackson, the Oregon State running back, just selected at number 24 by the St. Louis Rams. Steven, we know in physical time it was four hours. How long did it seem to you mentally? Excuse me? How long did it seem to you mentally waiting all this time to be picked? Well, it was a long time. We know we were going to go in the first round, but we had no idea where. And then the shocker was Dallas you know, making that trade. So we had no idea, but I'm more than happy to go to St. Louis, spend some time with Marshall Falk, you know, consider, I consider him the best running back in the league right now. So with that and being a mentor towards me, um, I think I'm going to tell the league apart now. Marshall Falk is such a tremendous student of the game. What do you think you can learn from him? Um, how to read the defense. That's what's most important in, in the NFL. Teams want to um, be able to spread out the defense and make reads in the coverage. So hopefully he can help me out with my defensive reason, reading the secondary a little bit better. We've heard about a poem you wrote as a little kid. When did you first believe you could be an NFL running back? Well, you know, I've been playing football since I was seven years old. And, um, you know, as I see myself start maturing and be able to pick up the game a little better, I felt that I was physically better than a lot of kids growing up. Um, I always seen it as a reality, and uh, you know, God has blessed me to, on this day. To, you know, to be able to be an NFL running back is it has, it has come true now. Oh, yes. Praise yes. God. Yes. Stephen, congratulations. Yes. Stephen Jackson from Thank Oregon you. State to the St. Louis Rams at number 24. We'll continue here from New York in just a moment. Long-standing commitment to America's communities, Campbell's Chunky Soup will donate 10,000 cans of soup on behalf of Eli Manning to a local food bank in his new team city. Campbell's Chunky Soup has donated millions of cans of soup as part of the NFL Tackling Hunger Program, an effort to fight hunger all across the country. Sean Taylor, you're watching the NFL, NFL, NFL draft on ESPN, 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 ESPN. Is that what you want? Yeah. 
With the uh, 25th pick in the 2004 NFL Draft, the Green Bay Packers select Ahmad Carroll, defensive back, Arkansas. A hog. I like it. Second Arkansas. There have been two Texas, six Miami. They call him Batman. You know why? Why? Because as a kid, he jumped over the center repeatedly. I like it. How about that? That's Batman for you. And you look at Ahmad Carroll. Not real tall, five nine and a half, but a 41 vertical. Pesky in your face corner. You watch him here in coverage. Here's a kid with a 41 vertical and 438 speed. He's got the track background. This is, of course, against Eli Manning, one of his best games as a junior. Came against Ooh. Old Miss. He had seven tackles, three tackles for loss, and an interception in that game against Eli Manning. You see how he closes, recovers, and comes away with the interception. Ahmad Carroll wasn't flawless at cornerback, Mort, but a kid who I think the, the combine workout, one of the fastest and one of the most athletically gifted corners, despite the fact he's only 5'9 and a half. And you cannot coach speed. And here's one thing about Ahmad Carroll. This guy is a worker. He shows up at the Arkansas facility every morning at 6 a.m. to start his work. And don't forget, at the NFL owners' meetings last month, we heard that the NFL is going to crack down on all that hands-on, those corners on the receivers, that illegal contact. So you better be able to run with these receivers if you can't grab and hold them, Michael. And, 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 you know that quick, Ahmad guys. Carroll can do that. I think he cost himself money by not staying in school. He would have been a top 10 pick next year, but he's confident enough to come out right now. And, and you're right, Moore. The quicker guys, be, be, they become a more of an asset for your football team. Because now, since we can't grab, I want the guys that can sit back and drive on the football real good, and Omar Kell can do that. He well, will help the Green Bay Packers. If he had stayed at Arkansas, he could have been a teammate of Alex Morton's. And he'd probably be better off just being around Alex Morton. Well, here's one thing. Right. His hair is shorter than most of the defensive backs for the Packers. Here, right? Here's one. Shorter than yeah. Harrison McKenzie. Well, I mean, we should talk about Mike McKenzie, because Mike McKenzie is a guy who has been making a lot of noise. He's unhappy with his contract. We hear from behind the scenes he wasn't happy with the shuffling of the coaching staff. So there is some concern. McKenzie saying he wants to be traded. Ahmad Carroll certainly gives him some insurance. All right, but wait a minute. We're talking about the Green Bay Packers, oh. who won an overtime game in the playoffs with which is unbelievable. They lost a game they could have won at Philly. In other words, they could have been maybe a Super Bowl team. Brett Favre has a couple of years left. Ha but see, we're going to have to ponder that. Brett Favre, Green Bay Packers, do they load up one more time? Something we'll discuss when we come back. And the Bengals are on the clock again. Yeah. Welcome back to the EA Sports NFL matchup. Trey set. Trey Wingo here with Merrill Hodge and Ron Jaworski. So the Packers go defense. Well, does not make too much of a guess there because it was a 4th and 28 play that got him into the playoffs. McCown to Nathan Poole. And then it was a 4th and 26 play that took them out of the playoffs in Philadelphia. Yeah, that's correct. Donald McNabb to Freddie Mitchell on 4th and 26. And it was an amazing play. You know, and no one has really shown the play and what happened and how the Eagles did complete the pass. I'm going to show you. This was 4th and 26. Defensively, how do you let this happen? There is no excuse for allowing this completion. This play was never broken down and analyzed. You'll see it from the coaching tape for the very first time now. The Packers were playing quarters coverage. Four defenders across the field and deep, with three defenders playing the underneath coverage. I don't understand why they're aligned so close to the line of scrimmage. The Eagles, anticipating blitz, will only send three receivers into routes. The back and the tight end will initially stay in to block. But no one will blitz. The tight end releases, the back stays. I want to freeze the play right here. Look at these two underneath the fenders. One of them is sitting five yards from the line of scrimmage. The other has hugged up to play the tight end. Why? It was fourth and 26. How can you play a coverage in a critical situation without factoring in the down and the distance? This drives coaches crazy and unfortunately gets them fired. And one of those players that hugged up was rookie Nick Barnett. And this is what happens when you put rookies on the field. Yeah, it's draft now. We're talking about great athletes and athleticism, and they could run so fast and jump so high. But they must understand critical situations in a football game. Fourth and 26, get your butt back there and don't let the ball get caught behind you. This is what happens why intelligence is so smart. You've got to get players that understand every situation in the game, and particularly those critical situations. That's why, you know what? 
smarts are very important. That's why New England keeps winning. Well, that's why I said coach. A coach has all the power, but absolutely no control. We've talked about these young guys and their transition to the National Football League. It's the intangibles. It's the smarts. I know I was hard on J.P. Lossman. He has a big arm. He has those intangibles. But managing himself, managing a team, managing down and distance, and all those situations, it's a mental game. And those are the things, if you don't know, if you don't understand, you lose games, you cost people their jobs. These coaches spend hours and hours and hours to put these players in the best situations, and then there's all those, those players want to be a hero, and they jump out of the system and cost your team. Bottom line, they have to do what they're told under those pressure situations, Absolutely. and sometimes, Believe as you it. said, with young players, that can be a problem. Okay, so how good is Ahmad Carroll? Let's check out with Andrea Kramer at the Cold Pizza Set. I believe, Andrea, you're standing by with someone who's worked out with Ahmad. That's right, Trey. All along, we've known that Corey Chavis is a budding general manager. Now we find out he's training players as well. Now you spent some time with Ahmed Carroll in New Orleans in March. How did that come about? Well, actually, I'm uh, good friends with Darren Martin, who works with Ahmad. And uh, one of the things he talked about was at the combine, there were some questions about his drills. I mean, obviously, he had the great 40 time in the vertical jump. That was outstanding. But stiffness a little bit and things like that. I was a guy who was stiff coming out of school. I don't think that's as much of a problem for Batman. I think, really, when it comes down to it, he hasn't had the spring practices that a lot of other guys get in terms of fundamentals because he's run on the track team. He has a tremendous work ethic, though, and that's the biggest thing that I thought that stood out to me. He has a yearning desire to want to get better. How do you think he will fit in in Green Bay? Well, I think you heard Chris Mortensen talk earlier about the changing of the rules, and I think Green Bay likes to use a lot of man coverage. You look at last year with Harris and McKenzie, they do play man coverage, and they do it very effectively. He fits into that scheme as an extra corner, somebody who could come in and compete if McKenzie, the problems with him continue on. I think Batman has a chance to really develop into an outstanding corner in this league. Keep working out those players, Corey. All right, that's it from here. Boomer, let's head back to you with Cincinnati on the clock. All right, Andrea, Corey, thank you very much. The Cincinnati Bengals began this draft a couple weeks ago with 17, then 24. Now they're down to 26. Now it's their turn. They picked up two fours in Delta O'Neill for moving down twice, and now this pick. We said they, they've lost Corey Dillon. With the uh, 26th pick in the 2004 NFL draft, the Cincinnati Bengals select Chris Perry, running back, University of Michigan. Well, guys, they have lost Corey Dillon. We mentioned that. In their scouting department right now is Bill Tobin, one of Mel Kuyper's all-time favorite personnel guys. Bill Tobin has always loved Big Ten Conference players. This is a Big Ten Conference player, and Mike Brown, the president of the Bengals, have always loved Big Ten Conference players. Of course, obviously, Marvin Lewis does, too. Well, I look at Chris Perry as a guy who can run, catch, and block. I don't think he's the best back in this draft. And I think you look at Steven Jackson already off the board of the St. Louis Rams. Kevin Jones still available. And I think there's some other running backs that are going to present value. Chris Perry, though, you talk about consistency over the course of a season. He had that at Michigan. I just think there was a better back on the board at this point than Kevin Jones. But I think Chris, kind of guy, you look at the size. Look at versatility. He'll be on the field for first, second, and third down. And keep in mind, in Cincinnati, he doesn't have to worry about being the full-time guy anyway because they have Rudy Johnson. who had almost 1,000 yards last year. Average four or five a carry and scored nine touchdowns. Chris will be a guy who can catch the football out of the backfield very effectively. He will be a guy in the NFL, not dynamic, not flashy. Now, I don't know if his skill level is enough to make him one of those top echelon backs, but keep in mind, in Cincinnati, he's going to be the number two guy, a one-two punch, along with a guy that's very underrated, Rudy Johnson. Had a nice year for the Cincinnati Bengals, Mort. Yeah, and now, as opposed to a guy like Kevin Jones, who doesn't get much experience in the passing game, Chris Perry understands a fairly sophisticated passing game in terms of picking up on protections. And you got a rookie quarterback who may or may not play. Carson Palmer right now has the job. Chris Perry is a little bit more advanced than Kevin Jones in that area. And you saw the he ability to, go, of to well. go up and over the top, in the goal line, in short yardage. Chris Perry runs hard. He's got that frame. He's got the kind of size. And he can, as I said, get that first down, go up and over the top in short yardage situations. And a good compliment, really, to Rudy Johnson. Is he going to be a big-time feature back? No. Are they going to ask him to be that kind of player in Cincinnati? No, they're not. They have Rudy. The scout told me they, that they, Chris Perry re reminds them of a guy like Deuce Staley, where he may not do any one thing great, but he does everything well. Uh, where's Kevin Jones in this? Does he go with it before we're done with the first round? Are you surprised that he's not the second back, Mel? There were people in the league that I spoke to that thought Kevin Jones was the best back in this draft, Chris. 
I didn't think so. I thought that Steven Jackson was the best back in this draft. And I think when you look at the completeness of Steven Jackson, St. Louis, remember, Marshall Falk has only played in, you talk about over the last two years, 2021 20, games. He's had some injuries, his career lows at St. Louis and when, in terms of this past year for the St. Louis Rams. So that made sense. Steven Jackson will be a nice addition. Kevin Jones, athletically gifted running back. Now I think when you look at Kevin Jones, what does he need to work on? More reps catching the football. And I thought at Virginia Tech, he was not a consistent tackle breaker. And I think that's something you need to be cognizant of when you're evaluating Kevin Jones. In the NFL, arm tackles should not get you down. The grass should not make the tackle. And I think with Kevin Jones, he needs to be a little bit more uh, aggressive on a consistent basis, breaking tackles, running hard up the gut, and I think getting yards after contact, which was not always something you saw with Kevin Jones on a consistent basis. And more consistent catching the ball. Like right. you say, now you put the young guy in, Carson Palmer, and when he's in trouble, he's going to look for that running back to dump the ball off to. I don't want this hot potato. You get it. He has to catch that and ball. And Perry has that ability. Well, look, the Bengals, they they, they took it back. Like I said, they got a couple of four. They, they have now how many picks in the top? Uh, they have eight in the eight, top 117, Chris. Eight the Cincinnati the Bengals well-stocked to come out a lot of players in this draft. Tennessee on the clock, then the 49ers, then the Colts. So here we go, late in the first. We'll be back. For NFL Draft, presented by Coors Light. And welcome back to the theater at Madison Square Garden. Now, we knew we were in for a lot of intrigue in the first round of the 2004 draft, but maybe we got even more than we bargained for. Six trades in all, and let's begin with the biggest. The San Diego Chargers traded the rights to Eli Manning to the New York Giants for Phillip Rivers, plus New York's third round pick this year, number 65 overall, plus a first and a fifth round pick next year. Then a big move up by Philadelphia for the second straight year to select Sean Andrews, the big offensive tackle from Arkansas, taking San Francisco's spot at number 16. San Francisco gets the Eagles' first round spot coming up at 28, plus the Eagles' second round pick at number 58 overall. Dallas traded with the Bills. Buffalo moves in with their second first round pick. They took quarterback JT Lossman of Tulane. Dallas got the Bills' second round pick, number 43 overall, a fifth round pick, and the first round pick next year. There were also swaps between the Lions and Browns, the Vikings and Dolphins, and the Rams and the Bengals. And maybe most surprising is that the Patriots stood pat. We know that they love to stockpile, and they also have a pick at number 32. On the clock right now, Tennessee. So we have to wonder now, will Tennessee stand pat or will they make a trade? And right now, let's go to Ed Werder in Washington. Ed. Well, Susie, their phones definitely started ringing as soon as their pick came up and Chris Perry was off the board. Now, Jeff Fisher, I know because he lost Javon Kurse and Robert Smith on his defensive line, really was hoping a big defensive player would fall to them. If that didn't happen, I think he knew with the retirement of Frank Wycheck at tight end that two tight ends might possibly be there, and they are in Ben Troop and Ben Watson. I think those are players he'll consider. And then he told me, hey, we could consider a running back. Now, the guy we talked about was Chris Perry, who just went. And he was really conflicted about this. And it'll be interesting if they had Kevin Jones ahead of Chris Perry. His dilemma was, hey, Eddie George, he thinks that he can finish his career in Tennessee, that he'll take a pay cut, and they'll work, work this thing out, and he could play here. Fisher says he really wants to be a 1,000-yard back. Again, thinks if he gets one more 1,000-yard season, he could make the Hall of Fame. And he said he doesn't want to go out like Emmett Smith, having to finish it out with a foreign franchise. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see, he said, that if we take a running back with a first pick, that might be the end of Eddie George in Tennessee. While the Titans are on the clock, we're going to break, and we'll be right back with their pick. You gotta be kidding me. Marshall, Marshall, Marshall. <laughs> got Marshall Irvin, and he's with us here today. Oh, man. Super Bowl hey. bound. You know what? We did. He was the Schwab, right? We did. We Schwab. did. Three times we did. Oh, Quiet. man, I can't believe. Don't rub that in. I, okay, I'm sorry. For all the Buffalo fans, and you, boom, I'm sorry. Shut up. You did not. So, you three remember that day? Let's look, look, look at it. What do you remember now from 19... Tom Landry's final number one pick was Michael Irvin. What do you remember? I mean, we saw it. What still sticks in your head 16 years later? 
But you know how excited I was about that day. And that's why, and boom, as I sat up here on, this, on the podium, and, and when Pooh called up Eli, I felt for him. You immediately grabbed me when everybody started booing. I was like, this is the happiest day of his life. I remember that happiness. Right. And I, I, I want everybody that's being drafted today to feel that. It's, it's, it's truly a blessing. Well, it was, uh, you were blessing to the Cowboys, that's for sure. There had been a trade. Houston made a trade with Tennessee. We'll get the trade in a moment. But here's Houston's pick. In the second first round pick. Want to guess? With the uh, 27th pick in the 2004 draft acquired from the Tennessee Titans, the Houston Texans select Jason Babin, defensive end from Western Michigan. Well, and we'll get the trade in a moment. Jason this, Babin, uh, uh, we'll get in the background here. He, you know, Western Michigan, so didn't play against the, the classic uh, competition. And I think he has a tattoo the length of his entire back, okay? So now the longest tattoo in the league in the NFL, drafted by Houston. Quick throw, very quick, right? Very quick, and it'll be a 3-4 outside linebacker in that scheme. He's the first Western Michigan player to be taken the first round. Remember, John Offerball went the second round to Miami Dolphins. You'll get Jason Babin. Could have been a 4-3 in, and this scheme would be a 3-4 outside backer. Chris mentioned level of competition, 30 sacks over the last two years in the Mid-American Conference. But had a great game against Michigan a few years ago. Michigan State had nine tackles, so when he had to step it up against elite competition, he got it done. 6-2.5, 263, runs a 4-6, 28 reps and a 34 vertical. Athletically gifted state wrestling champion in high school. So I know he uses, uses his hands well, balance, leverage. He has that with that wrestling background. East-West Shrine game, see it here. He was a dominant force. Again, stepped up when level of competition increased. Then he goes to the combine workout. Put up big numbers. So you have production, not only the Mid-American Conference, but also against the Michigans and the Michigan States. East-West Shrine game, then the combine. I got high on this kid. I have in my in the top 25, top 30 all along. Thought he could go as high as 19 to Minnesota. Dropped him down to St. Louis at 26. Nice pick for the Texans to get back in the first round. They added Dante Robinson. Now they have the 3-4 outside linebacker to get some heat on the quarterback. You know what's interesting? We're seeing people. We didn't think at the low first you'd be able to go down and move out of there just because, ah, those players are similar to the ones in the high second. We've been wrong, right? We've been, we've been wrong on that. Something to ponder. Uh, now let's uh, join via our Coors Light video conference so we welcome in the coach the second year head coach now of the cincinnati Bengals, marvin lewis and the marvin you, my goodness you're working the draft board like houdini down twice you still get a running back um chris perry why him why him not kevin jones well we saw the versatility we felt and all along i think he was our guy that we felt best about and it was close call very close and uh we just decided with chris and uh he's got great ability to make people miss and Sam and, and him, not Steven Jackson, too. There was something that, that's special in this young man for you, I, I guess, right? Well, highest really rated felt, back on the board? Yes, he was. He was our highest rated running back, and we felt great about him. And uh, really the guy that we kind of had target and we were hoping was going to get to us today. New uniforms, new hope, exciting season last year, and you go with Carson Palmer. Why do you make the call so early, you know, before even the draft? Um, well, I... I really felt, Chris, it was important for free agency, for our football team, for everybody to understand what direction we were headed in so that wouldn't, we had not all those questions. John could get on, Carson could get on, and we could move forward as a football team. What has to happen now for the Bengals, Marvin, to, to take the next step? I mean, the next couple of steps. You were there in the run toward the end, but, but realistically, what kind of team do you have at 8-8? Eight eight? Well, we've got to find things that make make special plays. We've got to find some more playmakers, and that's what we're hoping that we've gained in free agency, uh, a young group of guys that are in their 25 to 29-year-old. We're really excited about those guys. And now with this draft class, we have, I guess, 11 picks now, so we're excited to, to really have a new influx of talent and energy to go with what we already have here. Marvin, Marvin you've only... Go ahead, Mort. Marvin, uh, do you run a risk of losing that locker room if Carson Palmer falls flat on his face, or do you go immediately back to Kitten if that happens? Well, if Carson's not getting it done, I, I told both guys, no, we don't want to lose football games based on one position. And, uh, but we've got a lot of confidence in Carson. Obviously, the confidence we have in, in uh, John has not changed one bit. Marvin, talk a little bit about the excitement. You've, you've just been in the city a year. But you felt that, I mean, you know, in the 80s, the Bengals were in Super Bowls. But it's been dormant. 
Talk about the excitement that you felt in town just going about your, your you know, drives to and from the store. It's really been fantastic. Uh, football is big. Uh, everybody's talking about football now year round and want to know what we're doing, who we, who's going where, what are we doing. And I think everybody's excited for football. They've got a, a great draft party here today at the stadium. They're just excited about football. Well, you better get back to work with all those picks, you know. We're keeping you too long already. Yeah, it's, we it's are. Ohio. They're excited about football, that's for sure. Keep up the good work. That's right. Thank you. Marvin Lewis, hey, he came in and did not the impossible, but the improbable. And keep in mind, that also in Baltimore, he was there when they had Jamal Lewis and Priest Holmes. Now you have Rudy Johnson and Chris Perry. Good so point. he's been around a team that had two excellent running backs and was able to benefit from that. Let's revisit how badly Houston wanted Jason Babin. Unique that they traded with Tennessee, by the way, the yes, old Oilers you're and right. everything. You're right. That is, they have traded their, the Texans traded their second, third, fourth, and fifth round picks to get Jason Babin. Now they get a fifth round pick back from Tennessee, but that tells me that Babin was a huge piece of their draft day puzzle. Well, he's one of the fastest uh, in that sort of mode. Didn't fit every team. Um, do we think Houston, we saw Cincinnati. In their third year, is Houston coming? Are they coming as well? Well, they got one they thing, look? and Mort, you know this, David Carr. David Great, Carr yeah, is a yeah, guy yeah. you can build around. He's the cornerstone. He's the guy that I think will allow everybody else to develop. Andre Johnson, you got a big time player there. Look at the running back situation. Stole Dominic Davis in round four last year. So offensively, they have components more that you need. I think the Texans and the Jaguars are both those teams. The problem is they have the Colts and Titans in their division. Takes a very San, smart football yep. team. San Francisco's next, and then the heavy metal. Indianapolis, Kansas City, and your Super Bowl teams, Carolina and New England again. Round one moves along. To the 2004 NFL Draft, presented by Coors Light. With the uh, 28th pick in the 2004 draft acquired by trade, the Carolina Panthers select Chris Gamble, defensive back, Ohio State. So we'll get you there. Well, here is the trade. The Panthers moving uh, up with the 49ers. San Francisco now has moved down twice and has got a two from earlier from Philly. And now they get a four here uh, from Carolina to move down three spots and almost out of the first round. Look, Carolina, Super Bowl, they had Ricky Manning Jr. who had the big playoff game, huge game against the St. Louis Rams, which everybody remembers. But defensive back Chris Campbell, to many, Mel, that is an accurate word. Is he a gamble? He isn't to a certain extent, Chris, because he lacks experience. Only a year and a half, really, where he worked the corner, didn't practice a lot at that spot. Former wide receiver, return man, did it all on special teams. And a guy that you could argue is one of their most valuable players because of both sides of the ball, what he accomplished. At times, he'll lose sight of the football. And I think when you look at him in, in run support, he needs to upgrade his ability there. So as a, as a pure corner, he needs work. He's not a quick fix. He's not going to come in as a rookie and be a starting corner. He's a work in progress. He needs coaching. He needs some time. But there are skills to be developed there. Chris Gamble has talent. The Kansas State game, which you see footage of here, he was outstanding. That was his last game in a Buckeye uniform. And I think when you look at the, the lack of experience and the way he played, there against Reggie Williams, he does make the tackle there. But he's not the most physical, aggressive player that you'll ever find. So I think people look at him as a guy who needs to develop. In the NFL, now you're looking for the guys who can come right in and be starters. With Chris Gamble, Carolina has to be patient, work him in, coach him up, and in two or three years, you may have something that's a little bit better than average. You may have a special player. The risk, though, is he doesn't react to the coaching. He doesn't develop into a corner. So it is a roll of the dice pick, Chris, to a certain extent. I thought Cincinnati may go that route. They went instead running back. This late in the first round, I think the gamble is limited. But you know what? You talk about coaching up. Was there been a better coaching job than John Fox? He took over. The team was 1-15 plus. They had stuff off the field that was much worse, uh, much, much worse than a 1-15 football team. And what does he do in two years? He gets them to the Super Bowl. And all of a sudden, this division, which going into last year, we thought was a walk for Tampa Bay. It obviously turned out not at all when Vic got hurt and everything else. And it was Carolina. He got Carolina, rejuvenated Tampa Bay, Atlanta back with Mike Vick. This could be a real hotbed division this season. No question about that. Let's go up to the EA Sports Desk and uh, Trey and Merrill and John.
All right, Boomer, thanks. No question about it. The story of this draft is the Manning family, not only their influence on how to get the son where they wanted him to go, Eli, but just look at the lineage. Archie, what did he do wrong? He was only the second pick overall in 1971. 11th time we've had two brothers go in the first round. The first time both of those brothers have essentially been number one. Eli Manning going number one, then tra trading to the Giants as the Giants pick up Phillip Rivers. So what to make of Peyton Manning now with the Colts are on the clock? Uh, they had a great run. They finally got those two playoff wins, Jaws. Uh, Peyton Manning did, but that defense still let him down in the AFC Championship game. Peyton Manning. Can he be better than he was last year when he was the co-MVP with Steve McNair? Yeah, I, I believe so. The one thing you see about Peyton Manning is a guy that still commits himself to get better every single week. And one thing about Peyton Manning as well, he lines up every single week. He has started every game since he came into the National Football League. And when I go down Tuesday at NFL Films and plug in those tapes, you know, one of the first tapes I grab is Tom Moore's Indianapolis Colts offense because no one understands the quarterback position better than Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning is the best in the NFL. No quarterback takes what he learns in the classroom during the week and executes it on the field Sunday better than Manning. He's like a computer, processing information quicker than any other quarterback. Here's a great example. This is the Colts' staple play action. Peyton's initial read is Marvin Harrison deep, but the safety, who did not bite on the play fake, is sitting over the top. His second read is Dallas Clark, on the intermediate dig, but the middle linebacker takes that away. Manning's ability to throw deep to the other side of the field to his third read Reggie Wayne is what sets him apart. This is very hard to do. And it shows his intuitive feel for the position. Peyton instinctively knew that the backside safety would drift to the initial progression side. He verifies that and pulls the trigger, knowing that a great throw beats the safety and the corner in the void. The pocket awareness is tremendous. An offensive lineman loved Peyton Manning because of the clock in his head. The ball comes out. Look at the completion percentage last year, 67%. And one thing I always look at is that touchdown to interception ratio. Very important for the quarterback to protect the football. And one thing Peyton Manning does is protect the football. Unfortunately, when he went up to New England, did not do a good job of that. So that's what will motivate Peyton Manning this season to have the great year, but then have the great postseason. You know, I, I, when you study Peyton Manning, there's absolutely no flaws. I mean, there are very few flaws as far as Peyton Manning goes. When he makes the type of money he makes, I am a veteran guy and a guy who has proven it and has earned it deserves every penny. But when you pay a guy that much money, what does become a concern as far as the team goes is how can you build? Defensively, they do need help. They don't have enough money to go out and get defensive help. And if you look at the next step, it's got to be a defense. That's what's going to have to help them get to the next step. Peyton Manning can only do so much. There's only certain players in this league that can do so much you cannot win it by yourself but they don't have the money to go get the help defensively so Peyton Manning will have to get a little better in order for them to take that next step but that is an awful tough thing to do well in a sense they're just counting on Tony Dungy to keep improving that defense much in the same way the Pretty Chiefs much in the same way the Chiefs are hoping Gunther Cunningham just coming back will sure. hope the Chiefs defense which anyway. I believe the Colts just scored on the Chiefs defense again Colts are on the clock we'll see what they do stay with us Best available player, still see a lot of talent on the board. Ben Troop, second highest rated tight end, still there. Great athlete, Shannon Sharp type, natural pass receiving skills, just sacrifice some blocking. He's dropped into the late first. Michael Jenkins, productive at Ohio State in that conservative offense. And still, Kevin Jones, athletically gifted running back, still on the board, Chris. Well, those are some names. And, uh, you know, now there's a lot of thought that late one and early two. Look, there is nobody that knows the bottom of the draft better than Bill Polian. He did it for years, at picking second to last, when the Bills, you know, were in the Super Bowl with three of the four, uh, were his. The, the Bills were picking at the bottom of the first round. Carolina, they were in the title game, as we mentioned, in the late, in the, uh, what was it, 96? And now the Indianapolis Colts, very near the bottom, as they were in the AFC Championship game. The way you do the bottom of the board is, in no particular order, A, boy, did somebody, for some reason, are we shocked, fell through the screen. Then, whoa, let's look at him. Two, I'm hopeful. It's almost like a plan of colleges. You hope for one that you might, geez, it's a real reach to get in. Then you got a guy here that, eh, maybe, but we still have another guy that's about upper third of the second round in our mind, but we would be happy to take a 28-29, but we still can trade down. We think we can get him later. Remember last year, Mike Doss, 
who they had close, but they didn't pick him in the first round. They actually waited to the end of the second round and got a guy that they would have picked up or second. They have a guy in mind. We have a couple in mind. So they've just made a trade with Atlanta, who's now on the clock. So Atlanta, and we'll give you the whole trade, uh, is picking one, two, three, four, five, six in the second round. So Atlanta's now on the clock with their second first round pick. Indy will pick early second. If it sounds confusing, I don't mean it to be, but that's the proper way to work the bottom of the draft. He's done it many times. Uh, exactly. Save money as well, Chris. I think you get players. If you're guaranteed a player by moving down, you make the move. And I think a lot of teams, I think, are reluctant because they're afraid they're going to lose somebody. But normally, if you have two or three bunched together, Chris, you got to project it. you got to try to have an idea of where these players are going to go. So now we have Atlanta, who, uh, who much earlier in the day, Jim Moore Jr.'s first pick, D'Angelo Hall, cornerback, Virginia Tech, Atlanta's second first-round pick. I need to help my With the uh, 29th pick in the 2004 draft, acquired from Indianapolis, the Atlanta Falcons select Mike Jenkins, yep. wide receiver, Ohio State. Well, a couple of Ohio State Buckeyes go in a row, and here now begins the next little run of wide receivers, don't you think, Mel? I do. Rashawn Woods is another one yep. from Oklahoma State, still on the board. You look at him here, getting off the gym. That's Jeremy Lasore. You're going to see Jeremy probably go in the second round. You see how he beat him there. There's Michael Jenkins again, making the catch Six and yards points. after the reception in the open field. 6'4 and change, 217 pounds. Smart kid. You see him here against Purdue. This is the game where on the fourth down play, national championship year, he made the big catch. Here's against Wisconsin's defense. Again, Michael Jenkins against that kind of competition, getting the job done. You see the ability here to make the catch with defenders draped all over him. And I think that's the strength of Michael Jenkins at the Senior Bowl practices. I thought he was one of the top two or three players on the field here against Miami of Florida. Again, in coverage, ability to use that body, use that frame, 6'4 and a half, 217, to get the advantage like a power forward in basketball. And I like the yards after the catch. Again, he is not a, a medium range receiver. He's a guy that has the ability to stretch it. He runs in the 4'4'8 to 4'5'3 range, not sprinter speed, but fast enough. I think Michael Jenkins in, at Ohio State, conservative offense. When he got the ball, though, he made the most of it. And I think at this stage, I didn't going late first round, so it's a, talking about a value pick. Here you go. But he's most well-coached receiver in this draft. We saw some shots of him and man-to-man bump and run coverages. All the wide receivers I watched, none got off the jam better than Michael Jenkins. That's why he is a good well, one of, right here at the bottom of the first round. One of the goals of Rich McKay, the general manager of the Falcons, formerly of Tampa Bay, was to get more players around Mike Vick. They have done a lot of addressing to that defensive side of the football, and they needed to. And they got uh, the corner, uh, and D'Angelo Hall, in the first round. Michael Jenkins gives them a big receiver. There's a lot of big receivers in this draft. Peerless Price. Well, Peerless Price is now on the other side. They believe T.J. Duckett is poised to have a big year with Alex Gibbs, the offensive line coach, now in Atlanta, and uh, putting together their running game. So they do believe Mike Vick put good players around Mike. him and watch him for Michael Murray's Jenkins new gives them a number one receiver. I say it time and time again, I think Peerless Price is a number two receiver. Put with Michael Jenkins, Peerless Price will start playing. And he is a better. big receiver. You know, you put a short quarterback like Vic with a big receiver. He's the tallest works. Jenkins. Yeah. Remember Alfred Jenkins was a great little receiver for Atlanta back with Steve Bartkowski, but but we digress. Here's what it let I me mean, it was real simple. Mike Vick got hurt in August last year in the preseason and uh, you can see what happened with without. Uh, we know that the year before he led the Atlanta Falcons to the only ever playoff loss the Green Bay Packers have ever had at Lambeau Field. So obviously, um, we, um, uh, oh, we're going to, the, okay, I thought I heard another thing. You see, this is what happens, you get a little batty. And what I'm predicting may be the longest first round in the history of the National Football League, but we'll get back to that. So that's what uh, Atlanta now has a chance. I mean, they, they can move, but we've already established it's a pretty tough division. Let's go quickly up to Trey at the EA matchup desk. All right, Boomer, thanks. You mentioned a lot of addressing that the Atlanta Falcons have done on the defensive side. They were dead last defensively. They pick up Keon Carpenter and Aaron Beasley to try and shore up that secondary. But there's no question in this draft with D'Angelo Hall now on the defensive side, they went after another weapon for Michael Vick and Michael Jenkins, and they're trying to build around the franchise. Right, and I think how, also the other question is how does Mike fit into the West Coast system because Greg Knapp will come in and he'll apply that. And one thing I love about Greg Knapp, he is great as an offensive coordinator and building a quarterback. When you look at Mike Vick, first of all, we want to think must-see TV, most exciting quarterback in the National Football League, he but again. he also has tremendous skills and he will fit perfectly in the West Coast. Hey. 
We all know Mike Vick is special. He takes mobility to a level we've never seen before and may never see again. Must see TV will be back in full force this season, but he will be asked to master the West Coast offense. That means being a playmaker with his arm first, and I've seen him do it. When he hits his back foot, the coaches will demand that the ball come out. I saw him do this at times last season. From the sideline camera, here's the breakdown. The route by Peerless Price has to beat the corner playing him, and the throw by Vic has to beat the safety, sitting down in the middle in lurk coverage. And this is where Vic's unparalleled arm strength comes in. I believe no other quarterback gets this ball in. It's only a matter of time before he becomes a complete quarterback. Look at this play, off a seven-step drop. Vic initially reads to his left, nothing there. He stays patient and calmly works backside to the dig. Vic has the passing foundation that's needed to effectively execute the West Coast offense. The new head coach for the Atlanta Falcons, Jim Mora, is so excited. Why? Because he's got a guy like Mike Vick. But when you look at this West Coast, what makes the West Coast really pure, if you want to use pure West Coast, the movement of the quarterback by design. That's what Mike Vick will bring to this West Coast. Changing that launching point, moving him. He's going to bring that natural gift to move anyway when a play breaks down. But the design of that natural movement in the West Coast is where Vic will shine. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think an outstanding move of bringing Greg Knapp in as the offensive corner and keeping Mike Johnson, who yep. was Michael Vick's quarterback coach last year, and the fundamentals were improving tremendously. Unfortunately, Michael got hurt, and those fundamentals regressed a little bit. Now, with the coaching staff intact, and as Merrill said, kind of a movement-style offense. And we're not talking about run-around, make-play offense movement by design. Michael Vick will fit nice into that. Then you look at their wide receivers. Obviously, Peerless Price, you know, his game will pick up now with, with Mike Jenkins as another wide receiver. And also, don't forget, Brian Finneran, LJ Crumpler, big targets, good in that West Coast style short passing game. Again, they were 3-1 and one when Michael Vick started last year. LJ Crumpler really blossomed without Michael Vick, so we'll look to see what happens when they all get starting and mesh together. There has been a trade. The Chiefs have traded out. The Lions are on the clock. We'll let you know what Detroit's going to do with their second first-round pick. When we we come back on the draft. Stay with us. I'm George Grand here at the ESPN Anchor Headquarters for what will be a history-making day, not only for television, but for the National Football League as well. The draft was the last of the great newspaper stories, but that no longer holds now that ESPN is here. First round selection. Oklahoma running back, Billy Sims. And here's Billy Sims. So in our one-time prayer, that was great to see George Grand video there, our uh, first anchor for these drafts and a great friend. Uh, when uh, Chet Simmons, our president, uh, told Pete Rozell in 1980, we'd like to televise the NFL draft. Rozell said, what are you, nuts? Well, Billy Sims was our first televised first-round pick. It was a Tuesday morning at about 8.05. The drafts were Tuesday morning. People called in sick a little bit. And then all of a sudden, whoa, after about eight, nine years, let's move it to Sunday, Monday. We might have an audience on Sunday, certainly not Monday. Then, whoa, more and more people watch. You folks out there, we thank you for it. Saturday, Sunday extravaganza. But it used to be 8 a.m. Tuesday, 5 a.m. on the West Coast. Yikes. Now, here, uh, here is Detroit on the clock a moment ago. With the uh, 30th pick in the 2004 draft acquired by trade, the Detroit Lions select Kevin Jones, Ooh. running back from Virginia Tech. And how perfect is that? Illithium was the Lion. Kevin Jones, running back, Virginia Tech. Pretty good value and an interesting move up from Detroit. Remember, they have back-to-back -back early second-round picks so they can spend it. You're right, Chris, and some teams had Kevin Jones number one back on the board. You talk about athleticism, you see there the change in direction, ability, and the vision. I think he needs to lower those pads a little bit. And I think also break tackles on a more consistent basis, but a guy who has, despite a 40 times his average, home run hitting speed. He plays a lot faster. They call it competitive speed. He has it. Kevin Jones, a chiseled frame, strong kid, six foot 225. He destroyed Pittsburgh's defense here in November, running wild against that Panther defense. And you look at Kevin Jones, the one area of his game that he needs to work on is catching the football, more experience in that area. As I said, 
We're talking about a guy that at Virginia Tech, a little inconsistent in terms of breaking tackles, but he's got talent, he's got athletic ability, he's a great kid, he'll work hard, and he could have gone mid-first round, and a lot of people would have argued, because as I said, some teams did have him the number one back on the board. Steven Jackson, Kevin Jones both dropped a lot further than they anticipated, but that's the, the history and the tradition of running backs. No matter who they are, second rounders drop to the fourth, thirds drop to the fifth. Running backs, only five or six teams need them usually each year. They tend to be present decent value in the draft. Boy, do, boy, when you look at Detroit, they're starting to look like a football team. Matt Miller yep. took a lot of heat, but he is drafting well. To get Kevin Jones to go along with Roy Williams and Charles Rogers, give Joey Harris some, some weapons, they starting to look like a pretty good football team. Yeah, and I think that what we've seen from Joey Harrington is it looks like he's going to be okay in the NFL, but he's going to need a lot of good players around him, and that is what Matt Millen is doing. He's gotten Charles Rogers last year, Roy Williams today, and Roy Williams, by the way, was the number one rated player on the Lions draft board. So this was huge for the Lions getting Kevin Jones as a piece of the puzzle. Well, look, it's a division where, with, with apologies to Green Bay, who's a very good team, there's room to move in this division. And the Lions, they open up at Chicago. Is that where they could break that 24-game road losing streak week one? We'll be back. 25 years ESPN NFL draft. 25 years of coverage for the first to the last. The speed is what you need. Fill the trap. If finesse is what you want to possess, fill the trap. Yeah. NFL Draft is presented by Rocky Mountain Cold Coors Light, the official beer sponsor of the NFL, and in part by Sensodyne Toothpaste. Sensodyne helps stop the pain of sensitive teeth. Welcome back to the theater at Madison Square Garden. We continue in the first round. Let's go to the commissioner, Paul Taglievo. With the uh, 31st pick in the 2004 draft, the San Francisco 49ers select Rashawn Woods, wide receiver from Oklahoma State. Mel, the San Francisco, they move down twice and they get a receiver to replace T.O. Makes sense, and I'll tell you, you That's are smart. getting guys in the late first round. That's where they were projected, Jenkins and Woods to go, but yep. their value, when you talk about where they were rated, was a little higher. So because of all these wide receivers, every team doesn't need a wide receiver or prioritize as the number one area. Rashawn Woods is the guy, 6'2", 205, that caught just about everything thrown in his direction, was a key entity on an Oklahoma State team that beat Oklahoma two years in a row. And you look at Rashawn Woods and his size and the natural pass receiving skills. He doesn't get a lot of separation, even though he ran that 4 or 5 at the combine, but a guy who can locate the football, make the cuff catch in traffic, a guy who has certainly the aggressive qualities you look for, caught a ton of balls, caught more balls than any receiver in college football from Josh Fields the last two seasons. There he beats Nathan Basher. Yeah, you look at the Oklahoma game, people say, well, it's Oklahoma, Derek Straight did a pretty good job, and Sean Woods really didn't show up big in that game. Well, keep in mind, Oklahoma's defensive front was getting after Josh Fields, negating everything he could do, making him run for his life. So don't criticize Rashawn Woods for that one game. I tell you what, when he got help from the quarterback, the offensive line did their job. Rashawn Woods uh, did a heck of a job. And I tell you, late first round for a team that right now has Cedric Wilson and Brandon Lloyd and not much else at wide receiver. This was a definite need area, and they got a good one, Rashawn Woods, who should be able to start and be a major contributor as a rookie. You know what it feels nice to say? Good job by the 49ers. Susie with draft track. Susie? <laughs> All right, Chris, let's clean things up a bit. Just one more pick to go here in the first round. There have been so many twists and turns, perhaps the most dramatic in the 69-year history of the draft. And, of course, the story was the quarterback. The San Diego Chargers selected Eli Manning. He refused to go to the Chargers. At number four, the Giants chose NC State quarterback Phillip Rivers, and they swapped QBs. We knew the wide receiver talent was deep. Seven receivers in the first round so far. And then the Miami Hurricanes march toward history was on. Six Hurricanes taken in the first round, the most ever from one team. As Chris alluded to earlier, could be the longest uh, first round in the history of the draft contributing to that. Ten trades, and let's get you caught up on a couple of the most recent. Atlanta jumped into Indy's first round spot at number 29, took wide receiver Michael Jenkson and the third rounder. Indy gets Falcons second, third, and fourth round picks. Detroit moving to KC spot at number 30. They took running back Kevin Jones. KC gets a second, fourth, and a fifth next year. 
Detroit, of course, dead last in rushing last year. In five seasons since Barry Sanders retired, they've averaged 90 yards a game. Steve Mariucci's team on the move. The Patriots on the clock. All right. Welcome back to the 69th annual selection meeting, the NFL draft. The first round with the uh, second first round pick of the New England Patriots, the Super Bowl champion Patriots, is coming up. The Patriots, of course, picked earlier. They got an outstanding defensive tackle, Vince Woolfork, from Miami, Florida, to fall to them. So now they don't need necessarily anything, but positions that we talked about before, well, we said, look, they took a tight end a couple rounds a couple years ago with Daniel Graham. Could they play two with tight ends? The, uh, Final pick in the first round of the 2004 draft, the New, English, New England Patriots select Ben Watson, tight end, University of Georgia. Well, now the position on most boards, Mel, Troop was ahead of Watson, although you thought Watson could also be a first round player. Look, New England, let me just say one thing about them their offense, they have a fullback, but it's not like they use him that much. There are two tight ends and a lot, and that'll make sense, although they have four eight and Graham to play there. Your thought on Watson over True? I thought you look at Ben Watson, Ben True, Ben Hartsock, a lot of Bens, Ben Hartsock, Ohio State's the next highly rated tight end, but you look at Ben Watson, you look at a guy who has computer numbers, and you say, well, the productivity wasn't what it should be. Keep in mind, this past year, he had that ankle injury which hampered him. You go back, he started his career at Duke. He looked like one of the, all the stars of the ACC or the potential stars in the ACC, transferred to Georgia, had some nice catches in the SEC against that competition. But with the ankle injury, he didn't put up the big numbers this year, but 6'3 and a quarter, 255, has run 4'4'8 before, ran 4'5'3 at the combine. 34 reps, that's unbelievable strength, and a 35 and a half vertical. That's a better vertical than some corners out there. So you look at Watson's physical ability. At the Senior Bowl, he was outstanding. I think that's where he made himself some money. In Mobile, at the Senior Bowl, because of the ankle injury, he didn't put up the numbers as at, on the field at Georgia. But the Senior Bowl practices and the combine workout made Ben Watson a lot of money. And in the end, about, allowed him to go off the board before you, Ben Troop beat Florida. You mentioned a lot of numbers there. One interesting number, the Wonderlick intelligence test that the NFL gives these guys. Ben Ben Watson, who started his career at Duke, scored about 40 or a little over 40 out of a maximum of 50. And you know Bill Belichick and the Patriots, they want smart football you, players. You know what? I, I, I believe I'm correct on this. And I don't, you know, college graduation rates, it's not something you often talk about, talk about with college programs, right. but not with pro football teams. Like who graduates? New England, Indianapolis, and, and I want to say Carolina. New England, Indianapolis, and Carolina were the top three with of college this past year with college graduates. They were three of the four top teams in the NFL, if you look at the title games. Just an interesting number. The first round is over. We'll wrap it up. Arizona's on the clock. Yeah.